Orchestra presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, The Maltese Falcon. The starring players... This is Humphrey Bogart. This is Mary Astor. This is Sidney Greenstreet. And this is Peter Laurie. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Warner Brothers' sensational mystery story, The Maltese Falcon. It stars Humphrey Bogart as private detective Sam Spade, Mary Astor as Miss Wonderly, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, and Peter Laurie as Joel Cairo. <laughs> This is the story of the Maltese Falcon and of the people whose lives it touched and seared. It began in San Francisco when a beautiful young woman, who identified herself as Miss Wonderly, walked into the offices of Spade and Archer, private detectives. Miss Wonderly had just told Sam Spade why she wished to engage detectives when Spade's partner, Miles Archer, entered the office. Oh, excuse me, Sam. No, it's all right, Miles. Come in. Miss Wendley, this is Miles Archer, my partner. How do you do? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. Miss Wendley's sister ran away from New York with a fellow named Floyd Thursby. They're here in San Francisco. Miss Wendley has seen Thursby and has a date with him tonight. Maybe he'll bring the sister with him. The chances are he won't. Miss Wendley wants us to find the sister, get her away from Thursby, and back home. But I want you to know that he's a dangerous man. I don't think he'd stop at anything. I don't believe he'd hesitate to kill Corinne, my sister, if he thought it would save him. Uh-huh. What time is he coming to see you, Miss Wonderly? After 8 o'clock. All right, Miss Wonderly, we'll have a man there. Oh, I'll look after it myself. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Will uh, $200 be enough for a retainer? Oh, plenty. Oh, it'll help if you meet Thursby in your hotel lobby, Miss Wonderly. I will. Thank you again. Goodbye. Well, Archer, what do you think of her? Sweet. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy shadowing her. Oh, okay, Zucker. You call me if you run into any trouble. Hello? Yes, it's Spade. This is Lieutenant Dundee, Spade. Well, what's on your mind, Copper? I thought you might be interested in knowing that your partner, Archer, was found in an alley near the St. Mark, shot through the heart from close range. Blast burnt his coat. Coming down for a look at him before he's moved? No. You've seen everything I could. His gun was tucked away on his hip. It hadn't been fired. His overcoat was buttoned. Was he working, Sam? Well? He was supposed to be tailing a fellow named Floyd Thursby. What for? Now, now, don't crowd me. I'll see you after I break the news to Archer's wife. I'll be there in a couple of hours. <laughs> Copper, come on in. Break the news to Archer's wife, Sam? Uh-huh. What kind of a gun do you carry? None. I don't like them much. You don't just happen to have one on you. Search me. Turn the dump upside down if you want to. I won't squawk if you've got a search warrant. Why were you tailing Floyd Thursby, Sam? I wasn't. Archer was. For the swell reason that we had a client who was paying good money to have him tailed. Who's the client? Sorry, I can't tell you that. You didn't go to Archer's house to tell his wife. I called up and the girl from your office was there and she said you told her to go. What are you leading up to? Just this, Spade. Floyd Thursby was shot down in front of his hotel about a half an hour after I talked to you. Oh. I came into my apartment just a few minutes ahead of you. I was walking around thinking things over. I knew you weren't here. I tried to get you on the phone. Where'd you walk to? Just around. Thursby die? Yeah. How'd I kill him? I forget. He was shot four times in the back. Hotel people know anything about him? Nothing, except he'd been there a week. Alone? Alone. You find out who he was, what his game was? No, I thought you could tell me that. <laughs> I've never seen Thursby dead or alive. Now, look, Spade, you know me. 
If you did get Thursby, you'll get a square deal for me and most of the breaks. I don't know that I'd blame you a lot, man that killed your partner, but that wouldn't keep me from nailing you. That's fair enough. Now, would you mind scramming? I got some thinking to do, and I'd like to get a little sleep before daylight. Hello? Yeah, this is Sam Spade. Oh, I was just going to call you. Where are you? Well, the coronet on California Street, apartment 101. What's that? The name's Miss LeBlanc. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be right out. Oh, good morning. Come in, Mr. Spade. Mr. Spade, I have a terrible, terrible confession to make. That, uh, that story I told you yesterday was all just a story. <laughs> oh, that. Well, uh, <laughs> we didn't exactly believe your story, Miss, uh, is your name Wonderly or LeBlanc? It's really O'Shaughnessy, Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Oh. Well, Miss O'Shaughnessy, as I said, we, we didn't exactly believe your story. We believed your $200. Oh? Yes, you see, you paid us too much to be telling the truth. You knew that when you accepted the money? Oh, I suspected it. I was positive when Joe Cairo called on me. Joe Cairo? Yeah. Yeah, he seems interested in Floyd Thursby, too. What did he say? About what? About me? Nothing. Well, what did he talk about? Well, he offered me $5,000 for a black statuette of a bird. He was pretty sure I had it or knew where it was. Do you? Oh, I think I know someone who does, and... $5,000 is a lot of money. But right now, the police are trying to find out who hired us to tail Floyd Thursby. Mr. Spade, do they know about me? No, I don't think they do. I've been able to stall them so far. Must they know about me at all, Mr. Spade? Couldn't you manage somehow to shield me from them? Maybe. But I'll have to know what it's all about. I can't tell you now. Later I will, when, when I can. You must trust me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I, I'm so alone and afraid... I've got nobody to help me if you won't help me. Be generous, Mr. Spade. You're strong. You're brave. You can spare me some of that strength and courage, surely. <laughs> Sister, you don't need much of anybody's help. You're good. Chiefly your eyes, I think, and that throb you get in your voice when you say things like, be generous, Mr. Spade. All right. I deserve that. But the lie was in the way I said it. And not at all in what I said. Ah, now you are dangerous. Still, Cairo offered me $5,000. It's far more than I could ever offer you if I must bid for your loyalty. <laughs> yeah, that's good coming from you. Have you given me any of your confidence, any of the truth? I can't go ahead without more confidence in you than I have now. Can't you trust me just a little while? Well, how much is a little? And what are you waiting for? I must talk to Joe Cairo. Oh. Well, you can see him tonight. I know where to reach him. Oh, he can't come here. I can't let him know where I am. I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, we'll all meet at my place, then. All right. <laughs> I'm delighted to see you again, Mr. Shaughnessy. I was sure you would be, Joe. Mr. Spade told me about your offer for the Maltese Falcon. How soon can you have the money ready? Oh, it is ready. You are ready to give us $5,000 if we turn the falcon over to you? I shall be able to give you the money as soon as uh, the bank opens in the morning. But I haven't got the falcon. Then why did you send for me? Because I'll have it in another week. Yes? Where is it? Where Floyd hid it. If you know where he hid it, why, why must we wait a week? And why are you willing to sell it to me? I'm afraid. After what happened to Floyd, I'm afraid to touch it except to turn it over to somebody else right away. Exactly what did happen to Floyd? The fat man. Gottman? Is he here? I don't know. I suppose so. Uh, if you two let me interrupt for a second, I can answer that. Gutman is here. How do you know? Because he called me and asked me to see him. Have you? Not yet. I thought that after our friend Cairo here left, I'd find out just how you and I stand before I took on any more clients.
Now do you know how you and I stand, Sam? Yeah. If I can believe anything about you. But you're such a liar. I am a liar. I've always been a liar. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't brag about it. Was there any truth at all in that yarn you were telling me about Thursby and the Falcon? Some. Not very much. Well, we've got all night before us. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. So tired of lying and thinking up lies and not knowing what is a lie and what is the truth. I wish... Now, look, honey. I think I'd better have a talk with Gutman in the morning. <laughs> Now, Mr. Gutman, shall we talk about the falcon? No. Oh, by all means, Mr. Spade. But first, sir, answer me a question. Are you here as Mrs. O'Shaughnessy's representative? Well, there's nothing certain about it either way yet. It depends. Maybe it depends on Joel Cairo? Maybe. The question then, Mr. Spade, is which you'll represent. It will be Mrs. O'Shaughnessy or Mr. Cairo? I didn't say so. Who else is there? There's me. <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful, sir, wonderful. I do like a man who tells you right out he's looking out for himself. Don't we all? Uh-huh. Now let's talk about the blackbird. Let's, Mr. Spade. Have you any conception of how much money can be got out of that blackbird? No, but you just tell me what it is and I'll figure out the profits. You mean you don't know what that bird is? Well, I know it's black enamel and about a foot high and I know the value in human life you people put on it. Mr. O'Shaughnessy didn't tell you what it is? He offered and me... Cairo ten... didn't either? He offered me 10000 for it. Do either of them know what that bird is, sir? What is your impression? Well, there's not much to go by, but uh, I don't think so. If they don't know, I'm the only one in the whole wide, sweet world who does. Good. And when you tell me, there'll be two of us. <laughs> Mathematically correct, sir. But I don't know for certain that I'm going to tell you. Well, you think again and think fast. You'll do your talking today or you're through. What are you wasting my time for? I can get along without you. That remains to be seen, Mr. Spade. They're away. And there's another thing. Keep that gunman of yours away from me while you're making up your mind or I'll kill him. <laughs> well, sir, I must say you have a very violent temper. Think it over. You've got till 5.30. Then you're either in or out for Keith. Wilma. I'm going to kill that guy. I could have done it easy when he was standing there with his back to me. Of course you could, my boy. But business before pleasure. And we'll be seeing Mr. Spade again before 5.30. And so ends Act One of the Maltese Falcon, starring Peter Lorre, Sidney Greenstreet, Mary Astor, and Humphrey Bogart. Act Two in just a moment. But first, here's a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. Some weeks ago, I was being shown through a shipyard, one of the largest in the country, and stopped to chat with a young woman wearing a safety mask. It gave her a stern, rather severe look. But when she removed the mask to chat with me, she was young and blonde and very lovely. Her skin looked so dainty and fresh that I just couldn't resist saying, My, you look as though you just stepped out of a bandbox. She laughed and said, Oh, I've, I've been on the job since early this morning, and I haven't even had time to repowder my face. But after all, I do use your powder, you know. Of course, she's only one of millions of busy, important women who use Lady Esther face powder, partly because of its remarkable clinging quality. They explain that when they use Lady Esther face powder, they have the comfortable feeling that their skin always looks smooth and fresh, never streaked, caked, or shiny. But that's only one of the reasons why more lovely women now use Lady Esther face powder than any other kind. There are two other important reasons. First, the texture of my powder is so flattering that it hides the lines and blemishes, makes your skin look younger. And second, the shades of Lady Esther face powder are so rich, vivid, and alive, they give new interest, a look of new beauty to your skin. And both the unusual texture and the flattering shades are the result of my patented twin hurricane method of making face powder. So if you'd like to have your skin look softer, smoother, younger, and look that way for hours at a time, just try Lady Esther face powder. And now the curtain rises on the 
second act of the Maltese Falcon, starring Humphrey Bogart as Sam Spade, Mary Astor as Bridget O'Shaughnessy, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, the fat man, and Peter Lorre as Joel Cairo. <laughs> afternoon following Sam Spade's visit to Gutman's apartment. A dying man staggered into Spade's office and collapsed on the floor. He died before he could speak to Spade. But his papers identified him as Captain Jacoby of the steamship La Paloma. And clutched to his bullet-torn chest was the Maltese Falcon. After depositing the Falcon in a railroad station check room and mailing the identification check to his private post office box, Sam met Bridget O'Shaughnessy and took her to his apartment. You know, Sam, I never would have placed myself in this position if I hadn't trusted you completely. Oh, that again? But you know that's so. Uh, you don't have to trust me as long as you can persuade me to trust you. But, Sam, darling... Well, I think we'd better let it go at that until we see what happens after Gutman gets here. The fat man? Here? Certainly, why not? Anyway, that should be him. So it's too late to change our plans. I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Gutman. Good evening, sir. I see you brought company. I can understand the gunman, but I didn't know Cairo was a friend of yours. <laughs> we're old acquaintances. Now that we're all here, let's go in and sit down and be comfortable and talk. Oh, sure. Come on in. Well, look, Angel. Gutman brought a couple of friends along. Good evening, Mr. Shaughnessy. Hello, Joe. You look unusually charming this evening, my dear. Thanks. The uh, gunsel doesn't talk, Angel. Get away from me, punk. Stand still and shut up. Listen, you're not going to frisk me, touch me, and I'm going to make you use that gun. Ask your boss if he wants me shut up before we talk. Never mind, Wilma. <laughs> you're certainly a most headstrong and unpredictable individual, Mr. Spade. Now, why did you send for me? You ready to make the first payment and take the falcon off my hands? The falcon? That's right, Angel. I've got it. Well, sir, I have in this envelope $10,000. 10000 10, Oh, we were talking about more money than that. Yes, sir, we were, but there are more of us to be taken care of now. <laughs> well, that may be, but I've got the falcon. I shouldn't think it would be necessary to remind you, Mr. Spade, that uh, though you may have the falcon, yet we certainly have you. Yes, I'm trying not to let that worry me, but uh, let the money wait. There's another thing to be taken care of first. We've got to have a fall guy. I beg your pardon? Police have got to have a victim, somebody they can stick for those three murders. Two, two. Only two murderers, Mr. Spade. Thursby undoubtedly killed your partner. All right, all right. Two, then. Well, the point I've got to give the police, a victim when the time comes. If I don't, I'll be it. Uh, let's give him, uh, let's give him Wilmer here. Why, you dirty He rat. actually did shoot Thursby and Jacoby, didn't he? Anyway, he's made to order for the part. Let's turn him over to them. <laughs> By God, so you are a character, that you are. <laughs> There's ever, never any telling what you'll say or do next, except that it's bound to be something astonishing. Well, it's our best bet. With him in their hands, the police will forget the rest of us. Your plan is not at all practical, sir. Let's not say anything more about it. All right. I have another suggestion. Let's give him Cairo. Well, by God, sir. Suppose we give him you, Mr. Spade, or, or Mr. Shaughnessy. How about that, huh? Sam, you wouldn't. You people want the fork, and I've got it. The fall guy is part of the price I'm insisting on. You seem to forget you're not in a position to insist on anything. No? If you kill me, how are you going to get the falcon? By God, sir, you are a character. <laughs> well? Well, what else can I do? I'm sorry, Wilma. Terribly sorry. I want you to know that I couldn't be any fonder of you if you were my own son. But, well, if you lose a son, it's possible to get another. And there's only one Maltese falcon. You rat, I'll kill you for this. Thank you, Mr. Spade. When you're as young as Wilma, one simply doesn't understand these things. <laughs> now, how about some coffee, Bridget? Put the pot on, will you? I don't like to leave my guests. Surely. Anything to get out of here. Now, sir, let's get down to business. I ought to have more than 10000 Of course, sir. You understand this is the first payment. You still don't understand the falcon's worth. Well, a black enamel bird can't be worth millions. But it is. Otherwise, I should not have spent 17 years of my life trying to uh, acquire it. The black enamel you refer to, sir, is merely camouflage, covering a solid gold bird encrusted from head to foot with the finest jewels. Okay. So I get millions later. How's about 15,000 now? Frankly and candidly, and on my word of honor as a gentleman, the 10,000 I gave you is all the money I can raise right now. 
Yeah, but you didn't say positively. <laughs> positively. Well, if that's the best you can do, it's the best you can do. But it's understood the punk has to stand as the fall guy. That is part of our agreement, sir. Okay, I'll make a phone call. The falcon will be here in an hour. <laughs> not the Maltese falcon. Why? This is a lead imitation covered with the same enamel. See where I've shaved it off with a knife lead. Your lead. You bungled it. You, Gutman, you and your stupid attempt to buy it from the Russian who owned it. He caught on to how valuable it was. No wonder we had so little trouble stealing it. You, you imbecile, you, you bloated idiot. Well, sir, what do you suggest? Shall we stand here and shed tears and call each other names? Mm. Or shall we pay the Russian another call in Istanbul? Uh, are you going? Seventeen years I've wanted that little item, and I intend to get it. Another year? Well, sir, that will be an additional expenditure of time on only five and fifteen seventeenths percent. I go with you. Good. And Wilma? Wilma, he... Where? Where is the boy? He must have had made his getaway while we were unwrapping the fog. A swell lot of thieves. Well, sir... I left to ask you to return my $10,000. I held up my end. It's your hard luck, not mine, if you didn't get what you wanted. I'm sorry, but I must insist. Oh, a hideout gun, huh? Okay. Thank you, sir. The shortest farewells are the best. Adieu. And to you, Miss O'Shaughnessy, I leave the fake fault and falcon as a little memento. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Come, Carl. Hello, police department. Lieutenant Dundee there, put him on. Tell him Sam Spade's calling. Now, look, Angel. Gutman and Cairo will talk when the cops nail them about us. We've only got minutes to get set for the police. Now, give me your whole story fast. Well, where... Where shall I begin? Uh, the day you first came to my office. Why did you want Thursby shadowed? I, I suspected him of betraying me to Gutman, and I wanted to find That's out. That's a lie. Gutman tried to make a deal with him. You had Thursby hooked, and you knew it. You wanted to get him out of the way before Captain Jacoby arrived with a falcon. Isn't that so? What was your scheme? I thought if he saw someone following him, he might be frightened into going away. Now look, Archer had many brains, but he wasn't clumsy enough to be spotted the first night. You must have told Thursby he was being followed. I told him. Yes. But please believe me, Sam. I wouldn't have told him if I thought Floyd would kill him. If you thought he wouldn't kill Archie, you were right, Angel. Didn't he? Archie had been a detective too long to be caught shadowing a man up a blind alley with his gun tucked away in his hip and his overcoat button. But he'd have gone up there with you, Angel. He was just dumb enough for that. Sam. And then you could have stood as close to him as you liked there in the dark. Put a hole through him with a gun you'd gotten from Thursby that evening. Don't, don't talk to me like that, Sam. You know I didn't... Now, the police will be blowing in any minute now, Angel. Talk. Oh, why do you accuse me of such a terrible... Why did you shoot Archie? You thought Thursby would tackle him and one or the other would go down. If Thursby was killed, then you were rid of him. If it was Archer, then you could see that Thursby was caught. Was that it? Something. And when something you find like out that. that Thursby didn't mean to tackle Archer, you borrowed the gun and did it yourself, right? I guess so. I know so. You didn't know Gutman was here looking for you until you learned Thursby was shot. Then you needed another protector. So you came back to me. Yes, but oh, sweetheart, it wasn't only that. I, I would have come back to you sooner or later. From the very first instant I saw you, I knew that... Oh, you angel. Well, if you get a good break, you'll be out of San Quentin in 20 years. Sam, you're not... Yes, angel. I'm going to send you over. But if they hang you, I'll always remember you. Don't, Sam. Don't say that. Even in fun. It's not fun. I happen to be in the detective business, and you killed my partner. It's bad business to let the killer get away with it. Bad for every detective in this country. You're taking the fall. You've been playing with me, only pretending you cared to trap me like this. You didn't care at all. You don't love me. Uh, I... I think I do. But what of it? I won't play the sap for you. You know it's not like that. You can't say that. I am saying it. You know down deep in your heart, you know that in spite of everything I've done, I love you. I don't care who loves who. You killed Archer. And you're going over for it. Come in. Oh, hello, copper. Hello, Sam. 
You got Gutman and Cairo? We got Cairo. Gutman's dead. The kid Wilmer had just finished shooting him when we got there. So I ought to have expected that. Well, you better put the cuffs on Angel Copper. We're taking her down to the station. What charge? Damn. Murder. She shot Miles Archer. Oh, and you better bring that blackbird along too, Copper. It's part of the evidence against Cairo. Hey, this is heavy. What's it made of? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. And so ends the story of the Maltese Falcon. Thank you, Mary Esther, Humphrey Bogart, Sidney Greenstreet, and Peter Laurie for appearing with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players tonight and also for telling us a most exciting story. It was our pleasure, Mr. Bradley. We all had a wonderful time making the picture, and the radio version tonight brought back some wonderful memories. Then, too, knowing that the benefits from these programs that support the motion picture country house and clinic give us an added incentive. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Arthur. Ladies... You know, it's surprising the number of letters new users of Lady Esther face powder have sent me in the last few months. So many of them say the same thing, that Lady Esther face powder is an entirely different kind of powder, that it does wonderful things for the appearance of the skin, <clears throat> makes it look softer, smoother, and often years younger. Well, Lady Esther face powder is more flattering, more becoming, because my powder isn't just mixed, just blended like ordinary face powder. It's made by a method new, unique, exclusively mine. You see, Lady Esther face powder is blown at whirling speed by my famous twin hurricane. Yes, my patented twin hurricane process blows and whips color and powder particles together until they're evenly married, blended into a fine, smooth, sheer mist of beauty, finer in texture and truer in shade than powder ever made by ordinary methods. That's why Lady Esther face powder smooths down so much more evenly. And why the shades of my powder are so clear and alive, they make your skin younger looking, more vivid, far lovelier. Why don't you try Lady Esther face powder and see how much happier you'll be with the appearance of your skin? Before we tell you about next week's program, Humphrey Bogart has a word to say from our government. You all know the third war loan drive is on full steam. The drive to back the attack our fighting forces are making against our enemies. As our share toward victory, we at home must buy $15 billion worth of war bonds, which means each one of us must dig down deeper into our own pockets. Each of us must buy at least one extra bond this month. We have to win this war, and we will win, all right. But how soon we win is up to every one of us. So buy an extra war bond this week, sure, to help speed our day to victory. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present highlights from Warner Brothers' great new musical picture, Thank Your Lucky Stars. It will star Joan Leslie, Dennis Morgan, Diana Shore, and Eddie Cantor. Be sure to listen. Humphrey Bogart can soon be seen in the Warner Brothers' production, Thank Your Lucky Stars. Mary Astor is currently playing in the metro golden Mayor Technicolor production, Thousands Cheer. Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Laurie appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. To help your government save tin, buy the larger size of Lady Esther face cream, and at the same time, you will save yourself money to invest in war bonds and stamps. Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain Up presents the stars in their choices. Boris Karloff in Hanging Judge, a play by Raymond Massey based on a novel by Bruce Hamilton. Hanging Judge. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner Harry Gosling guilty or not guilty? Guilty. 
But we ask that the prisoner should be recommended to mercy on the ground that the murder was not premeditated. Harry Gosling, you stand convicted of murder. Have you anything to say why a sentence of death should not be pronounced upon you according to law? I'm not guilty. Not guilty. Harry Gosling, you have been convicted of a foul and brutal murder. The defence which you concocted has been demonstrated to the satisfaction of the jury to be untrue. You must now prepare yourself to undergo the penalty which the law enacts for such a crime as you have committed. The recommendation which the jury have added to their verdict will be forwarded to the proper quarters where it will receive due consideration. My duty is now to pass upon you the sentence of the law. That sentence is that you be taken hence to a lawful prison and then to a place of Why the hell don't the governor come? He said eight o'clock. He'll not. come. Take it easy, Harry. There he is now. The governor. Okay. Well, uh, Gosling, I, I brought Mr. Nottingham along. He's come straight from the Home Secretary. I, I'm sorry, old man. You mean? There's no reprieve, sir. I'm, I'm afraid not. Now, you remember, I warned you not to be too hopeful. Yes, but I c couldn't carry it that far. You're pulling my leg, aren't you, Mr. Nottingham? I wish from my heart I was. But I'm afraid I can't hold out any hope now, Harry. You've got to try to be brave. It ain't fair. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I never killed her. You know I told the truth, sir. And so did that swine of a judge shaking himself on the bench. He knew I wasn't guilty. He told him to say I was, just for the kick of it. He's the real murderer, cursed him. Oh, God. I hope somebody makes him pay for this, the cold devil. I hope he pays. Mr. Justice Britton. Sir Francis Britton is not at home. Will he be in later this evening? I'm afraid he's out, sir. And tomorrow he's going away. If you want to see him, you'll have to wait till after the vacation, the second week in January. Well, my business won't wait. I must see him tonight. Where can I find him? I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to tell you that. I think you'd better. On his account more than on my own. I tell you I'm not at liberty. Anyway, he's at his club and you wouldn't be able to see him there. The adept. Thank you. How did you know that? <laughs> anyway, he won't see you. He'll see me, all right. Oh, yes. He'll see me. Good evening, Judd. Yes. Good evening, Lamprey. Observe uh, what a day it's been. I took a bit of a breather and I went down to Sandwich and played in a monthly medal at St. George's. How did you do? I won it, by Joe. With a rollicking 78 and a gale of wind. Anything in the paper, Sir Francis? Oh, good Lord, they've hanged that poor fellow Gosling. I thought he'd get a reprieve. Uh, oh, I say, I'm sorry. It's quite all right, Lamprey. Ah, oh, good evening, Lamprey. Hello, Sidney. Good evening, Judge. Good evening, Sidney. Buy me a drink, Lamprey. That ruddy market took another turn today. How's your Midland steel? Oh, we're still alive. No thanks to you lawyers. <laughs> yeah, here's Robert. What do you have, Sidney? You've got to help me to celebrate. I'm going to buy you a good dinner, too, you old pauper. What? Oh, very well. I'll have my usual, then. Uh, a large martini, Robert, sir. No vegetables in it. No, Sir George. Judge? No, thank you, Lamprey. Whiskey and soda, Robert. Very good, sir. Uh, what are you celebrating, Lamprey? A hanging? Sydney. This club is composed of all the murdering professions. Lawyers, doctors and actors. The latter are the most ingenious. They do it by boredom. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you industrialists accomplish a lethal project? Suicide, I should think. 
Oh, what the hell are you so pleased about, Lamprey? Oh, I won the monthly medal in St. George's with a 78. Blowing like sin, too. What did you do at the maiden? Well, I got my four. But I had to get out of that horror with a sandblaster. A sandblaster is an illegal club that should not be used in tournament play. The rules of the Royal and Ancient are quite explicit on that point. Oh, really? <laughs> Roberts. Sir? I shall be dining later. <sighs> well, I'm damned. Oh, it's impossible. What does that desiccated, pompous old boar know about golf? As a matter of fact, he's pretty good. I'd like to take a sandblaster to him. A large martini and a whiskey, sir. Ah, uh, start, fellow Roberts. Uh, cheers, Lampy. Cheers. <sighs> I say, old Britain doesn't mind advertising himself. He's left this paper open at a report of his oration at the carpenter's dinner last night. Just take a look. Evening. Well, evening. I, I say, I, I know you. It's, uh, it, oh, it's Colonel Archer. I, I met you when we were handling that smuggling case in Hong Kong four years ago. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. You're, um... I'm George Sidney. Mm. Jolly good to see you, old chap. Uh, this is Miles Lamprey. A thieving lawyer, I'm afraid. <laughs> How, do you, How do? do you do? Archer's Commissioner of Police in Hong Kong, Lampe. Well, I was. I retired last year. Oh, I'm jolly glad to see you, Sidney. I've been wandering around looking for a face I knew. Our club, the Grevel, has been housed by you for summer cleaning. Oh, you came in without a guide. <laughs> Stout fella. Have a drink. Lampering here all by it. He's just hung a chap. Not me. I had nothing to do with it. And won some perishing metal. And he's filthy rich. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have to dine in Belgrave Square in 20 minutes, oh, but... come along, Lamprey. Can't all those fat briefs buy a few drinks? Roberts, another double martini. <clears throat> Archer, my boy, you should avail yourself of one of Lamprey's rare moments of hospitality. Well, uh, whiskey and soda, thank you. Same for me, Roberts, please. Yes, sir. Uh, you don't know when Sir Francis will be returning, do you, sir? No. Why? Only that a person has called and wishes to see him, sir. <laughs> Two whiskies and a martini. You can have the old goat as far as I'm concerned. Who are you talking about? Sir Francis Britton, the High Court judge. He tried the Midland Steel case. Right? Yes, damn his eyes. What did that decision mean to Midland, Sidney? Well, I uh, wouldn't give Britton the satisfaction of thinking that he'd hit us very hard. He hasn't as yet. But it could set the development of the steel industry of this country back 20 years. And I'll never forgive him for that. For I firmly believe that it was a venomous decision. We'll win our appeal. Oh, damn it, don't make me talk about that. Oh, that's uh, jolly quick, Roberts. Payton had anticipated your wishes, Sir George. Oh, happy for Joe. Oh, cheers, Lamprey, and uh, here's to you, Archer. Cheers. cheers. <sighs> How long will you be home? Well, I'm home for good. I've just been appointed chief of the Norfolk Constabulary, which is a comfortable progression from the Far East. <laughs> Hello, Nottingham. Oh, how are you, Nottingham? I'm feeling pretty grim, thank you. Archer, this must be a unique occasion. A lawyer feels grim. Oh, Sydney. damn it, Sidney. Don't try to be funny. Nottingham, I'm your friend. This club is filled with lawyers, as is my less exclusive alternative, the House of Commons. I know too many lawyers. You alone are tolerable. You have a heart, my friend. Don't listen to him, Nottingham. Oh, uh, Nottingham, this is my friend, Colonel Archer. Oh. Uh, this is an amiable and honest barrister, Keith Nottingham. How do you do? How do you do? I Jove, I'm sorry, but I'm already late for dinner. I must dash along. Well, um... Sidney, look, here's my card. There's excellent golf at Hunt Stanton near my home. What do you say to a round one day soon? No, oh, fine idea. It's good to have you back home, old chap. Good night, Sidney. Good night, Nottingham. Uh, good night. Good night, Archer. Good night, um... <laughs> Lamprey, old boy. You know, the sort you die of a surfeit of. <laughs> <laughs> good night. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a splendid chap. Yes, I agree. Go oh, hand me that paper, Sidney. Uh, Roberts, whiskey and soda, please. Uh, the same, Robert. Uh, another large martini, Roberts. Yes, sir. Old well, Britain was on his hobby horse again last night, I see. Listen to this. I will say, categorically, that within the memory of any living man, no person in this country has suffered the extreme penalty of the law without having richly deserved that fate. Damn it, so. He could say that when young Harry Gosling was a few hours away from the gallows. Sorry, Nottingham, I know how you feel about this case. For that matter, every case you take on. You make the best fight that could be made for him. You couldn't have done more. This was the wrong verdict, Lamprey, and I wouldn't say that if I didn't feel it deeply. Britain was trying me, not Gosling. He hates me. I believe any counsel he didn't dislike might have won. Oh, come, Nottingham, old boy. You're not the only brief snatcher Britain's had it in for. Uh, in the Midland Steel case, I... Quiet, uh... didn't he? 
I read old Britain's summing up. They're always pretty clear and defined. Oh, clear, yes. It seemed to me that you'd been batting on a sticky wicket, old chap. I wasn't, by heaven. If ever there was a reasonable doubt to work for, I had it. Oh, God, I had it. Here's a case of a, an hysterical girl, baby on the way. She's trying to get him to marry her. He can't. He's no money. She stabs herself. He's watching. He's seen it. He's, he's faced with that awful fact, the dead body. What can he do? He panics. He dumps it in the canal, poor youngster. We all know what panic is, but not Britain. He worked harder on that point than the crown. He played it as if he were pleading. And he allowed the boy's past record to be in on the damnedest technicality. I argued those points with everything I had at the appeal and for two hours last night at the home office. West was hog-tied by advice from the bench. Britain wanted a conviction, and he got it, and he made it stick. Oh, Lord Nottingham, I know how badly you feel, but you must admit old Britain knows his law, and he's pretty thorough. I believe he lives for the law. There's nothing else he cares about. Damnation! How can you be a good lawyer without one spark of human kindness? Lamprey, I saw Gosling last night, a few hours away from the rope. You didn't, and I just failed at the home office. Well, he's out of it now. Emotion and the law... A painful combination. Here's to you, Nottingham, old man. You're a stout fellow. Oh, hell, I'll give you a toast. To confusion on the bench. As if there wasn't plenty of it now. That was an interesting toast, Sidney. Oh. I assume you... you drank it alone? No. I drank to it also, Judge. I was thinking of the late Harry Gosling... That remark does you no credit, Nottingham, neither as to your manners nor as to your conduct as a barrister. Were it not that this is a gentleman's club, I would report you to the benches of your inn. But I make allowances for what may perhaps be termed excess of zeal. I will be pleased to forget this incident. Sir Francis, you and I both follow the profession of the law. We have that in common. But we have little else. I do not believe that ours or any criminal law can be an unfailing pilot of justice. Mortal laws are administered by mortal men. Neither is infallible. Till the day I die, I cannot and will not leave my heart in the robing room. Very aptly phrased, Nottingham. I confess I've never seen you enter a courtroom unequipped with that somewhat unpredictable organ. But I have not at any time claimed that the criminal law is an infallible instrument. But this I will claim, that in this country it approaches as near perfection as is humanly possible. And further, I believe that such perfection increases in direct proportion to the gravity of the issue judged. In cases of less than first importance, there may at times be excessive or even undeserved punishment, but in a capital charge, such a lapse leading to a miscarriage of justice is absolutely impossible. Oh, I pray to God that never again will I plead a case before you. Excuse me, Sidney. I know now why that damned statue has a bandage on. Well, I've got to go and make some more laws for you fellows to argue about. Good night, Lamprey. Put your medal under your pillow and make a wish. Good night, Sidney. Good night, Judge. Good night. Are you dining, Judge? Yes. We could split a bottle of Montrachet. Capital. Excuse me, Sir Francis. There's a man waiting to see you. Oh. Uh, didn't he give his name? No, sir. Uh, I'll go in and keep the tables. I'll join you, Lamprey. Well, send him packing, Roberts. I'll not Sir be... Sir Francis Britton. My name is Teal. T-E-A-L. Very good, Roberts. I will deal with this man. Yes, sir. What does this intrusion mean? I've never seen you before in my life. No, of course you haven't. I've seen you, though. I saw you yesterday in your court. Yes, yes, yes. A great many people visit the court, sir. I think I must ask you to go. Oh, no, Sir Francis. You can't do that to me. I have a lot to say to you. Don't you remember the name of Teal? That's my name. And this ring. Do you remember that? Your name is Teal? Yes. It is. Quite a comfortable room, this, isn't it? This is quite impossible. I must ask you to go. I understand. Someone may come in. It's not good that I should be seeing with you in your club, is it? 
Much better, I think, if I came to Moxton, Mr. Bainbridge. What's that? How the devil did you know that? That's quite a little story. But it would be better to talk to you there rather than here, wouldn't it? As you seem to know the whereabouts of my house in Norfolk, hanged by incognito, heaven knows how. Uh, you'd better come there. <sighs> I suggest Friday, the day after tomorrow, at nine o'clock in the evening. It will not be to your interest to divulge my private address or my other identity, which I use for reasons of privacy. Now, please be off. Thank you, Sir Francis. I knew you'd see me, but it was better to come here first, wasn't it? On Friday, then, at nine o'clock. Where did you walk to this afternoon, dearie? Over the marshes to the old mill and back. It's a perfect lonely walk. Not a soul to be seen. You just can't abide people, can you, my dear? Oh, I come to Boxton for peace and quiet, Mary, and I will have what I want. So you shall, my dear. There's your coffee. Thank you, dear. Mary, uh, mm -hmm. has your father made any further objection to your working here? Oh, he doesn't think much of it, but that doesn't matter. I'm grown up and I like working here. That is, when you're here, Ducks. <laughs> then it's fun. Besides, Dad likes the money I earn. You're quite generous, Mr. Bainbridge. You've been a good girl and not talked to your father or anyone else about us? What a worrier. Heavens no, why should I? I don't talk. Not about that sort of thing. That's my business. No, dearie, Dad won't give me trouble. And I'm going to give you a lovely holiday. Oh, Mary. Get yourself a glass for some port. Thank you, Ducks. I don't mind if I do. Ah, oh, the peace of this place. Thank God for it. And for you, my sweet. How nicely you've kept everything. Is that the old silver tanker that I got in Sutton Thorpe? You said you wanted a shiny prize. I cleaned it up for it's you. It's lovely. It's a good one. I've had plenty of time to work on it. Oh, it does get lonely here, dearie. Nearly eight weeks since you were here last. Oh. You must have been teaching those boys an awful lot in wherever you live. Mary. Oh, I don't mind where you live as long as you come back. More often, though, I should like. What's this, Freddy? A sort of paper. Leave it alone, Mary. Oh. It's a headache powder, and I shall probably want it. I, I have a migraine coming on, I'm afraid. I've never seen you take these before. Oh, I'm sorry you've got a headache. Now, you must be going, my dear. It's nearly nine o'clock. Why? Have you got to work tonight? You never do down here. Now, I've told you not to be inquisitive when I asked you to do anything. I want you to go home early tonight because I have to do some work. Now, that's all that I can tell you. Well, I think you might have finished your rotten old work before you came down to see me. You know what I think. I think you've got a lot of girls to teach, not boys at all. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't send me away like this. <laughs> what a ridiculous little monkey it is. <sighs> now, run along. Freddy, my sweet. I think I could scare that work right away. Oh, Oh, you must go, my love. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. It isn't work, not exactly. There's a man coming here tonight, and I must see him alone. It's a confidential matter. Just a poor fellow who's out of work, and I want to help him. But tomorrow, everything will be all right, and our holiday will begin then. Now, won't you be a good girl and understand? Well, there's a new one. Nobody ever comes here. I don't think some poor tramp who's out of work should come before well, me. I couldn't arrange it any other way. Oh, oh confound it. Ah, this migraine is really coming on. Oh, get me a glass of brandy, Mary. All right. Glad I had that powder. It's the last one, too. Oh, don't tell anyone about this man who's coming here tonight. I, I don't want anyone to know that I can be visited here. I, I want to be alone. With you. Worry killed a cow. Here's your brandy, yeah. sweet. I hope you feel better soon. Careful, dearie, you're spilling the powder on the rug. There he is now. Run along, Mary. I'll answer the door. I'll see you in the morning then, my dear. Go out the back way. There's a good girl. All right. 
Good night. Good evening. Good evening. In here, please. Uh, this is a lonely room. One chair, one glass of brandy. <laughs> Just as you would have it. Just as I expected when I looked at it from the outside three months ago. How dare you? Oh, yes, last spring. I followed you here from your house in London. I know your habits well, Mr... Shall I call you Mr. Bainbridge? You will address me as Sir Francis. Uh, your private life as Mr. Frederick Bainbridge is well guarded, isn't it? The innkeeper tells me I'm your first visitor. You observed my instructions? Oh, yes. It would have done me no good to betray your innocent privacy. You will tell me at once what you are here for. You've made two mistakes so far, Sir Francis. Bad ones. And I was quite sure you would. I counted on that. You didn't have me thrown out of your club. You invited me here to Moxton. Panic, wasn't it, Sir Francis? I wonder if the club steward heard me tell you my name. Your name meant nothing to me. It meant enough for you to bring about this meeting. The innkeeper here knows my name, too, and he'll expect me to return to the inn. Teal, if that is your name, you will be wise to come to the point of your visit. And then you chose to see me here alone. That's your second mistake. You're sure that I am alone? Oh, yes, quite sure. You've just sent your housekeeper, or whatever you call her, away, and there's no detective with a notebook hiding behind that door. Why should I take such precautions? Just for the reason that you have a heavy stick handy. And then, of course, there's your telephone. Exactly. May I sit down? I... My heart's not strong. I... Oh, no. Don't feel reassured, Sir Francis. It would be unfortunate if I died when, as you claim, you know so little about me. These threatening remarks can point to only one thing, and I would warn you that... The name of Teal hasn't a pleasant memory for you, has it? I haven't been out of your mind one moment for three days, have I? I believe you to be an imposter. You've made some clumsy allusions to a friendship which I had for a certain Mabel Teal 30 years ago. You remember this ring? The initials F.B. are engraved inside it. Francis Britton, Frederick Bainbridge. It's strange that you should use the same alias all these years. Another mistake, but it was so long ago. From what it? you know, or pretend to know, you expect some gain. That would look very much like blackmail. It does. I'm right again. And I would have you know that the law is terrible for the blackmailer, and it very properly protects the victim. I shall telephone for the police. I shouldn't do that. There's no blackmail. I want from you exactly nothing. <laughs> that confuses you, doesn't it? Do you want? <laughs> Who are you? Panic again, Sir Francis. You don't like panic. You're very severe with those who suffer panic. When you hang Gosling, you told the jury panic can presuppose guilt as well as innocence. You see, I quote you accurately. That is what I said. Could an innocent man have disposed of the girl's body in such a brutish and callous manner? Oh, how you... Pounced on that. It was the action of a guilty man. A frightened boy, Mr. Justice. You don't believe that there can be suicides when murder is suggested? It was a cowardly crime. I hope I may hear those words again from you, Mr. Justice. What do you mean? Day after day I've sat in your court in the public gallery. Four times in six months I've watched you send men to the rope. You're quite mad, aren't you? Huh? Perhaps. And you still think you can deal with that? The madman can be safe behind bars. Oh, but I'm cleverer than you, so don't use your telephone. You'll see there isn't time. For God's sake, who are you? The hanging judge gets his verdict. Just the facts and no emotion. The beautiful machine. You're not used to fear, Britain. You've not felt fear for 30 years. But you did then, I know, because I have your letters. Squalid, fearful letters of a coward written to Mabel Teal, my mother. Your mother. Take them. Read them, Britain. Read them. The Britain case will have its letters, too, and they'll be admissible and relevant. Read them. 
Read them carefully. Yes, I'm your son. Your son and Mabel Teal. I don't believe you. These letters are fake. Don't bluff, Britain. Why have you waited all these years to... My mother died a year ago. She kept her secret until the end. She was a fool. Well, that's one you didn't write. You've never seen that one before. It was written to me one year ago by a foolish old woman almost your age. My mother. She hadn't had it fat and easy like you. She was sick and dying when... <clears throat> prepared for that. I shan't go that way. You can't get rid of me that easily. And it's no use trying to destroy those letters. You're sick. Sick in mind and body. Don't try kindness. It's no part of you. I know for I'm just like you. Just as cold and just as ruthless. It's in the family, you see. Why have you waited a year to see me? I wasn't ready. I've been preparing my first and only case. The Britain case. And it's a good one. I'm prosecutor and judge. And you, Mr. Justice, are in the dock. You're indicted for the crime of being without a soul. For the crime of being unloved. For the crime of being without faith. Not even in your law. Have you ever had tears in your eyes? No. The only emotion you ever had was in the writing of those letters... Emotion? Ah, panic. You've panicked before and you will again. I can give you that feeling you've always scorned and I will. Stop! I hate you, Britain, because you're like me. Because you gave me life. I loathe you beyond man's belief. <clears throat> oh. Quick. What? what? There's a capsule in my waistcoat pocket. Huh? Right. Uh. Give it to me. Put it in my mouth. I can't. Here. Uh, now drink the brandy. Uh, thank you. And you did it. That capsule. Poison. And you gave it to me. Damn you. That's murder. <laughs> now, what will you do? I I wonder. Oh. Teal. Stop laughing. Don't fool, man. I'll get a doctor. Teal! Dead. Dead. Morning, Roberts. When Colonel Archer arrives, tell him I'm in the writing room, will you? Very good, sir. Morning, Sidney. Well, if it isn't Ronnie Bond, I didn't see you behind the paper. How's the old probate, admiralty and divorce? Bust up any homes today? No, trade's bad. Oh, so you're having a nice, quiet time reading the murders, eh? I am, as it happens. Did I hear you mention Colonel Archer? He'll be in this mess down in Norfolk, no doubt. Oh? Well, which mess is that? Don't you read the papers, old boy? They found Teal's body. The chap who disappeared from the pub in Moxton three weeks ago. Oh, so now the fun begins. Where was it found? It is used well in the garden of a chap named Bainbridge. Oh. What has Bainbridge to say about it? Nothing. As this rag pertinently remarks, it will be recalled that when Teal was last seen at the inn, he expressed his intention of visiting Mr. Bainbridge. From this meeting, he never returned. Mr. Bainbridge is not at present in residence. Aha. Uh -huh. I suspect, of course, that this is a quite unauthorised announcement. And it's not difficult to see who's been speaking out of turn. Mr. Alfred Motley, the parish clerk of Moxton, gave our correspondent a vivid description of the finding of the body. I had noticed an unpleasant smell coming from Mr. Bainbridge's garden. This aroused my suspicions, and I communicated with Inspector Vincent of the Norfolk Constabulary, who was investigating Teal's disappearance. 
As a result of what I told him, Inspector Vincent descended into the well and after some difficulty came up with Teal's body. It was in a ghastly condition and had obviously been in the water several weeks. Yes, rousing attractive, I should say. The brickwork of the well is raised at least two feet above the ground and I do not see how it would have been possible for Teal to fall in accidentally. Unfortunately, Mr. Bainbridge, who might be able to throw some light on the matter, is away. He is in the habit of paying regular visits to Moxton, but no one knows anything of his life outside. He is believed to be a schoolmaster in Lancashire. You ask your friend Archer what he thinks about that vivid description. Ah, oh, Francis. I didn't know you were back in town. Oh, I had some business brought me back, and the weather wasn't too good. Morning, Sidney. Good morning, Judge. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I've got a letter to write. In Scotland, weren't you, Judge? Yes, a walking trip, but the mist became intolerable. Oh? My wife writes from Goldsby that the weather was fine. Uh, that's the East Coast. I was in the West Highlands. <sighs> you must have found the papers interesting this morning, Pond, with your predilection for detective stories. There seems to be a good involved case shaping up in Norfolk. Yes, I should imagine that it'll turn out to be a murder. Probably motivated by a blackmail attempt. No, I don't think so. I'd say from the heart weakness that the death was from natural causes. There's no mention here of the dead man having had a weak heart. Where did you see that? Oh, uh, I seem to remember something to that effect. Uh, I must say... Besides, in the best detective fiction, heart attacks are not timed by nature to occur conveniently on the parapets of wells. Mm. <laughs> you're not at your ease when you're for the defence, Francis. Uh, Try the other side where you're on familiar ground. When is the inquest? Huh? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't stay in this paper. Oh, yes. Friday. Ah. I say, Kent are doing well. Ah, what are you going to do for the rest of the vacation? Back to Scotland? Oh, I rather think I'll go abroad. Uh, where was that place you enjoyed so much two years ago? Oh, saint -Yvette. Yes, it's delightful. Very quiet and free of English people. Hmm. This fellow Bainbridge. He seems to have acquired a substantial anonymity. Bainbridge? Oh, you're back on the Moxton case. I thought crime bored you. Yes, it seems he was rather anxious to cover himself with mystery. Or rather, he's had mystery thrust on him. <laughs> I must say, I wouldn't know how to track him down if I were the police. Uh, of course, they, they'd have nothing to hold him on if they did find him, would you say? Good Lord, I don't know. There's no autopsy report on the body, no real information of any kind. I suspect that this whole announcement of yesterday is quite unauthorised. I dare say. Oh, good Lord, I'll be on circuit in the autumn. Now, if there is a case against Bainbridge and they catch him, it's quite likely that I'll try the case. Oh, no, no, no. Norfolk, uh, Eastern Circuit. I shall be in the Midland. Parkinson will have it, yes. Pity. It would have been most interesting. You know, I detest the blackmailer above all. I might be able to vary my impressive list of convictions with an acquittal, and the Bradenham papers might even print an acknowledgement of my uh, dawning humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't read detective stories, Francis? I shall send you two or three good Thorndikes. <laughs> uh, what about some lunch? I'm rather peckish. It's only a little after twelve, rather early for lunch, but... Uh, I'll come and watch you. I'm sorry to make your lunch so early, Sidney, but I have to be back at Scotland Yard again at two o'clock. Oh, suits me equally well. What do you have, Archer? We don't have to eat just yet. Well, um, dry sherry, thank you. Yeah, strangely enough, I think I'll have a martini, Roberts. With no vegetables, Sir George. Wonderful fella. By the way, I gave this club as my whereabouts during lunchtime, and I may be rung up. I hope you'll forgive me. Oh, but of course. Yeah, well, uh, Archer, you're uh, off to a tough start in your new job. Yes, quite a difficult case. I called in Scotland Yard yesterday, but that doesn't mean I've given up the case. I read the newspaper stuff. There's not much to go on. That confounded statement about the body being found has obviously made our quarry run to ground. Yes. We got in the papers in spite of the police. But it's pretty clear that we have a murder on our hands, and I'm convinced that this missing fellow of Bainbridge is our man. Well, you fellows don't talk that way without reason. More than meets the eye, uh, at least this eye, is there? Very much so. One martini and a sherry, sir. Oh, thanks, Roberts. Well, uh, 
May you get your man. Good health. Cheers. Uh, tell me about this Bainbridge fellow. Nobody knows much about him in the district. There was no trace of any other base or residence. I gather he wasn't very sociable. Definitely not, no. None of the gentry knew him personally, and only a few by sight. One or two tradesmen and the innkeeper were the only people who had any communication with him. He had a rather unsavoury reputation as far as his servant was concerned. He wanted amorous acquiescence in addition to culinary skill. 100% efficiency, what? <laughs> what, what, what? What was the cause of Teal's death? Police surgeon reports that he definitely wasn't drowning. No water in the lungs and the well was almost dry. Bashed? No, 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 just superficial marks due to the drop. The well was about um, 25 feet deep. We're still waiting for the post-mortem report on the stomach. Well, what did you find on the body? Only one thing of consequence, but that's quite enough to make me want to find very much Mr. Bainbridge. As this case has gone to the CID, I suppose I shouldn't do this, but... Well, I'm, um, I'm going to show you this squalid little dossier on friend Bainbridge. These documents were found in a sort of secret pocket sewed up in Teal's coat under the left armpit. They were in an oilskin wallet, and with the exception of the outside ones, they were not too badly spoiled. Yes... Yes, they're, they're copies, of course, photostat. The first one's a birth certificate. Notice the names? Francis Mabelteel. Frederick Bainbridge. Uh-huh. And the date? November 30th, 35 years ago. About Teal's age, according to the doctor's best guess. Yes, it looks as if the fellow was a relation of Bainbridge's. What's uh, your Bainbridge's first name? Frederick. Uh-huh. This, uh, this letter is June, the year before. Uh, sweet puss, hip hip hooray. I shall be back by the weekend after all, so prepare a little super ant team and some extra kisses for your own Fredegins who simply cannot contain his impatience. <laughs> this is worse than the channel crossing. The next three are in the same style, but this one isn't so funny. I'll read it. Rather illegible. Dear Mabel, this, um, this is quite disastrous. Are you absolutely sure? There must be something you can do about it. If it costs money, I might scrape together 50. The point is, it must be stopped. Write soon and tell me you've arranged something. Much love, F. Yes, that's not a pretty letter. What's the date? About seven months before the birth certificate. Mm, fair enough. Can I see the next? This is a week later. My dear Mabel, I'm shocked and surprised... I must repudiate all responsibility. And so on. I, I think you will agree it will be undesirable for us to meet again sincerely, F.B. So this one. The next is the spoiled one. I'll read it. It's in another hand and no year or address. How like a woman. My dearest boy, these letters, the only ones I ever received from your father, whom I knew as Frederick Bainbridge will explain how you came to be born. Your father is elderly, successful, and childless. Is... Um, now a lot of it's gone. Um, a chance I found out from a newspaper photo who he really was. Is um, now, therefore, a very important... Oh, this is maddening. Your loving mother, Mabel Teal. I, I suppose there's no question of it being your, Bainbridge. Not the slightest. My inspector got the specimen of his handwriting, application for a gun license, exactly the same. Yes, well, I can see why you want to find your elusive Mr. Bainbridge. What a swine. Teal was making what might be called a collection, a, a shakedown, as the Americans say, I suppose. Yes, obviously. When did uh, Bainbridge leave Moxton? About a week ago, eight days, to be exact. Was he ever questioned when Teal failed to show up at the inn? Oh, Lord, yes, I questioned him myself. Living nearby, I went to see him with Inspector Vincent, whom I put on the disappearance of Teal. Mm -hmm. well, what was this Bainbridge like? Rather fine-looking chap. Oh, rising 60, I think. I got the impression he was a fellow who was used to having authority, rather, yes. rather truculent. How far has the chase gone? Well, we hadn't much to go on. The departure was sudden and, of course, unknown to my men. It was the day after Vincent and I had interviewed him. We traced him to Liverpool Street Station, but we got no further than that. No photographs in the house? No, none. Well, uh, if you can catch him, we've got the complete legal staff to put him on the gibbet right here in this club. Everybody in the hanging game but the public executioner. I think we'd better have another drink before we eat, what? Oh, Judge, uh, 
This is uh, Colonel Archer. He's trying to drum up some business for you. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, I am, as you see, in the inevitable bewilderment of trying to find a train in the timetable. Never a happy experience. Uh, I believe we've met before. Really? I don't remember. Oh, oh of course, yes, sir. Uh, it was at Moxton. You're in the police, are you not? Uh, you came to see me about the disappearance of this poor vagrant, uh, his name... Uh, Teal. Ah, yes, yes, Teal. Rather an unfortunate turn to the case, I see. I can understand the Colonel's confusion, Sidney, for he met me at my Norfolk house under the name of Bainbridge, a name which I used to ensure privacy during my leisure time. Good God. May I complete Sir George's introduction, Colonel? I'm Sir Francis Britton, one of His Majesty's High Court judges. I'm glad you've admitted your identity as Frederick Bainbridge. Uh, Sir Francis, well, this is very unpleasant for me, but uh, I must ask you to accompany me to Scotland Yard for questioning. On what matter, Colonel? On the matter of the death of John Teal. I believe I've given you all the information I can on that matter, Colonel Archer. Circumstances have altered since I last saw you. We now know the man is dead. Do you intend to charge me with homicide? That will depend on your answers to certain questions. Of course, I realize my position is an equivocal one. Uh, one pays dearly for the privilege of privacy, doesn't one? But at this stage, I prefer to say nothing... May I consult my solicitor, Sir Ronald Pond, who is now in the dining room? Certainly. Perhaps Colonel Archer would like to keep me in sight. Would you be kind enough to fetch Pond from the dining room, Sidney? Oh, very well. Oh, Pond, can you come in here? This room, must please? embarrass you considerably, Colonel. It's unfortunate that we continue to meet under such tiresome circumstances. Well, what is it? Did you want me? Oh, uh, Pond, I... I apologize for disturbing you at lunch. Uh, this gentleman is Colonel Archer, who is Chief of the Norfolk Constabulary. How do you do? How do you do? He wishes to question me in the matter of the death of one John Teal. What? Oh, my dear Pond, please curb your amazement. I, I quite share it. I'd like to talk to you privately, perhaps in the guest room. I'm sure Sir Ronald will be responsible for my return, Colonel. Come along, Pond. But what on earth is all this about, Francis? Well, I'm damned. I always knew that old goat was a wrong one. Well, you know your law and police standards, aren't you? You've uh, got enough on him to charge him. About as clear a case as could be for the murder of John Teal. That from you is convincing. I wonder what's being concocted in the guest room. Pond's about the most slippery lawyer in this country. Excuse me, Sir George. Colonel Archer is wanted on the phone. Inspector Vincent. I put him through here. Oh, thank you, Roberts. Uh, I'll take it there, Archer. Thank you. Hello. Colonel Archer here. Yes, Vincent? Yes. Yes, I see. Definitely not hot. I see, yes. Well, stay there, Vincent. I'll phone you in a few minutes. Vincent at Scotland Yard. The postmortem shows that Teal died of cyanide poisoning. That's complete, I should say. Yes, complete. I, uh, I'll lay you five to one you can't hold Britain. I wouldn't like that. I'm certain that Pond is at this moment telephoning to the Home Office to get this thing hushed up. That pusillanimous ass Gilbert West is having the bee put on him, as sure as God made little apples. Sidney, I was brought up on the dogma that the law is no respecter of persons. I know it doesn't always work that way, but it has wherever I've had any authority. The idea of a damned high court judge getting away with a murder for which a lesser man would hang doesn't appeal to me. But if the powers that be want it, a thick cloud can come down from above and cover up this pretty dirty affair. I wouldn't like that. Not one little bit. There's another call for Colonel Archer, sir. Uh, thank you, Roberts. Thank you. Colonel Archer here. Yes, Commissioner? What? Do nothing? Well, this is my case, and I'm going ahead. Well, I'm damned. You had the post-mortem report. Very good, General, but I do this under protest. The Home Secretary has instructed the police to do nothing in the matter of Britain's arrest until further investigations can be carried out. 
On no account is he to be taken to Scotland Yard. Well, Pond worked fast and the Home Secretary played true to form. Archer, would, uh, would you like to see their game spoiled without prejudice to your position? Indeed I would. There's a way it can be done. Will you excuse me while I make a phone call? Certainly. And uh, as it's going to Lord Bradenham of the Daily Globe, I think I'd better make it from outside. Too many damn lawyers here, what? I'll see you at the Garrick in half an hour. Right. For a policeman's taste, there are always too many lawyers. Anywhere. Oh, Colonel Archer. Ah, oh, hello, Pond. I think, if you've not already had them, you will shortly receive instructions from Scotland Yard regarding your conduct of the Teal matter. I know, Pond. I've been instructed to drop our investigations in the Teal case as far as Frederick Bainbridge is concerned. I need hardly say that I can't imagine what odd combination of circumstances has led you to follow your strange course, Colonel. I told you at our last meeting all I knew of the man Teal and his disappearance. Of course, I sympathize with you in your disappointment. But I have an idea that you will not find the case of poor Teal as triumphantly simple as you had supposed. Probably not, sir. I won't apologize to you for I've acted in good faith. Not a quality which my profession meets with too often. Good afternoon. Damned impudence. I'm not in the habit of accepting remarks like that from confounded police officials. I've a good mind... I think you had best remain quiet about this, Francis. We've dodged a rather ugly situation rather neatly, I think. Damnation, Pond, what do you mean? You talk as if there was a case against us. Now, steady, Francis. I realise that you're innocent in this affair, but granted that you are Bainbridge, there is a case against you. How strong, we don't know. Uh, West will be here in a couple of minutes from the Home Office. Before he comes, I must be clear about one thing. When the report came out that the body had been found, why didn't you go to the police? You knew about it from our conversation before lunch. Such an action would have made your position quite secure. Well, I... I'd already told Archer all I knew. And I was certain that my identity as Bainbridge could not be traced to me as Britain. I couldn't have foreseen this confounded encounter with Archer. Yes, I see. Where were you after you left Moxton? At home in London. Oh, it may have been an error of judgment to leave, but such mistakes aren't of necessity evidence of guilt. They have sometimes been so interpreted from the bench, Francis. Confound it, Pond. I'm not on trial. We'll try to see to it that you won't be. Tell me, Pond, uh, how far is West prepared to go in withholding the police from further action against me? I don't know. As I told you, his instant reaction was to stop immediate investigation. Of course, he knew nothing of the police case when I spoke to him. Nor do we. Pond, I've made two grave mistakes. Uh, to leave Moxton was a blunder. But when I did so, the matter was merely an unexplained disappearance of a vagrant. And you can see that police curiosity would perhaps have exposed this... this double life of mine. Innocent as it was. Exactly. But my second mistake was worse. When Archer recognized me here, uh, before I sent for you, he asked me to go with him to Scotland Yard for questioning. And I asked him then if he were charging me with the homicide of Teal. I see. That was unfortunate. But it's inadmissible, for you'd not been charged or warned. Quite, but I, I don't like it. Mine was a natural question. We, uh, you and I, had been discussing the case, you remember. And the circumstances seemed I shouldn't to... worry about that. You said that Archer had talked to you some days after the man had disappeared. What had you told him, then? Oh, merely a brief account of Teal's visit to me. That he was a man who'd done me a service some years ago and that I'd helped him financially in small ways several times. I described him as extremely overwrought at the time and uh, I think I mentioned the possibility of suicide being in his mind. You're sure you said that? Yes, uh, I'm fairly certain that I said that. Of course, I knew nothing of the circumstances of his life and said that to Archer, too. But you made the suggestion that the man might be dead? Yes, I did. I see. Good morning, Britain. Mm. Pond? Ah, uh, West. Yes, sir. I'm glad you both waited here. I didn't want you to come to the home office, Britain, in the circumstances. <sighs> what a damn ridiculous situation this is. I've talked to General Fellows of the CID since you rang me, Pond. I may say he's as embarrassed as I am. 
Well, fortunately, only one or two Scotland Yard people, uh, and Archer, of course, know of your identity as Bainbridge, um, Britain. In view of all the circumstances, I uh, think I can say the case will not be pressed at this time. You're holding off, Major? Yes, uh, uh, there's no question that the police have a sort of case against you, uh, Bainbridge. I don't like that, Wes. What is the case, Major? Well, the main points are that the man died of cyanide poisoning. What's that poison? The Home Office analysis report came in this morning, and uh, some letters were found on the body. What which letters? Were... But they couldn't have Yes, been... a packet of letters were found sewn up in the man's coat, which, uh, if genuine, could point to a blackmail attempt against Bainbridge. Um, that implies a possible motive on the part of Bainbridge to get rid of the fellow. That's not the whole case, of course. No, no, there are other cumulative facts. Not a strong case, I'd say. Hmm? Well, no, no, it would seem not. After all, the case may turn out to be a suicide and the uh, letters may be forgeries. In which case it would be appalling to subject the judge to the humiliation of clearing himself. And what of the inquest? On no account must you appear. Mm. Yeah, yes, I'm quite certain we're doing the right thing. I see no reason on God's earth to drag you through the mud of defending yourself, and the scandal to the bench must be avoided. Right. right. Oh, I say, excuse me, you fellows. Uh, have you seen this in the Globe Stop Press? What is it, Lamprey? The missing man Bainbridge in the body in the well case has been identified as Sir Francis Britton, the High Court Judge. Good God. In the name of heaven, how did they get hold of that? There must have been some leakage. It's Sidney's doing. He was here when Archer recognised me. Sidney gave this to the press? Well, what a dastardly thing. But what is Bradenham about to print it? Why the blazes can't these press fellows mind their own business? It, it, it takes the matter right out of my hands. I'm sorry, Britain. I'm deeply sorry. I, I, I would have done anything in my power. You mean the case is open? I'm afraid with this publicity there'll be no holding the police. But surely, Major... I'm you. sorry, but there it is. But it's impossible. Pardon, please. You seem to forget. I have faith in the law. I put my trust in the law of England. Hanging judge on murder charge. Hanging judge on murder charge. Thank you, sir. Hanging judge on murder charge. I need not remind the counsel of your experience, Mr. Nottingham, that members of the jury will be greatly assisted in their task if you can find your questions as to what is relevant. I thank your logic. I shall endeavour to be concise. Sir Francis, you admit authorship of the letters addressed to Mabel Teal, which the court has heard read? I admit it. Do you not consider them to be a particularly blackguardly piece of work? I express no opinion. Then we leave that to the jury to decide. <clears throat> you were known at Moxton as Mr. Frederick Bainbridge? Yes. As far as your life there was concerned, you took great pains to conceal your true identity. That is so. Why did you do this? As a person whose name was fairly well known to the public, I, I wished to evade public interest. And particularly the attention of neighbours who, if they knew who I was, might intrude on the privacy which was the object of my retreat. The object was not to lead a loose sort of life which, if you were known to be one of His Majesty's judges, would result in a nationwide scandal and possibly very unpleasant consequences to yourself. Oh, really, my lord, I must protest against my very friend's question. Is it necessary for my friend to indulge in these gratuitous interruptions, my love? I find the question quite admissible, Mr. Lamprey. I submit to your lordship, of course. <clears throat> Do you wish me to repeat the question, Sir Francis? The suggestion is insulting and entirely untrue. The object was simply to avoid the annoying publicity that inevitably follows a prominent man. Yes. You were known to Mabel Teal as Frederick Bainbridge, were you not? Yes. Would you describe yourself as a prominent man at that stage in your career? Hardly. What then was the object of your alias at that time? The motive was... was fundamentally the same, I... 
I wish to keep my public and private life in separate compartments. I, I adopted the name of Frederick Bainbridge for my private life. For a private life which would not bear a close scrutiny. I would do not admit that. Is it not true that you have periodically been leading a Jekyll and Hyde existence? The Hyde being represented by Mr. Frederick Bainbridge? I do not admit that. <clears throat> have you ever done any amateur photography, Sir Francis? No. Or gold or silver electroplating? No. You are aware that in these processes, and in photography, potassium cyanide is employed. I have heard so. You had no legitimate reason for having a supply of cyanide in your house? At no time? reason at all. Yet cyanide crystals were found on the rug in your living room. So we have been told. Are you suggesting that Inspector Vincent is a perjurer? I make no suggestion. I only say that, to the best of my knowledge, there was no potassium cyanide in the house while I was living there. <clears throat> Turning now to the events on the night of Teal's death, is it true that just before Teal's arrival at the house, you told the witness Mary Reddish that you were suffering from a migraine? That is so. And that in her presence you emptied into a glass of brandy what the witness described as a whitish powder contained in a paper packet. I did. What was that powder, Sir Francis? It was a headache powder. You were in the habit of using these powders to relieve migraine? I've used them for many years. How do you account for the fact that in your medicine chest there were found no powders answering to this description? Quite simply. The powder in question was the last one. There were none left. Quite so. The powder in question was the only one? The last one. While you were emptying the powder into the glass of brandy, is it true that Mary Reddish called your attention to the fact that some of the powder was spilling onto the rug? Possibly. I, I have no recollection of it. You agree it is possible that you did spill a quantity of this powder on the rug? Of course it is possible. I, I just don't remember doing so. And you cannot account for the presence on the rug of cyanide crystals? I've already said that I cannot. I put it to you, Sir Francis, that you can account for it. That the so-called headache powder was in fact a quantity of potassium cyanide. That you used it to prepare a fatal drink which you gave to your visitor. I did no such thing. That he collapsed almost immediately and that you dragged his body out into the garden and flung it into the well. Untrue and absurd. The whole suggestion is fantastic. <clears throat> Earlier in cross-examination, you denied that you were expecting Teal to visit you at Moxton. Yes. Subsequently, the jury heard William Roberts testify that three days before Teal met his death, he, Roberts, overheard part of an interview which took place at the Adelphi Club in London between yourself and a man calling himself by the name of Teal. I put it to you that you concealed this interview from the jury because you wished them to believe that the Moxton meeting was not prearranged, and that therefore you did not have the opportunity of planning to take Teal's life. I did not take his life. Why did you curtail your holiday, Sir Francis? To avoid questions rising out of Teal's disappearance that might lead to a disclosure of my identity. You realized, did you not, that the body would inevitably be found sooner or later? That Mr. Bainbridge would then come under suspicion, and that it was necessary for Sir Francis to make a clean break from his alias while there was yet time. There was no question of suspicion. Allowing only a decent interval to elapse after Teal's disappearance so that you should not be immediately associated with it. That, to an extent, is true. Though, as I've already told you, the motive was not the one that you impute to me. You heard, no doubt, Colonel Archer testify to your having given him a very different account of the relationship between yourself and John Teal. His evidence is true on that point. My account was a false one, given for the obvious reason that I did not wish to reveal my connection with Teal. You repeated that account at the inquest on Teal? I did. You perjured yourself? Yes. That is the case for the Crown, my love. <coughs> You will wish to re-examine Mr. Lamprey? No, thank you, my lord. I hardly think that with the time remaining to us, I shall therefore adjourn until tomorrow.
Lord Grand, I'm tired. Thank God the crown is finished. What would you think Britain has on his mind to send for us? Mm -hmm. We'll know soon enough. Here he is. Owen. Good evening. Evening, sir. Good evening, Francis. Well, Francis, that's all they have to say, and I don't think we've done too badly. No, by Joe, no. A lot of circumstantial stuff and a mountain of improbability. I think you've had the worst of it. Don't you? lie to me, Lamprey. It's an appallingly strong case against me, and the turns have not been in my favour. Sit down, Francis. It's your time to dine, isn't it? I'm sorry to disturb you like this. Quite all right. Everything has gone soundly against me. And the crown will grind me to pieces with those letters. Then why didn't you let us fight them? We had a handwriting expert. Because the truth is that I did write them. My doubt is Parkinson will let him go too far on that tack. Parkinson is on our side. Parkinson but... is a good judge. And he will allow the crown to use the letters to the full. I would. No. My only defense must be the truth. Now remember that, Lamprey. Teal committed suicide. Mm, yes. Yes, that's a defense theory, but hypothetical solution... It is not the... hypothetical. No, it is not. Teal did not leave the house alive. I saw him die. You? What? You don't know what you're saying. He had two seizures. Attacks of violent pain. During the first, he took a tablet or a capsule from his left-hand pocket, which seemed to relieve him. He, he explained that he suffered from angina pectoris. A second seizure came, more severe. He was helpless. He asked me to administer another capsule. I did so. He made me take it from his right-hand pocket and, and place it in his mouth. He planned it all. That was the poison. He snatched the brandy and drank it. He was dead in a few moments. Good God. Why haven't you told us this? You told us that he walked out of your house quietly. I know I did. I told that to the police and I so testified at the inquest. I perjured myself again. But, good God, where are we now? If... What happened after he died? I... I thought what to do for a long time. First, I wanted to phone the police, but... I thought. I didn't do that. I examined the body, made sure he was dead, and then I took the letters he had shown me and burned them. And then, long afterwards... I dragged the body out to the well and dropped it in. You didn't find the wallet with the letter? No, I thought those I read and destroyed were the real and the only ones that he had. Why didn't you tell the police? Yes, great heaven, why didn't you? Why didn't I? Can't you see? I can. You think it's incredible that a man such as I, Britain, a judge, should have done this mad thing? I've persuaded juries to send men to the gallows for such acts. Brutish and deliberate, I've called it. It is difficult to believe that an innocent man could have disposed of the girl's body in such a callous, brutish way. Yes. He was a young man. The jury believed me. They always did. I could have told them what panic does to men. I knew what it does. Panic made me write a letter once to urge a girl to have an abortion. You heard it read in court. Panic isn't a sudden horror. Not always. It can be a creeping thing. I wrote that letter over and over again. I watched Teal's body most of the night. I dropped it in the well at four in the morning. Sometimes I, I had the telephone receiver in my hand. But, but gradually, 
It became too late to telephone. Oh, you may not believe or understand me. Fear gave place to reason. I was Frederick Bainbridge as I stared at that body. It was Bainbridge who was in danger, not Britain. Slowly, I reasoned that if I told the police, it would be certain that Britain would be involved. Whatever mistakes I made as Bainbridge... I could still flee to the safety of my own name. That is why I followed the course of the cheap killer. I believed it. But why did you remain there at Marksman for ten days long? The longer I could delay direct suspicion of Bainbridge, the better. But, but after Archer's visit, I, I thought it best for Bainbridge to vanish. Francis, you must know that this revelation throws our whole defense out the window. It's the truth. Now it's only the truth. What in God's name is my course now? You know this means your humiliation and professional ruin, Francis. I've already accepted both, in full measure. I've abandoned my career and my honor. I'm fighting now only to save my neck. I'm quite aware, sir. So is Pond, of the gravity of this case. But, but I can't fight it when the ground is, is blown from under my feet. I would like to know why you waited until this moment to tell us of this fact. Ah. <sighs> How many times I've asked that question. Asked it of a quivering wretch like myself. It's a stupid question and unanswerable. Oh, I, I Francis, can't. why do you tell us this now? Coming at this point, you know it must go against you. Why don't you let... My it? only hope is to prove that Teal died by his own intention and I saw him die. Pond, I, I don't know what to do. I have to admit perjury... And I have an admission that Britain saw him die. Not only that, he saw Teal drink the brandy with the powder. And the crown has made a mighty play to suggest the powder was cyanide. But now I have to admit that he administered a capsule just before death. But I didn't know what the capsule was. And what I say now is the truth. I don't believe the truth can ever convict an innocent man in this country under the law of England. Hello, Nottingham. Hmm? Oh, there you are. I've waited for you over an hour, Sydney. I don't know what you want with me, but I hope it's not some of your back door nonsense. By no means, old chap. I'm deadly serious. That's only natural. I've seen four days of this trial. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I haven't. It's the wrong side of the fence for you, the crown, isn't it? Queer experience yesterday watching you flatten Britain. A pitiable object he was. Sydney, what is the reason for this meeting? To put to you a leading question, old boy. Is it possible that Britain's latest fantasy disturbed you as it did me and perhaps old Parkinson? You mean, do I believe Britain's new story of the suicide, seeing Teal die? You think I used the right word? Fantasy? The right word? Yes, of course I don't believe it. Well, I can't forget Britain yesterday and that preposterous story, which I, for one, believe. Good God. You believed Britain? I did. What guilty man could make up that fairy tale? I put the capsule in his mouth. That was the poison I did not know. Those were his words, Nottingham, and he had to admit perjury to say them. Perjury. The lawyer's mortal sin. But he had motive, adequate motive and opportunity. There's no adequate motive for murder, Nottingham. I've heard that from you. Yes, I believed him. He stuck to it while you ground him to pieces. I'm not asking you what you thought. Perhaps I know, but... Damn nation, Sydney. No man like Britain would be a panic-stricken fool. Quoting Mr. Justice Britain makes you feel more secure, old boy. Uneasy lies the head that's for the crown, eh? Not him. If you found that one of your witnesses knew something vital to the case, which had not yet come out in evidence, what would you do? Recall him tomorrow and produce the testimony. Regardless of the fact that what comes out might work for the defense... I'm an officer of the court. I can withhold nothing, no matter what the result. If you, if you hadn't said that, I'd have gone to Parkinson. But I knew you would. Lamprey and Pond would run away from it. I, uh, I know how the cyanide crystals got on the rug. What? How? Wait a minute. Mary? Come in, will you? Mary? Who is it? Mary Reddish. You're mad, Sidney, tampering with a witness. What does she know? Yes, sir. Now, Mary, I, I want you to answer the questions I ask you, just as you did when we met at Moxton. Now, trust me, you do, don't you? Yes, sir. Right now, tell Mr. Nottingham what you told me. 
How did the cyanide crystals get on the rug? They spilled when I was cleaning the mug. What mug? The big silver mug which Freddie... Uh, Sir Francis asked me to clean while he was away. And what did you clean it with? Some stuff in a bottle that I got from Mr. Murchison, the jeweller. And uh, what did he tell you about it? He said it'll shine horseshoes, but don't give it to the cat. And uh, what did he say was in the bottle when you went back yesterday and asked him? He said it was a solution of one in eight cyanide of... Um... Potassium? Yes, sir. Did you tell him why you wanted the cleaner? Yes, to clean the silver mug. And who it was for? I said it was for me. Why? Because, well, they don't like it. Me being with Mr. Bainbridge. What did you do with the bottle afterwards? It was empty and I threw it on the rubbish heap. Oh, your witness, Nottingham. But why didn't you tell this to us before? I didn't know what was in the bottle. I didn't think it was important. Then I got to thinking and... I remembered about the cat. Oh, sir, this might be bad for him. Everything I've said so far has been bad for now, him. Now, now, Miss Reddish, you may have saved Sir Francis. You've certainly done him no harm. Now, go along and wait in my car. Go along, there's a good girl. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I've got a job to do, Sydney, and I'm out for a conviction. <laughs> so speaks a lawyer with a heart. Would cyanide in solution leave traces when it evaporated a month or so later? Too bad for the car, Nottingham, it would. I'm not a director of United Chemicals for nothing. I got our chief analyst to tell me that it would, and there's evidence that the solution was used on the cup. Good God, it may get him off. But it could mean proof of possession of the poison. If the jury believe her, then Britain's acquitted. But if they don't, and she's about as tarnished as the mug you talk about, then Britain will hang, and perhaps she will too. I can only bring out her story in direct examination. Lamprey will leave her alone, of course, and that evidence is better for Britain coming from the prosecution, you clever swine. I'll call this jeweller. Uh, what's his name? Murchison. He's in my car, too. If I'd been in Moxton much longer, I'd have needed a bus. Damn lawyers can't find your own evidence. I have read to you from my notes the testimony as to the date of purchase of the fluid by the witness Reddish. Members of the jury, in your deliberations, you have arrived at a point of perplexity among yourselves. It is understandable, yes, quite understandable, in view of the additional testimony of this witness. I direct you to place no importance whatsoever upon the recalling of Reddish by the prosecution rather than by the defense. I remind you that under English law, the prosecution is mindful that all facts shall be presented to the jury, not only the facts that are adverse to the defense. That will clear for you the confusion caused by the late admission of this testimony. As to its value, I do most earnestly direct you that if you believe this witness, Mary Reddish, there can be reasonable doubt, I repeat, reasonable doubt, as to the guilt of the accused. Now you will again retire and consider your verdict. Our job, Bowman, and it's a hard one, is to decide on the facts we've been given if we think the prisoner is guilty or not. <coughs> but the judge said, beyond reasonable doubt. And that's what I have. A reasonable doubt. Well, we've made up our minds, eleven of us. All but you. The judge believes, Mary Reddish. It's our verdict we're handing in, not the judge's. How can you believe the word of a girl like that? If you don't go along with us, all this trial goes for nothing. You can't hold out any longer, Bowman. We've been at it over three hours now. But if I agree with all of you, then we are hanging him. 
and I'm not sure. How long are we going to wait to do our duty? Uh, Every fact's against this man. I don't care what the judge says. Britain's have plenty of poor blokes in the dock himself and never turned a hair. Uh, uh, Eleven of us believe in a guilty verdict in spite uh, of the judge. You all hate Britain, that's why. That's not true. Of course not. The man's had a fair trial and the facts are against him. Hello? Yes? It's just striking midnight. I'm at the Adelphi Club and I'm leaving for knowledge now. I'll be at the jail two hours before the time, about seven. No, no, nothing. I'm quite certain there won't be a stay. I was at the home office just an hour ago. Huh? Oh, has he? Yes. Yes, I understand. Very good, Condon. I'll see you at seven. Britain has just asked to see the governor again. Uh, well, you're off now, eh? Yes, I suppose so, Sidney. I'd rather drive tonight than try to sleep. Seemed on the point of rain when I came in here just now. A dreary drive out of town at the best of times, but... Well, in spite of your hospitality, Sydney, I'm not exactly at ease in this place. Good God, we... We got what we were after. Speak for yourself. I'm only a policeman. That's a simple job, but not a pleasant one now. Nine hours to go. Poor devil. Pond and Lamprey will probably be along any minute. They won't have accomplished much with the Home Secretary. Oh, I... I thought you had gone home, Nottingham. I've been up in the library. Evening, Arthur. Evening, I just called in to see Sydney. It's nicer to meet you here than Norwich. Oh, Lord, I ought to go to bed, but even this hole is preferable. I uh, suppose they'll give him sedatives or something to see him through. Oh, yes, yes. The governor was with him two hours ago, Nottingham. He's about the same. Have you seen him? Yes, this morning. Condon took me to have a look at him. Confidentially, the Home Office wanted some sort of layman's opinion about his condition. Pond's been trying to stay on mental grounds. A couple of alienists have seen him. What is his condition? Nothing to stop us going ahead. Yes, Nottingham, you wanted a conviction and you got it. And you made it stick. Oh, damn you, Sidney, I've had enough of your knight in armour. Your words, old man, delivered right here. Ah, and here comes the defence. What has the defence accomplished, Lamprey, apart from failing to impress... Twelve of the usual clubs. There's nothing on God's green earth that we or you can do now, and we may as well admit it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the end is only hours away. Oh, Mr. Lamprey, your mm. clerk is waiting for you in the guest room. He's been there since eight o'clock. Thank you, Roberts. I'll see him. Well, my conscience is clear. I've done everything I could. I think we can both rest easy on that score. Go oh, hell take you and your damn consciences! What lawyer ever had one? I'm sorry to intrude, Mr. Lamprey. But I've been waiting for you some time, and I believe this letter may be of importance. Quite right, Hudson. It was delivered to your chambers about six o'clock. An old woman brought it. Said it had to be delivered to you tonight, and I believed her. She was quite willing to give me her address. Thank you, Hudson. Now, do you mind waiting in the guest room? Yes, sir. I apologise for intruding, gentlemen. Britain's being a judge has been against him all along. Any bricklayer or butcher would have had a better chance. Britain's being damned unpopular has fixed him. Well, there's no petition to worry about this time. Let's face it, if we got a reprieve from him, there would have been an outcry. And I'm the fellow who believed he was innocent when the chips were down, which is probably more than you birds can say. That's below the belt. All I know is we did our best for our client. A jury thought Britain murdered Teal. Three judges of appeal thought he was fairly tried. And the public thought so, too. As for me, I... Oh, I don't know. He's to be hanged at nine o'clock. <laughs> As I thought, another crank letter. I had dozens of them. Threatening you if you got Britain off, I imagine. Yes, most of them. Oh, but this one is... This one is for the defence. Listen to this. The defence counsel of Sir Francis Britain, whoever you may be, you will be right in your defence. The suicide theory is correct. Fine time for encouragement. But as you won't believe in it yourself, you will fail. Britain will panic. For God's sake, tear the damn thing up. No, no, go on. 
Lies are easy at first, and bodies can be hidden. And Britain will only tell the truth when it is too late, and even the truth becomes a lie. The truth that John Teal swallowed poison before Britain's eyes. My God, don't waste time with that gibberish. Give it to me. Oh, I agree with you, Pond. If we listen to every damn crank who wanted to interfere... That letter didn't sound like a crank. Archer, yes. come here. Finish this letter. You notice the signature? I'm going to telephone. John Teal. Yeah, Good Frank. God. That letter's before the fact. This envelope's been through the post. It's marked August the 3rd, Moxford. Oh, not so fast. It's probably a fake. How can we verify it? There's enough for a stake. Of course there is. Yes. Good God. Here's a set of fingerprints inside. And a postscript. My fingerprints are to be found in the files of the Harden Mental Home in Lancashire under the name of John Leet. Hello, Trunks. Who are you calling? Oh, get me in the jail. This is a police emergency. We should ring the home office. Hell, take the home office. I'm saving him from a night's agony. No, I tell you, clear this line. The Home Secretary is the only person who can stop this. Hello. Is that Norwich Jail? I'm Sir George Sidney. I want to speak to the Governor. Tell him it's urgent. Oh, I get him. If this is a fake, Sidney, it's the cruelest thing you can do. Of course it's not a fake. And I'm the one who nearly put him on the gibbet. My God. Teal thought of everything. If Britain was convicted, this letter was not to be delivered until the eve of the execution. It's the most fiendish thing I've ever seen. Hello? Are you the governor? Oh, just a minute. I I'll put Colonel Archer on. Hello? Condon? This is Archer. We've just received a letter which I believe genuine and which proves Britain's innocence. Ye yes, I, I know it's a matter for the Home Secretary. We're getting him, but whatever happens, hold off. Wh what? You can't mean it. What is it? Go what? Britain has just signed a confession. What? What? Well, hold off till you hear from the home office. The prisoner of Britain, sir. Oh, come in, Sir Francis. All right, Blake, and close the door. Sit down, Sir Francis. Britain, your torture's over. Wait, Sidney. Why has there been a stay, sir? Why have you sent for me? You have my confession. There was only one reason to leave my cell. That was to be the end. That time was yesterday. We have good news for you. This case is closed. Just the end remains. The law does not torture. There should be no delay. Don't you see your friends, your solicitor and Sir George Sidney have come to tell you themselves? Francis... The wrong has been righted. You're free. No. It must be finished. I have had judgment. Francis, you don't seem to understand. A letter was delivered to us yesterday, in time, thank God, written by the dead man, Teal, in which he states his intention of killing himself in your presence. Your pardon, Britain. A free pardon. No. A pardon. I can't bear that. That means the law was wrong. Great God, you must believe us. I do believe you. That is my horror. It was suicide, just as you said, Britain. He didn't want to kill you. He wanted to torture you up to the moment of death. He was a callous, ruthless, cruel fiend. He was my son. And he has won. He planned it. That I should betray everything I believed. By panic. Lies, treachery, be fairly tried, rightly condemned, and yet live on. I sign my confession, one final lie. That would have been my secret. It would have set the pattern right. But and now I am condemned to live. And my living makes a mockery of the faith I held. An innocent man's been saved from the gallows. Isn't that justice? Better an innocent man should die than that the law be made a fake. I wish that I were dead. May I go, sir, please?
That was Hanging Judge, a play by Raymond Massey based on a novel by Bruce Hamilton, adapted for broadcasting by John Richmond. Sir Francis Bittenden was played by Boris Karloff, Sir George Sidney by Hugh Manning, Keith Nottingham by Duncan McIntyre, Miles Lamprey by Harrison Culf, Sir Ronald Pond by Robert Webber, Colonel George Archer by Richard Williams, Major Gilbert West by Norman Claridge, John Teal by T. St. John Barry, Mary Reddish by Gabriel Blunt, Roberts by Richard Hutton. Other parts were played by Geoffrey Bond, John Casabon, Brian Hayes, Peter Hoare, Arthur Lawrence, Stanley Mackenzie and Tony Quinn. The recorded production was by Cleland Finn. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Bela Lugosi, playing the part of Professor Antonio Basile, psychologist. The story is by J. Donald Wilson, who calls it The Doctor Prescribed Death. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. This series of tales is calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the doctor prescribed death and Bela Lugosi's performance. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but let him tell you about it. As a psychologist, I have worked out a theory. A theory I know to be sound. I contend that a person who has decided to kill himself can very easily be turned from this desire to the desire of taking the life of another. I can prove my theory. And if necessary, that is exactly what I will do. Yes, Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but only a theory. And he's worried about what his publisher will say. So he visits the editor, whose name is Hellman. Hellman finishes the manuscript and tosses it on the desk. Professor Basile leans forward eagerly and... Well, Hellman, what do you think? Professor Basile, it's purely conjecture, simply a theory, and I wouldn't advise publishing it. I worked on that theory for a long time. I'm positive of it. I know it'll work. Suppose it will. What good is it? What good have you accomplished if you can prove it'll work? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Helen? It's so silly. An ordinary human being has suffered reverses. is sick of it all. He wants to leave it all behind. And you say he can be changed to want to kill someone else. I do. Self-destruction and the destruction of other life are closely related in the mind. The dividing line is very thin. It's ridiculous. And you won't publish it? Ranger would fire me. Why? He told me that, in his opinion, you should be in the asylum. Mr. Granger said that. Does he think I'm insane? <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> Herman, Mr. Granger didn't say that. It's you who thinks I'm crazy. You've never liked me. For some reason, you are trying to tear me down. Well, we'll see, Mr. Hellman. 
You see. Now, wait a minute. I'll show you whether my works are illogical. i show you whether I'm insane. Oh, calm down. <laughs> I'm going to make you eat those words. I know you don't like me, but I'm going to prove that my theory is sound. Good night. Wait a minute. Basil, wait. You wait, Herman. You wait. Yes, wait, Herman. Wait. Professor Basile, seething with resentment, rushes from the office and strides angrily down the street. Insane, huh? I'll prove my theory. I'll find a subject. I'll find someone who wants to take his own life. And so Basile goes home, late for dinner. He finds a note from his wife, Myra, saying she's decided to attend the opera and will be home around 11.30. Then Professor Basile gets an inspiration. He goes to the bridge over the deep canyon, the bridge called Suicide. And strangely enough, he hasn't long to wait. As he stands against the railing in the fog, a figure appears a few feet beyond, stops, prepares to leap. Don't do it! Wait a minute! Listen. Huh? That's very silly. Let go of me. Oh, no. I couldn't do that. I need you. I don't need you. Don't you know this is uh, against the law? You're not an officer. You can't stop me. It's 500 feet to those tracks below. Hard steel rails. And don't believe what they all tell you about not being conscious of what happened. You'd know. People don't die instantly. Let loose. They lie in agony for minutes and sometimes for an hour. It's a horrible death, I know. How do you know? I'm a doctor. Doctor? Yes. I can tell you much simpler ways, much less painful ways and quicker. You're a nice young girl, an intelligent girl. You wouldn't want it to happen this way. Maybe after I talk to you a while, you wouldn't want to do this at all. No. No. But come on. Let's talk it over. Maybe a few minutes' talk will change the entire picture for you. What could you do to help me? If you'll come, I'll tell you. There's a motive back of your wanting to do this, and I'd like to know what it is. Nothing doing. Haven't you any relatives? Any loved ones you'd like to do something for? Yes. Then if you'll talk with me for a while, maybe I can find my way clear to help those people. You sound crazy to me. Oh, no. All right, I'll... Where? My apartment. Let's go. Well, here we are. Come in, please. Well, what do you want to know? Now, sit down first. Are you hungry? No, I'm not that broke. It isn't poverty. I knew that. Why did you come here? Why? Why, because you talked me into it. I <laughs> see. You are not afraid of me? Afraid? In my frame of mind. What could I lose? Suppose I told you that I really brought you here to kill you. Kill me? <laughs> uh, you know, you're a very pretty girl, don't you? Yeah. That doesn't always mean so much. The right man, it might. That's what I thought. But I found out it didn't mean a thing. Ah. Then it was because of a man. I knew it. Really? How did you guess? I'm a student of psychology. I'm Professor Antonio Basile. I see. And you want to know what makes me tick. You want to know the reason behind my action tonight. That's right. I would like to know what happened to make you want to kill yourself. Suicide is a mental aberration. Yeah. I'd like to know what preceded the decision to destroy yourself. And what you thought about until the moment I stopped you on the bridge. What good will that do me? You said you weren't broke. But you also said you had some loved ones you'd like to do something for. I meant I wasn't broke to the point of being hungry. I have a few dollars. But you suggested help for someone in larger terms. Yes, I did. Who is the loved one? My mother. 
You are her only means of support? Yes. And you intend to kill yourself? Yes. That's being selfish, isn't it? Selfish? Yes. You are concentrating solely on self. You think so? What else? The first law of human nature is self-preservation, right? I suppose so. The second law is the preservation of family. Yeah. So you decide to deny the first law and destroy yourself. And as a consequence, deny the second and leave your mother alone and in need. You indicate a form of insanity. What would be normal? To destroy the other person. The one who has done you wrong. Have you hurt him? No. Then the one who has done wrong should be the one to suffer. You have no legal recourse? Legal recourse? No, I haven't. I'm sorry to say. And you would kill yourself to let your poor mother suffer because of the wrong of another. Why shouldn't he be the one to suffer? I suppose you're right. Why shouldn't he? What happened after all? Why not tell me about it? Were you married? No. I never seemed to find time to get a wrong marriage. What's your name? Gladys. Gladys Tanner. How long had you known him? Almost four years. And you always thought he meant to marry you? Yes. Until three weeks ago. Yes? On July 1st, he had to leave town for a week on business. He said he was going to Kansas City. When he came back, he seemed to be too busy to see me. Then a week ago, I found a snapshot along with several others in his desk in his home. May I see it? Certainly. It's a picture of him and another woman. But the picture was not taken in Kansas City. It was? No. It was taken on the beach at Atlantic City. And it's dated by the finisher, July 3rd. Since he returned, he's refused to see me. Yesterday, he finally said he didn't care to see me anymore. But I'd better forget him. But it isn't so easy as that, is it? No. I figured I'd done something. And blame myself. Do you... Uh, do you know this blonde woman in this uh, snapshot? No. Then it must be a woman uh, he has met uh, recently. You've known him for, for four years. I don't think you are to blame. He's the one in the wrong. And he should be made to suffer. How? You were going to kill yourself. Why should you? Kill him instead. He double-crossed you. He deserves it. Now, let me go a little deeper into the situation. Whenever a person has reached the conclusion to take his life... Sure, you have made up your mind, Miss Tanner. Positive. Now, if you're careful, you won't be caught. No. But whether you are or not, I'm giving you this check for a thousand dollars made out to cash to be sent to your mother only after the man is dead. Write his name on this pad. There you are. I will know what has happened by the newspapers. And I will be told payment until I learn that you have gone through with it. It'll happen tonight. Very well. You are sure? You are determined? Absolutely. Nothing could stop me. Very good. But just what would happen if I did get caught? You won't get caught if you follow my instructions. I know. Now, here is a small revolver. It'll fit easily in your purse. That's all you need. Be sure to wipe your fingerprints off and leave the gun near the body. Yeah. Well, goodbye, Dr. Basile. Goodbye, Gladys, and good luck. Professor Basile watches Gladys as she crosses the street to the dimly lighted bus stop. Then he rushes to his car and drives away. A few minutes later, he comes to a stop at Hellman's house. Hellman, the editor who ridiculed his theory. Just a minute. 
Oh. Hello, Vasil. Good evening, Herman. Thought I'd drop out to have a little chat with you. Well, why this time of night? It's kind of late, isn't it? Eleven. Didn't think that was late for you. No? Well, uh, come in. Thanks. Sit down. What's on your mind? I want to talk to you about my theory you ridicule so definitely. My theory about suicide. Oh. Well, I just don't believe it, that's all. And I said I'd prove it, didn't I? Yes, but what are you getting at? It's going to be proved. My theory is going to be proved tonight. Oh, that's fine. Go right ahead and prove it. I don't like you, Hellman. I never liked you. And I know you don't like me. I can't help that, Basile. What are you staring at? Is there someone here with you? Certainly not. Why? That's a woman's purse on the Davenport. Hmm? Oh, my secretary dropped by earlier this evening with the manuscript. She must have forgotten it. She's not here now? Of course not. Then I'll continue. I found a subject. A girl who was ready to commit suicide because a man jilted her. In a few hours, I was successful in changing her thoughts from suicide to homicide, and she is going to kill the man tonight. What do you think of that? There may be a dozen murders tonight. Ah, but you'll know which one I mean. You'll know about this murder. What do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you who the victim is going to be. You know who the intended victim is? Why don't you stop it? <laughs> but then I wouldn't have proved my theory. If you put this girl up to it, you're as guilty as she is. <laughs> you're insane, Basile, hopelessly insane. You think so, Emma? The whole idea is mad, too utterly ridiculous for words. <laughs> No sane man would ever think of such a useless, senseless idea. And for heaven's sake, stop laughing. I'm thinking about the victim. Then he learned. Who is the victim? Martin Harriman. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You will this time. Who is this girl? I know no girl who'd want to kill me. This one does. Now. Oh, nonsense. However, I wouldn't put a past you to hire someone to do something like this. No, no. This girl is no fake. This girl is serious, deadly serious. You probably hypnotized some poor woman, figuring she'd never remember what happened. Oh, Herman, you underestimate me. Maybe I do underestimate your evil mind. But believe Put me... Put up your hands, Herman. Get away from that desk. I'll just take care of that gun, Herman. That's better. Well, since when did you start carrying a gun, Basile? I a gun? Don't be silly. This isn't a gun in my pocket. It's just my pipe. See? <laughs> well, what do you hear, Herman? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes, you do. I heard it, too. The sound on the porch. I leave now. The back way. I put your gun in the kitchen. And I'll be very careful to remove all my... You insane fool. Oh, fancy you. You, Hellman, you are going to help prove my theory. <laughs> Good night, Hellman. The busy devil. I'll have him locked up before he gets across town. Good evening, Mr. Hellman. Huh? How did you get in here? Through the patio door. What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. Very strangely. <laughs> You're just imagining things. And what are you doing here? I wanted to tell you something. Yeah? What? When you first indicated to me that you were through with me, I was terribly hurt. I thought all along that we were to be married. I couldn't understand. I tried and tried to think of something I'd done to cause our breakup. Then I happened to find this snapshot in your desk. Snapshot? Take a look at it. Kansas City. No, Atlantic City, New Jersey. You and a blonde. And the date is stamped on the back. A business trip. Ha! Huh. Well, what about it? I just wanted you to know that you weren't so slick. I wanted you to know that I knew about the blonde... But I knew you'd lied. Now that you've told me, what good does it do you? A lot of good. First, I thought you came here for money. 
How could you think such a thing? Well, I think you'd better go now. <laughs> I'm going. Goodbye, Morton. And good luck in your new venture. What venture? This one. Gladys. Gladys! Wish me luck in mine. Gladys stands staring a moment at the body of Hellman, then wipes off the gun, drops it to the floor, takes the professor's check from her purse, steps to Hellman's desk and writes a note. Then she puts the note in an envelope with the check, addresses it, stamps it, turns out the lights, and steps out into the dark street. At the corner, she drops the envelope in the mailbox and disappears. Professor Basile heard the shots. His theory worked. Hellman will torment him no more. The perfect crime. So he can go home to his wife now and go to sleep. Myra. Myra. Huh? What? Oh, oh Antonio. What are you doing asleep on the Davenport? Do you know what time it is? It must be after midnight. I've been waiting for you. How was opera? Oh, fair. Nothing to brag about. Who sang the lead? Bill Chiotti. He wasn't very good. Bill Chiotti? Mm-hmm. He's a poor old fellow. A fellow? I thought they were uh, doing Ida tonight. No, they switched because someone was ill. Oh, they just as soon have stayed home. Have a night, Cup Myra? No, thanks. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed. I belong presently. Good night. Then the night passes and the morning comes. The professor rises cheerfully and prepares for breakfast. Then... I get it, Myra. Yes? Are you Professor Basile? Yes. May we come in? We'd like to talk with you. Of course. What is it you want? Is your wife in? Yes. We'd like to see her, too. Mr. Lawrence. Oh, I'm Lieutenant Davis. Right. Detective Davis. Well, what do you want? Will you call your wife? Why? Uh, suddenly. Myra! But what's this all about? What is it, Antonio? These men are from detective headquarters. They want to talk to us. Really? What about? May I ask where you were last night, Mrs. Basile? Certainly. I went to the opera. What time did you get home? Oh, I imagine it was around 11 or shortly after. Mm -hmm. Were you at home last evening, Professor? Well, I was at the club and got home about 12.30. By the way, uh, do you know a Morton Hellman? Certainly. What about him? He's been murdered. Murdered? Good Lord. When? Around midnight last night. I found him this morning. How terrible. Why... I've known him for years. He was editor-in-chief of the company publishing my writings. I'm a psychologist, you know. Yes, I know. But uh, what do you want to know from us? We weren't connected socially with Hellman. Uh, just in business. Did uh, you know him, Mrs. Basile? Yes, yes, I knew him very slightly. Did either of you know of anyone who'd have reason to kill him? Uh, certainly not. Everyone thought highly of him. Did you ever hear of a girl named Gladys Tanner? Gladys Tanner? No. Did you know of a Gladys Tanner, Mrs. Basile? No. Is this your purse, Mrs. Basile? Why, of course it is. That's the one I gave you last Christmas, Myra. Well, yes. I must have lost it downtown. Where did you find it, Lieutenant? At Hellman's home. Hellman's home? Well, how in the world... Good heavens, but We how... found it on the sofa. Well, I can't imagine how it could get there. And this is the revolver that killed Hellman, found on the floor beside him. What? No fingerprints on it, however. What? what... May I see it? Hi, Myra, this is your gun. I bought this for you two years ago when I went on the lecture tour. Yes, I think it's mine, but it just doesn't make sense. Did you have the gun in your purse when you lost it last time? Well, I, perhaps I did. I, I'm so confused now, I can't remember. I think, Myra, I think it is, it is terrible. Oh, I know. Oh, dear, I feel ill. Did you ever fire this gun? Yes, once last year up in the mountains. I wanted to see how it worked. Ever reload it? No, I've never reloaded it. I, I just didn't think about it. Maybe I did put it in my purse. Why, I don't know. And, and whoever found the purse may have used the gun to... Oh, it just 
can't seem to see. This it. gun misfired on the first two shots. The other three killed Hellman. This is the most amazing piece of coincidence I ever heard of. Why would my wife want to do such a thing? Why should she get to Hellman? She hardly knew him. Are you sure about that, Professor? Of course. Well, sorry to say that I don't believe her. What? This is ridiculous. This is going to be a shock to you, Professor, but here's a snapshot we found on Hellman's desk. Taken in Atlantic City last July. Good heavens. Why, this is you, my... You and Hellman. You were at your mother's in Florida in July. <laughs> Myra, look at me. What does this mean? I can't. I can't. And I can't believe such a thing. May I have the purse, the gun, and the photo? Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take her down to headquarters. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I wouldn't. I loved him. <laughs> Myra. You better pull yourself together. You'll have to go back. You'll want photos and fingerprints. Yes. You better get it ready, Myra. <laughs> Certainly looks bad for her. Great it does. Looks like an open and shut case. Oh, uh, will you come along too, Professor? Certainly. And so it all worked out beautifully. Not quite as the professor had planned. But then he changed his plan from the moment when Gladys Tanner showed him the snapshot taken in Atlantic City. And he realized that the girl's fiancé was Hellman and that the blonde was Myra, his wife. He had no intention of allowing Gladys Tanner to kill Hellman until he saw that snapshot. And when he recognized Myra's purse in Hellman's home... He decided to let Gladys kill him and the blame be placed on Myra. The perfect crime. But several hours later, after fingerprints and many questions, the professor is just about to be dismissed when Sergeant Rankin steps into the room and speaks quietly to Lieutenant Davis. What is it, Rankin? I stayed at the seal's place, as you said. Well? A few minutes ago, a special delivery letter came for the professor. This will knock your eye out. Read it. All right. Well, this fits perfectly with the writing we were trying to make out on Helm's desk letter. Professor, here's a letter sent special delivery to you a few minutes ago, postmarked last night. Read it. Dear Professor Basil, your theory worked a certain degree. You convinced me I should kill him. Uh, I should kill him, uh, but when that gun you gave me uh, misfired twice, I, I almost quit. Go ahead, Professor. Read on. Then as I looked at him on the floor, the feeling of self-destruction came back. I'm going ahead with my plan. Here's your check. I won't need it. Besides, I lied to you. I lost my mother long ago. Better luck next time. That is Tana. And a half hour ago, they found her body beneath Suicide Bridge. Well, Professor, your perfect crime has failed. Failed? Yes, Failed, Wonderful but... setup on paper, but your theory backfired and you're up for murder. But I didn't kill him. But you planned it, and you're as guilty as Gladys. She's paid her penalty. Now it's your turn. No. No. I won't. I won't be hanged. Never. Drink and grab it. And now the doctor lies on the sidewalk, 17 stories below. His entire theory worked in reverse. So closes the doctor prescribed death starring Bela Lugosi. Tonight's story of suspense. It came to you from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when we present the noted actor, Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, in The Hangman Won't Wait.
James Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Lad Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Mahwick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The NBC University Theater brings you Boris Karloff in The History of Mr. Polly by H.G. Wells, the fourth in our series of full-hour dramatizations of outstanding works in modern British and American fiction. Many a little man, like Mr. Polly, has dreamed of escape from the dullness of middle-class life, of rebellion against all the many conventions so irksome to the individual, but so necessary to our civilization. But, the world being what it is, the dream is only apt to come true in the mind of an author like H.G. Wells, and in the pages of one of his brilliant satirical comedies. So, to any listener with similar yearnings, we do not recommend trying to follow in the footsteps of our hero... But instead, we do invite you to find vicarious release and enjoyment by following the story of his adventures. This is the history of Mr. Polly. It's spreading. It's caught on in throbs. Hurry up with that hose from the fire station. Can't do it. The fire station's already burned down. Well, do something. The whole of High Street's going to go. We begin our story with the fire in the Fishburn High Street, because the fire in the Fishburn High Street was the turning point in Mr. Polly's life. Mr. Polly, aged 35, 35 and a half to be exact, inclined to a little localized uh, plumpness, with a clean-shaven face and the forehead of a thoroughly discontented man. Mr. Polly, who on any given Sunday before the fire, might have been found eating his wife's cooking in the cramped little kitchen of the cramped little shop in the High Street, eating in what could best be described as a quivering silence. More cold pork. Pork? Call it pork, do you? That ain't what I call it. Oh, whatever you call it, do you want some more? How much can you punish a man's stomach, I'd like to know? You know my stomach. Oh, but dear Lord knows I do. Some more cold potatoes, Uh, then. Some nice cold suet pudding. I'm going out. Where's be kept? I'm on there where it's meant to be. I'll get it for you. Finish your beer. No beer. (laughs) No pleasing some people. Here's your hat. I don't want me hat. I want me cap. You're not to wear your cap. It's new. Supposing it was to rhyme. Does it seem like rhyming? Shan't wear this. Silly old mud pie. Want me to wear it forever, do you? Sick of it. Sick of everything. Hat. Here, don't you kick it. Shall if I like. Shan't wear any hat. Tantrums. I haven't patience. And Mr. Polly, full of the injustice of life, took himself out into the strong east wind. The east wind always bothered his digestion. And went out and sat in an uncomfortable style and hated the whole scheme of life. Particularly as it involved Fishburn, his shop, his wife, his neighbors and himself. Mr. Polly expressed himself on this occasion. Oh, rotten, silly wheeze of an owl. How'd I ever get into this silly owl? Why'd I get into this beastly silly owl? A question has been asked. Why indeed, Mr. Polly? How indeed? (laughs) 
Mr. Polly's history began in the ordinary way with two parents who thought him the most wonderful baby in the world and fed him most unwisely. His education was in a national school and a private school of dingy aspect, where he was set to doing sums that he did not understand and caused to read the catechism with the utmost industry, and where the studies of bookkeeping in French were pursued, but never quite overtaken. He had the curiosities and the dreams of boyhood, but he kept them to himself and concentrated on writing copperplate. However, for the young Mr. Polly, as for others of his age and temperament, one small window opened up into the world of things that might be. The world of the penny dreadful. And dangerous Dick the Highway one smiled a cold smile, undaunted by the muskets which ringed him about. Then, with an oath and a laugh, he vaulted upon his horse and dashed into the night. Cool, but was he a one. And so... Much as circumstances contrived against it, a smattering of romance filtered into the soul of young Mr. Polly. Copper plate, ruddy copper plate. Cut to write this ruddy copper plate. Make the downstroke thick and the upstroke thin. Stupid pen. This ain't the life for you, old man. Or to run off and be a deep sea diver. Maybe join the Navy. That's it. The Navy. All this until he was 14, at which time his father remarked, It's time that dreaded boy did something for a living. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow. Yeah, can't you fellas cut out that racket? You're shaking the old blooming dormitory. We'll do what we like in our corner. You do the same in yours, eh, Platt, old man? <laughs> That's telling him, Polly, old man. Righto. We're the three P's, aren't we? Parsons, Platt and Polly. Uh, that Morrison, he don't tell us what to do. Thinks he's something. Chief apprentice of the Port Burdock Drapery Bazaar. Who's he, I should like to know? Well, he's chief apprentice. We're only... Here, here. Don't rub it in, old man. You're right, Parsons, as Rabelais we says. We know what Rabelais says. Here, I tell you, Polly, you'd better watch that reading back of the counters. Old man Garvis will sack you if he finds you. Not I. I mean to get on. Parsons the one ought to worry. I uh, think he'd dare sack me. You oughtn't to tell him off quite so plain. Look here. Do you think he'd sack the, the only man in the old blooming place who can dress a window? Do, do dress him smart. Smart? I'd tell you, old man... The art of window dressing's in its blooming infancy. All balance and stiffness like a blessed Egyptian picture. No joy in it. All conventional. A shop window ought to grip people as they go along. Right? Right. right. Look at old Morrison's windows. Tidy, tasteful and correct. And bleak. Bleak. Like... Go it, old man. Let's have more of it. Just pieces of stuff in rows. Quiet tickets. Might as well be in church, old man. A window ought to be exciting when you see it. It ought to make you say... Hello. We want a new school of window dressing. Polly, I've been timid. I've been holding myself in. All that's over now. Next time I do a window, I mean to have a crowd of bust. Polly! Psst, Polly! Watch out, Pat. Old Gervis will see us talking. Not he. Quick, in here, in the silk. All right, now, what's up? Parsons is busted. Ah, talk sense, old man. Busted, sacked, out, and likely in jail to boot. What? Parsons? The same. He did his blooming window. What window? What he said. Well, and what about it? He unrolled everything. Piled blankets all up in heaps, he did. Ooh, must have looked real nice. Big tickets with red letters. Curl up and cuddle below cast. He didn't ever. Cozy comfort at cut prices. He did, though. Cozy. Well, but he wouldn't sack it for that, old man. If old Garvis didn't like it, he'd simply have to tell him to take it out. He told him. Well, you, you mean he wouldn't, old man? Well, wasn't only that. He got, like you might say, violent. Oh, if only I'd seen it. Garvis told Morrison to tear down Parsons' window and dress it proper. Parsons hit him over the head with a roll of Ackerbeck. Oh, he must have been splendid, old man. Splendid he was. But he's out, nonetheless, and into the police court. But you saw it all, old man. You'll be a witness for old Parsons. Oh, not I. And have old Garvis on my neck. Platt, if he's out, I'm out. Oh, come, old man. 
I was jolly fond of Parsons, but if you mean that getting on... my five years are up, I'm leaving. That's all there is to it, old man. I can't stick Port Burdock without Parsons. Mr. Polly wandered from situation to situation. Canterbury, Clapham, Wood Street. A careful salesman, a neat window dresser, small sedate tickets. And sometimes, between the efforts to be smart and to buck up, it would occur to him that he was in the wrong trade. That somewhere in the world there were happiness and beauty and joyous states of mind and body, unconnected with gents' outfitting. But where they were, he could not imagine. And then... A long-forgotten gentleman, Mr. Polly's father, died, and Mr. Polly found himself the sole owner of a family Bible, a bust of Mr. Gladstone, a quantity of old clothes, and £395. Well, he looks peaceful. He died peaceful, Alfred. Mrs. Johnson and me... We've done what we could for him all the years he lived with us. No doubt of it, old man. After all, Alfred, your dear mother, rest her soul, was my own sister. Now, if you care to sit down, Alfred, we'll talk over the funeral. You want to sit in here? Well, it's cosy in here. You needn't look at the, uh, <coughs> your father. Yes, sir. Uh, about the funeral now. I thought something very simple. Well, you'll have a hearse, of course. Oh, I do like them glasses. They're so refined and nice they are. He'll have Podger's hearse. It's the best in the town of Eastwood. Then you'll want a mourner's carriage or two, according as to whom you're going to invite. Didn't think of inviting anyone. Well, you can't let your father go to his grave without asking a few friends. Uh, funeral baked meats like. Well, not baked. Uh, but, of course, you'll have to give them something. Uh, ham and chicken's very suitable. You don't want a lot of cooking with a ceremony coming into the middle of it. You'll just want the immediate relation. But he hated our relation. It's just because of that I think they ought to come, all of them. Mm, bit valtural, ain't it? Wouldn't be more than 12 or 13 people if they all came. And besides, he's not eating them now, you may be sure. <laughs> uh, have you... Seen to your morning, Alfred? Must have morning, I suppose. Well, got to see it through. If I were you, I should get ready-made trousers. All you really want. And a black satin tie and gloves. Should have jet cufflinks as chief mourner. Not obligatory. Shows respect. Mm, shows respect, of course. Well, you and Alfred talk it over. I've got to start arranging things. I have to get him into the ground with everything proper. Got to put him away somehow, I suppose. That's the idea, Alfred. Now, have you thought of how to invest your money? I hardly got used to the idea of having it yet, old man. Well, you'll have to do something with it. Give you 20 pounds a year if you invest it proper. Haven't seen it in that light. No end of things you could put it into, you know. Shouldn't feel sure of getting it out again. Sooner back horse. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Now, uh, there's uh, building societies now. Ah, uh, there is. Lend it on mortgage. Very safe form of investment. Sharp think anything about it, not till the old man's underground. Mm, you know, Alfred, uh, you might do worse than put it into a small shop. That's the ticket. Shop. Shop. Sure. Your trade, Alfred. Gents' outfit. Yes, but well, I let's don't... see now. Figure a hundred pounds for stock, then there'd be your rent. Mm. Why, you could do it easy. Be making your way in no time. Yeah. Have to keep books, of course. No one wants to know where one is. Double entry's best. A uh, little troublesome at first, but it works out in the end. Alfred, for a man who sticks to it, there's a lot to be done in a shop. Well, now I don't I've know. I've just said word to your Aunt Larkins, Alfred. Who's me Aunt Larkins? Now, Alfred, you remember your Aunt Larkins. She'll come right along with the three girls, Annie, Miriam and Minnie. Maybe you don't remember them, Alfred, but they'll be real nice company for you. <laughs> Not in need of company now, old girl. He's a fellow of means. Going to open his own shop, eh, Alfred? Well... Shop or no shop, I say those girls are just what Alfred needs. <laughs> It's Cousin Alfred. Hello, Miriam. Thought I'd look you folks up. Oh, I haven't seen you since we buried your poor father. Where have you kept yourself? Quit me situation. 
I'm living with the Johnson, having a bit of a rest. Fancy you coming to see us. Oh, come in, Alfred, do. Ma! Ma! It's Alfred! She'll bring tea. Oh, sit down, Alfred, do. Oh, no, not there. We're all in a mess today, <laughs> you know. It, it's my cleaning up day. You just have to take us as you find us. <laughs> well, I we had to come over and see my pretty cousins again. Oh, Alfred, you do say such things. <laughs> I didn't say which of them. Well, <laughs> We are glad to see you. Oh, yes, Ma, and some tea. You'd like tea, wouldn't you, Alfred? If I might. You'll just have to pardon us, Alfred. Miriam's turning out the front room. Never did see such a girl for cleaning up. But then all my girls is tidy. Pity Annie and Minnie are at work. Won't be home until seven. Shall I pour the tea for you, ma'am? Now you just stay right there next to Miriam. Look real sweet, you do. Oh. Uh, two lamps, Alfred? If I might. But now you come sit next to me, too, Aunt Larkin. Oh, Alfred. <laughs> I've seen a bicycle out the window. It isn't ever yours. It is, though. You are clever. Fancy riding a bicycle. Oh, ain't no cleverness. You, you just wobble along. <laughs> wobble? <laughs> <laughs> Just wobble along. Oh, Alfred. <laughs> Supposing you was to run somebody down. No foreseen little accidentulous misadventures. <laughs> None whatever. <laughs> Never run anyone down, ma'am. Not really. Of course, there was a stout elderly gent walking on the road to die. <laughs> Don't say you run him down, Alfred. Run him down? Not me, ma'am. I never run anything down. <laughs> Wobbles, <laughs> ring the bell, <laughs> wobble, wobble. <laughs> oh, I never laughed so hard, have I, Ma? Have I ever? Well, <laughs> this is pleasant, but I'm afraid. Alfred, Alfred, you're not thinking of going. Not when you've just come. Supper at eight at the Johnsons. I won't hear of it. I simply will not hear of it. You're to stay to supper here. Well. Do stay, Alfred. Well... You can walk about with Miriam to meet Annie and Minnie. It's a nice walk by the cemetery and the recreation ground. And you come back here for supper, Alfred. We just love to have you here. You are quiet today, Alfred. Uh, matters on me mind. You've been looking around for a shot, Alfred. See one or two. It takes time. It don't do to be precipitous. Oh, it don't. Once you got it, you got it. Why like choosing a husband? I made Larkins wait two years, and I hope my girls will do the same when the time comes. Oh, Ma. I got three fine girls, Alfred, and I say any man would be glad to wait for them. To be sure, ma'am. Minnie's so clever, you know. And Annie's real sweet and affectionate. And Miriam... Ma, you, you forgot to bring in the jam for tea. Why, I believe you're right. That was right careless of me. I get it straight. Are you really going to get a shop, Alfred? Well, now, uh, when I get this shop of mine, I shall have a cat. Got to make a home for a cat, you know. Oh, Robert. A cat's no good if it ain't a tabby. That's it. Cat, I'm going to have in a canary. Oh, I didn't see. think of that before, but a cat and a canary seem to go, you know. Mm. Summer weather, I'll sit at breakfast in the little room behind the shop. Sun coming in the window, cat on the chair, canary singing, and Mrs. Polly. Oh, hello. Mrs. Polly frying an extra bit of bacon. Bacon singing, cat singing, canary singing, Mrs. Polly. But who's Mrs. Polly going to be? Figment of the imagination, you know. Put it in to fill up the picture. No face to figure yet. Still, that's how it'll be. Bit of garden, perhaps? Not the back-breaking sort, you know. Just a patch of nasturtiums and oh, sweet pea. Nice. Red brick yard, clouds lie, trellis. Humorous wind mm, vibe. You will have it nice. Rather. Smart little shop. Counter... Desk, all complete. Umbrella stand, carpet on the floor, ties and O's on a rail. Cat asleep on the counter. I like cats. I'm always signed to mother. I wish we had a cat. Like to have one someday. 
Never will, though. No more in your shop. I'll have my shop right nothing before long. Trust me. Cat, canary bird and all. I'll have my cat first. You never mean anything you say. I'd get them together. Why, how do you mean? Shop and cat thrown in. Alfred, you mean to say... Oh, I am sorry. Yeah, the jam's so put away, Miriam. It took me all this while. It's all right, ma'am. Ma, I think we need some more butter. Oh, no, ma'am, you sit right down. Uh, I'll get it. Oh, nonsense, Alfred. Ma doesn't mind. Do you, Ma? Eh? Oh, oh, no. Why, no, not at all, Alfred. You stay right here. I'm sure I can find some. You were sighing about a cat, Alfred. Uh, give you one. Very day, me shop is open. I should like to see you in your shop. I expect you'll keep everything tremendously neat. Well, it needn't be so bad. It's a home. It's a home. Oh, one did ought to be happy in a shop. So respectable. I could be happy in a shop if I had the right company. If you had the right company? Uh, I'll get that all right. Alfred, you don't mean you got someone. I got someone in my eye this minute. Alfred, you don't mean... I do. Not really. Well, you and me, Miriam, in, in a little short cat and a canary. Uh, just suppose it. You mean you're in love with me, Alfred? Yes. Oh, Alfred, kiss me. Uh, now, Miriam, y your mother... Oh, I didn't dream you cared. I've loved you ever since your poor father's funeral... Leastwise, I would if I'd thought. It didn't seem to mean anything you said, though. Oh, I can't believe it. Nor I. Oh, I do love you, Alfred. I know we'll be so happy. You and me and the shop. Whistling, Alfred. It runs right through me head and you know it. Helps me arrange the stock. Arrange the stock. Not a good that does. Never a tinkle out of the shop bell, except for a necktie or two on Saturday night. Got a new line of straw hats. And they'll go the same way as the last new line. Down in the cellar for the mic. This year's my show. And mine, worse luck. Time you were seen about supper. It's all cold from last night. Oh, not that same kidney pie. Couldn't we have muffins? Muffins? Is it more than enough to do without muffins? Trying to keep this place tidy. Maybe if you didn't try so hard. Oh, it's all your fault. Coming down here to Fishburn, taking this place without my knowing. With white paint all over to get dirty and, and the coal indoors and all the stairs. Well, I didn't think of oh, it. Oh, of course not. All you think of is bringing more books in to muss things up for me. All right. Now, can I arrange this stock or can't I? Oh, arrange your way for all of me. Shan't arrange the stock then. Shan't whistle. Go outdoors and whistle in the street. In the Fishman High Street, Mr. Polly looked round him for congenial company. But all he saw were the lower portions of his nearest neighbor, Rumbolt, the china dealer, who, with his back turned, was diving into a crate of straw. Mr. Polly had been looking at that back for some time, and it had begun to annoy him. At last, he approached and prodded it. Hello! Can't we have some other point of view? I'm tired of the end elevation. Aye? Of all the vertebraceous animals, man alone raises his face to the sky, old man. Why invert it? What's that? I'm sick of you turning your back on me, see? Oh, that's what you're talking about, is it? That's it. Why the wind blows, I expect. But what's the fuss? No fuss. Passing remark. Don't like it, old man. That's all. Can't help it if the wind blows me straw. Isn't ordinary civility. Can't unpack China with a straw blowing in me eyes. Got to unpack it how it suits me. Needn't unpack like a pig rooting for truffles, need you? Truffles? Needn't unpack like a pig. Pig? You calling me a pig? That's the side I seem to get of you. Here, you go on indoors. I don't want no row with you, and I don't want you to row with me. Now, believe me, I don't know man. what you're after, but I'm a peaceable man and a teetotaler, and a good thing if you want. Hey, you mean to say I'm asking you civilly to stop unpacking with your back to me? Pig ain't civil, and you aren't sober. 
Go on indoors and let me go on unpacking. You, you, you're exhausted. You mean to say... Get sigh. back to your shop and let me get on with my business and stop calling me pig, see? And sweep your pie for I me. came here to make a civil you request. You came here to make a row. I don't want no truck with you, see? I don't like the looks of you and I can't stand here all day arguing. Now get back to your shop. <laughs> Something of the sort happened between Mr. Polly and each of his neighbours, one at a time. The ironmonger, the grocer, the chemist. And so it happened that Mr. Polly kept his shop in Fishburne and at his wife's cooking and had no one to talk to for 15 years. 15 years that brought Mr. Polly, behind in his rent and a bankrupt, to the seat on the stile above Fishburne. Oh, rotten, silly, beastly, ways of an owl. It's spreading. It's caught on in throbs. Hurry up with that hose from the fire station. I can't do it. The fire station's already burned down. Well, do something. The whole of High Street's going to go. This, you will remember, is where we began our story. We repeat it in order to make an important point. The point is this. When once a man has broken through the paper walls of everyday circumstance that hold so many of us securely prisoned from the cradle to the grave, he has made a discovery. If the world does not please you, you can change it. Mr. Polly made this discovery by failing in his plan to kill himself. The plan should not have failed, for Mr. Polly made it carefully. He chose a Sunday morning while Miriam was at church. Nothing to it. Good pile of papers in the cellar, windows open, paraffin on the stairs. I break the lamp to make it look like that started it all. I light the fire and then I cut me throat. Miriam gets me life insurance and me fire insurance. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. But while the stairs blazed merrily and while Mr. Polly was regarding the razor which was to end his life... A tongue of flame licked at his paraffin-soaked trousers, and it burned him. This wasn't in Mr. Polly's plan at all. Say, Ow! Ow! Get away! Good Lord! What the deuce? Hey! Fire! 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 Have another drink, Polly, old man, and tell us the guy now it's happened. Well, Rumbo, boys, like I told you, I upset the lamp. I just lighted it. I was going upstairs, and my foot slipped against one of the steps where it was a bit rotten, and down I went. Thing was a flare in a moment. Never been a fire to beat it that I know of. No, never has been. Think of it. Fire companies from four towns and half the high streets gone up in spite of them. <laughs> lucky you weren't killed, Polly, my friend. Very lucky. Nothing left of any of our shops, though. Not a splinter. That's <laughs> a pity. <laughs> I suppose there'll be a public subscription. Yeah, not for those who's insured. I'm insured myself. Royal Salamander, very good company. Mine's the Glasgow Sun Company. They pay on the dot. I'll have every penny back. Uh, you insured, Polly? Deserves to be. Odd lines it would be if there wasn't something for him. Oh, I'm insured. Commercial and general company. I'm all right. Well... Cleared me out of a lot of old stock. Well, that's a blessing. Rusper the ironmonger's a bit sick. His place didn't burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, Polly, you played a brave man's part, and we'll drink to you. Boys, a toast to our friend, Mr. Polly. Here is Mr. Polly. Here he is. <laughs> And thus it was that Mr. Polly realized that things could be changed. That there could be new beginnings. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is presenting Boris Karloff in The History of Mr. Polly by H.G. Wells, the fourth in our new series of radio plays based on outstanding works of modern Anglo-American fiction. 
Our intermission commentator on Mr. Wells' novel will be Dr. Harvey C. Webster of the University of Louisville, where productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with its course in British and American fiction under our National College by Radio plan. And now here is Dr. Webster speaking to you from Louisville. Who now reads Bolingbroke? Who ever read him through? Somehow, these words by an almost contemporary about an almost forgotten 18th century writer come to my mind as I think of H.G. Wells. No one, certainly, not even Wells himself, ever read Wells through. He has written more words than Upton Sinclair or Anthony Trollope, and more vague and mistaken ones. But there are those who read him and will read him, as you who have been listening to Mr. Polly must agree. The trouble is that Wells was not only a prophet, but an angry prophet. Not only a reasonable man, but a man who could not understand why other people were unreasonable. As the 20th century and he grew older together, Wells wrote more and more words, more and more badly. Angry words, hastily written, to compel the world to become reasonable as he was. His last book, which snarled at the world that did not listen, is not as readable as his earlier The Fate of Man. The Fate of Man is not as readable as his outline of history. None of these are as near to works of art as Mr. Polly, Tono Bungay, Kipps, or the thoroughly delightful and provocative scientific romances about invisible men, time machines, and wars between worlds. Why? Wells had no patience with artists. Conrad, he thought, an uneducated mind, obsessed by mere vividness. In his famous controversy with Henry James, who wrote less and is more remembered, Wells spoke of James' perfected style as the painful manner of a hippopotamus trying to pick up a pea. From sentence to sentence, Wells wrote better than Dreiser, but he rarely, after that first fine flare of talent, created either character or scene as memorably as the awkward American did again and again. Still, one must praise him. If one could read him entirely, it would be like reading a fascinatingly chaotic history of the promises and mistakes of our century. Wells not only did and thought almost everything during his representatively confused life, he wrote about it. And at his best, which happened frequently in the years from the time machine to Mr. Polly, he was artistic despite his contempt for art. Though their technique is old-fashioned, Tono Bungay, Kipps, and Mr. Polly are very much alive still. Wells' world of small shops, of cricketers, of truthful caricature, of men like Teddy Ponderevo who continually sizzle in a world dull as cold mutton, are often as vivid as any characters in the world of Dickens. This world of H.G. Wells may seem remote from us now, just as many of his prophecies seem mistaken, but it is fun to live there, for he wrote of it with a gusto that serves as or is art. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Our dramatization continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. Fishman was beginning to settle back into its old ways. Its merchants, now solvent, their insurance money safely in their pockets, were looking forward to conquering new worlds of retail trade. And the equally solvent Mrs. Polly was growing accustomed to the unflattering appellation, deserted. Yes, things could be changed. There could be new beginnings. Far from Fishbourne, along country roads where the birds were piping, and the big van horses pulled their loads, and the mists hung low on the grass at midnight, walked a solitary tramp, plump and dusty and at peace. Hello. What? Oh, hello, little girl. Didn't see you at first. I'm not a little girl. I'm nine. You don't tell me so. Then perhaps you know what place this is. Silly, this is the pot we're in. The next town, Sloman. Very good. Do you think the innkeeper might give me a bite to eat? My granny's the innkeeper. She's the best cook in the whole world. That's her over there in the doorway asleep. Ah, fine-looking woman. She's fat. Plump, I should say. Come on, we'll go and wake her up. I'm with you. What 
What's your name? Polly. Liar, I'm Polly. But so am I. I'm the honor. Well, all right. How do you do, Polly? How do you do, Polly? <laughs> I'll wipe Granny. Granny! Granny, wake up! <laughs> what? Don't shout, child. Uh, oh! Fine day, man. It is. I believe I was having 40 winks if all the truth was told. What can I do for you? He's hungry. Cold meat? There is cold meat. Oh, I've room for it. Step into the tap. Run and play, Polly. All right, Granny. Bye, Polly. What did she call you? Name of Polly, ma'am. <laughs> Oh, that's a funny one. Do little. Happy to meet you, ma'am, I'm sure. Some uh, cold boiled beef and a bit of crisp lettuce? No mustard and... A tankard. A tankard. Huh. Uh, look it for work. In a way. What sort of work? <laughs> Never have thought that one out. Looking for ideas. Such beautiful weather this spring. Hear that? Hear what? Listen. Someone wants the ferry boat. And there's no ferryman. Could I? Can you punt? Never try. Very simple. Pull the pole out before you reach the end of the punt, that's all. Go on out and try. <laughs> oh, me side. I've heard me side laughing at you, Mr. Potter. Bit of a rough show, I'm afraid. Don't Oh, I've never tried it before. I didn't know the look on that old codger's face when you sloshed those water weeds over him. And then you had to go and hit him three times with the bottle. Ah, twice, ma'am, twice. And he didn't hurt his head, not particularly. Did you charge him anything? Gratis. Never thought of it. Ought to have charged him something. <laughs> yeah, you'd better come and have your cold meat before you do any more punting. Might be wise. <laughs> Ah, oh, you and me will get on together. Boots a bit of all right, ma'am. You eat better than you punt. Dare say you could learn to punt. Could have done better if I hadn't been punting on an empty stomach. That's a queer feeling as the pole goes in. I've never held with fasting. You want a ferry man? I want an odd man about the place. I'm odd, all right. What's your wages? Not much, but you get tips and pickings. I've got sort of a feeling that it suits you. I got a sort of a feeling it would. Give me a trial. I've more than half a mind, or I wouldn't have said nothing about it. you got a sort of uh, half-respectable look about you. I suppose you haven't done anything. Bit of arson. As long as you haven't the habit. Oh, me first, ma'am, and me last. As long as you haven't been to prison. That's what does the mischief. Never been to prison. Bit of cheese. If I might. Uh, but first, uh, what's me duties? Well, there's the ferry, digging potatoes, keeping the boats in order, sweeping chimneys, cleaning pewter, washing glasses and waiting on the customers, beating carpets, uh, helping with the poultry, keeping the ends out of the garden, running errands, cleaning boots, throwing out drunks. That'll be all right, ma'am. In my spare time, perhaps, I might do a bit of fishing. little Polly. Did you like your food? Never tasted better. I told you. I'm to be the new ferryman. You'll have to punt better. Hey, did you see me? No, but I know. I've seen the others. What others? What Uncle Jim has scooted. Scooted? He comes and scoots them. He'll scoot you too, I expect. Oh, I'm not a scooter. Uncle Jim is. When he comes back, he'll cut your insides out. Perhaps he'll let me see him. Who's Uncle Jim? You want to see my rabbits? I got some rabbits. Another time. Who's Uncle Jim? Silly. Don't you know who Uncle Jim is? He'll show you. He's a scorcher. I thought he was a scooter. He's that, too. He only came back just a little while ago, and he scooted three men. He don't like strangers about. He's going to teach me to swear. Teach you to swear? And spit. Horrible. He's not what I'd call handsome, but he's a scorcher now, my psych. And you want to know a secret? Granny don't like him. Been seeing over the place, Polly? Had a look round. Who's Uncle Jim? That, that grandchild of mine been saying things? Bits of things. Hoped you wouldn't find out so soon. Oh, very likely he's gone. Oh, she don't seem to think so. Hasn't been near the place these two weeks and more. But who is he? Oh, I suppose I got to tell you. 
He's me own sister's son. Me own sister's son and me a widow woman and helpless against his doings. She says he scoops people. I pray to God night and day that he won't come back. Back he comes, sure as fate. Won't let a man stay to help me or work the ferry. The ferry's a scandal and they'll take away me license and me living and he knows it. Bit fake. It's horrible. I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't for the child. I buys him off and he goes and spends it and back he comes worse than ever. Biggish sort of man, I expect. He wasn't so bad until they took him and put him in the reformatory. It was me who had to put him there. I seen him steal. And him sitting there in court, looking at me like a viper. More like a viper than a human boy. Not saying anything but, all right, Aunt Flo. How much money you give him last time? Three golden pound. Won't last long. But I keep open. Uh, what sort of a size is he? I'm not one of your herculaceous sort. No, you'll scoot. You better scoot now and I'll try and find some money for him to go away again as soon as he comes. I ain't reasonable to ask you to do anything else. How long has he been about? Three months. It has come the seventh since he come in by that very back door. After seven years. And he says, you want me reformed and you got me reformed. I'm a reformed reformatory character. And he grins with his black teeth. If only it wasn't for the child. You two oughtn't to be left. Still don't see that it's my affair. I like to have a look at him before I go. What's that? Only a customer. Ah. The subject was closed, but Mr. Polly did a deal of thinking. But he stayed on, and such are the workings of the human mind that he came not to believe that there was such a person as Uncle Jim. Until four days later, when he was walking back to the inn from the post office. It was twilight. Half a mo. What? I said half a mo. You the new bloke at the Potwell Inn? Suppose I am. Good evening. I said half a mo. We ain't doing a bloody marathon. I want a word with you, see? Well... What is it? Just a friendly word. Just to clear up any blooming errors. You've got to bloody well clear out, see? Clear out? How? Because the Potwell Inn's my beat, see? You clear out. Suppose I don't. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's a kindness I'm doing you to warn you, mister. What, uh, what do you think you'll do? Cool. Here. Ouch! Let go my arm! I'll make a mess of you! I'll kick you, ugly ah, face! Ah, you've got no right! I'll... Right? Oh, I'll cut bits out of you! <sighs> I've got no quarrel with you, mind. It's, uh, it's a little late to go tonight. I'll be around in the morning, about eleven, see? And if I find you... <clears throat> we'll consider your suggestion. <laughs> At half past ten the next morning, Mr. Polly found himself by the merest coincidence seated under a clump of fir trees about three and a half miles from the Potwell Inn. Quite truthfully, he had no idea in which direction he would walk when he got round to walking. Not my business. Where the devil do I come in? He knew in that moment as much as a man can know of life. He knew he had to fight or perish. She'd ought to go to the police with her quarrels, and I'd ought to go back to my wife. Man comes into life to seek and find his sufficient beauty, to serve it, to increase it, to fight and face and dare anything for it, counting death as nothing if the dying eyes turn to it. If I had a chance against him. The wise man's course lay in the other direction. Mr. Polly tried to see himself taking the wise man's course, but the wise man had a paunch, round shoulders, and red ears and excuses. If I get killed, I get killed. If he gets killed, I get hung. Don't seem just somehow. And so saying, he turned his face toward the Potwell Inn. You're back. Rather. He's mad drunk and looking for the child. Where is she? Locked upstairs. Where's he? In the garden. Wait, he's coming. I hear him. Oh, I'll see to Polly, here, take a beer bottle. Right. All right. You. You. Scoot. Your job, old man. I'll take you apart. Not just now. Scoot. 
how it proud. Uh, Polly, that won't stop him. Lord. Yes, yes, quite so. Bottles, party jump bottles. Out of me way, you old crow. Language around the house. Come back here, you yellow livered. Catch me. Blooming ring around the rosy, is it? Housey, not rosy. Run, Polly, he's got two bottles. Don't let him catch you. Doing my best not to. Get me hands on you, you black Go on, waste your breath. Stand still for a minute, like a man. Polly, Polly, in here. We'll bolt the door. Right. Give me that pig pail first. Now, now I've got you. Correction. Do oh, bolt the door. Are you all right? A bit winded. He's got the pile off his head. Now what? Oh, out door. the tap room door. Come on, Come on in outside from the rear. With what, though? Here's the broom. Not oh, much. You. All right, give it to me. Oh, Don't make any noise. Stand back when I open the door. Open the door, you ugly piece of a baboon. Open it and I'll cut your liver right ah, out. Of your... One for oh. you, eh? Ah. Will you? Now I've got Let you. Let go of that broom. That's my broom. You. Let go. Not much chance. Stop going in a bloody circle. You, you don't give me much choice, old man. You, when I get hold of you. I sigh. Tactical error, old man. <laughs> You're back to the river, you know. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, you know, I've got a weak, weak chest. And i got the putt pole now, old man. Heel of Achilles. Ain't, ain't fair fighting. Down you go. <laughs> Stupendous. I've got to land. Keep out. I tell you, I've got a weak chest. You want to go downstream, eh? Well, just keep out. I don't mind walking with you. I tell you, I've got to land, you fool. You keep out. Don't you ever land on this place again. It's cold. This is getting to me matter. You want cooling. You keep out of it. I can't get across, Blaster. You can get to the island right downstream. Don't you come this way. Oh, my God. I'll skin you for Keep this. off or I'll do worse. Oh, you was lucky. I warn you. I'll be back tomorrow, and I'll have your head. Hang on to your round. Polly! Right here. Uh, ain't he killed you? Do I look but it? where's Jim? Gone off. Oh, I thought she was done for. I put him in the river, gave him a bit of a doing. I wish I'd seen more of the fighting. Didn't you see it? All I saw was you running around the house with Uncle Jim after you. You're mistaken, Polly. I was not running. I was leading him on. During the next few days, Mr. Polly routed Uncle Jim on two more occasions. But this was due to the presence of reinforcing guests at the inn, and as they both knew, did not count. Then there was a break in the hostilities for three months, while Uncle Jim became reacquainted with the local jail, because of his having, as Mr. Polly learned to his extreme discomfort, stolen a hatchet. <laughs> Then came the October night over whose events it would be kindest to draw the curtain of oblivion. But it is certain that the town constable happening past the constable churchyard just before dawn came upon a most unusual sight. Hey, you. What you doing down there? Come on out of it. Look out. He's let fly at me twice already. Who's let fly at who? I tell you, take the rest of you out from behind that wall. The rest of me? Besides the part I can see already. And don't go scrunching down more. I says, come out and let's have what's what. I warn you, Constable, this is very unwise. Well, I'll be Mr. Polly. Now, why'd you be hiding behind the churchyard wall at this hour? And in your nightshirt, besides? I'm not hiding, Constable. I'm looking for a gun. You had a drop, Mr. Polly? Not I. Truly, I was... Never mind. Now, I know what you was looking for. How much room behind that wall? He won't shoot at you, I doubt. Perhaps we can make it back to the inn. Not through the churchyard if he's in there. Well, we'll take it slow, like. Come on. Who's he, anyway, Mr. Polly? You ain't said that yet. Why, Jim, of course. Him again? He took after you with a gun? Well, as a matter of fact, it was my gun. Then how'd he get it? We, uh, struggled. So you chased after him out here in your nightshirt? Uh, yes, that's right. That was the way of it. Look there, on the ground. There's the blooming gun. Burst. Knew it wasn't much good when I bought it. Come on now, let's see how Mrs. Doolittle and the kid made out. Doors are all open at the inn. Don't see any signs of life, though. Wait a bit. Ah, there's the missus upstairs. Polly? Me, ma'am. Is he gone? He's gone, ma'am. And is that gun gone? Gone for good, ma'am. Then I'll come down. Just 
Take a look in here, Polly, in the tap. What a mess. Not a bottle left old, nor a mirror. Not a penny in the till, lest I miss my Polly, guess. I've never had such a scare in my life. I thought this time he'd killed you for certain. Oh, not I, ma'am. Mr. Polly did real bribe, ma'am, chasing out after Jim like that. Chasing out after him? Was that the way of it? I'd have sworn Polly went out by the upstairs window before Jim come downstairs. Well, I, uh, uh, don't seem to remember too clearly now you mention it. Uh, whichever it was, ma'am, Jim had time to make a terrible mess for you down here. Down here? You think he made a mess down here? You ought to see Polly's room. What did he do in my room? What, didn't he? Furniture all broken, bed all torn up, and every stitch of your clothes gone. Me clothes? Not so much as a sock... Lord Cyrus, you'll excuse me, can't What's you? wrong, ma'am? Where are you going? Well, it's fine. I can't stay in this room, can I? Polly's still in his nightshirt. <laughs> Uncle Jim never was heard from again. Five years passed away peacefully. And then, on a summer afternoon, while Mr. Polly sat fishing under the pollard willow tree, he began to think. It was a plumper, browner, and healthier Mr. Polly who engaged in this exercise. A Mr. Polly who wore a small, square beard and had not had a troubled thought since the last vanishing of Uncle Jim. But he was having them now. Left her the hundred pounds insurance money. <laughs> Likely she's fooled it away for now. Mr. Polly, we must remark, had never had the slightest remorse about the fire which destroyed the Fishburne High Street. But when he imagined his wife, he imagined her crying. And this gave him distress. Always talking of doing things for herself. Why couldn't she? Mr. Polly had found his place in the world. But he was looking long neglected facts in the face. Ah, silly to begin thinking about her. Blooming silly. <laughs> Ah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Would you like to buy some sweets? Not today, thanks. Mm. Pleasant sweet shop you have here. Polly and Larkins, that's the name, eh? So, so on the sign, don't it? You're the proprietor? It's my sister's shop, really. Mrs. Polly. I'm Miss Larkins. Perhaps you'd like some tea, sir, with a tea room upstairs? If I might. Oh, this way, sir. My sister's been cleaning up the tea room, bit upset, I'm afraid. It would be. Beg pardon? I, I said I didn't mind. It... In here? That's right. Well, nothing like turning things upside down when you're cleaning. It's my sister's way. What with the tea, sir? Oh, an egg, if I might. Uh, unusual name, Polly. My sister's married name. She married a Mr. Polly. Widow, I presume. Yes, this five years come October. You don't tell me, sir. Found drowned he was. Wouldn't have known him, my sister wouldn't. Hadn't been for the name sewn in his clothes. Must have been a shock for her. Twas rather... But sometimes the shock's better than some other things. No doubt. Mm. Life insured? We started the tea room with it. Uh, well, marriage is a lottery. She found it so. Wasn't particular good sort, this Mr. Polly. Well, I don't uh, say nothing against the dead, but many's the time I pitied my sister. Mm. Inquest on him, I suppose. Of course. Why'd you ask? You're sure it was him? Why, who else would it have been in the very clothes he wore? Oh, yes, the clothes. Well, <laughs> one gets talking. Uh, one does. Um, how long do you like your eggs boiled? Four minutes. I'll see to them straight. Oh, Miriam, there's a gent upstairs in the tea room. Oh, did you get him everything he... <gasps> nice afternoon. Oh, Alfred! And here now, don't faint. Oh, Just sit you. down. you. No, it isn't. Just looks like me, that's all. Oh, I knew that man wasn't you all along. I tried to think it was. Oh, I always feared you'd come back. I haven't come back. Don't you think it? <sighs> Oh, we'll pay back the insurance now. I don't know. Now, look here, Miriam. I haven't come back and I'm not coming back. I thought you might be in trouble or some silly thing. Now, I see you again. I'm satisfied, see? You mean you'll go away? I'm gone. I never was here. Don't you think you're going to see me again? For you ain't. Goodbye. You're going to stay, sir. I've just got the eggs Never ready. mind the eggs. See to the missus upstairs. She's had a bit of a shock. Something about seeing a ghost. <laughs> mm. 
nice evening, old party. It is, Polly. River looks real pretty. It does. Oh, and speaking of that, Jim ain't going to come back again, ever. You, you know something? He got drowned five years ago, miles from here. Lord. It's right enough. How'd you know? I went to me home. He'd got me clothes, and they thought it was me. They? Doesn't matter. I'm not going back again. Poor Jim. Can't hardly say I'm sorry. Nor me. But it don't seem much good his having been alive, does it? Wasn't much good. Ever. I wonder about life. You start out expecting something, and it doesn't happen, and it doesn't matter. You start out thinking some things are good, and some are bad. I set fire to an house once. You, Polly. I don't feel sorry. Just one of those things what happened to me. Like you can't help being fat. Yeah, <laughs> you can't. Well, helps and it enders. Like this sunset is happening to me. Lord, look at it. Don't see it does you any good. Always looking at sunsets. Who cares? Well, someday you won't see them anymore. Someday you'll be dead. And me. Whenever there's signs of a good sunset and I'm not too busy, I'll come sit out here. Not always. Come here when I'm a ghost. Spoil the place for the tribe. <laughs> ah, not my sort of ghost. I'll just be a mellowish, warmish kind of a feeling. Oh, time we was going in. You're right, old party. Supper to get. It's as you say. We can't sit here all night. <laughs> The curtain falls on the fourth in our series of radio plays based on outstanding works in modern British and American fiction. Today, the NBC University Theater has brought you an adaptation by Clarice A. Ross of the H.G. Wells satire, The History of Mr. Polly, starring Boris Karloff in the leading role. Our cast included Ramsey Hill, narrator, Constance Cavendish, Terry Kilburn, Gray Stafford, Donald Morrison, Naomi Stevens, Ina Ronsley, Arthur Q. Bryan... Marlene Ames, Monty Margetts, and Ben Wright. Intermission commentator was Dr. Harvey C. Webster of the University of Louisville. Next week at this time, the NBC University Theater will bring you an adaptation of Ellen Glasgow's distinguished novel, They Stoop to Folly. <laughs> Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with a course in Anglo-American fiction at the University of Louisville under a national college-by-radio plan which permits our listeners to profit through self-advancement or to earn credit toward a college degree by means of radio and supplementary study. For further information on this plan, write to the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Your director was Andrew C. Love. Original music for The History of Mr. Polly was composed by Albert Harris and conducted by Henry Russell. This program came to you from Hollywood. You're invited to NBC's Sunday Night Party. Two and a half hours of rollicking entertainment tonight. Begin with Ozzie and Harriet. Then listen and laugh straight through with Jack Benny and his gang, the adventures of Phil Harris and Alice Fay, followed by Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Fred Allen tops off the merriment with tonight's guest, Tallulah Bankhead. Remember, for the best time of your life, the best time is tonight on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. And it is now my great pleasure to confer our academic degree with honor on the most distinguished student of this class. Roderick Raskolnikov, step forward. In the history of our university, there have been few young men who have compared with him in mental brilliance, and few for whom the future held greater promise. <laughs> well, Roderick, Roderick, I've spoken for the university. Now I want to speak for myself. As a token of the esteem in which I hold you and your abilities, I want to present you with this watch. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, uh, read the inscription. Inscription? Oh. To Roderick Raskolnikov, may his great gifts bring him the reward of honor and good fortune. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Roderick, my boy, I'm proud to have had you as one of us and sad that you are leaving. Good luck to you and God bless you. Again tonight, Camel Cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, Crime and Punishment, adapted from the motion picture starring Peter Lorre and based on the novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. Brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. It's your T-zone, that's tea for taste and tea for throat, that decides how well you like a cigarette. And the T-zones of millions of people are voting overwhelmingly for Camel. See if you don't agree that Camel's rich, full flavor is most appealing to your taste. That Camel's cool mildness is specially welcome to your throat. Try a Camel. So I, Roderick Raskolnikov, went to the city to achieve honor and good fortune. But one year later, I had achieved neither. Oh, I had written one book, uh, a book on crime, which I had to sell to a publisher for barely enough money to pay my first six months' rent. Oh, the reviews were very nice. Yes, one of them said, uh, the subject is handled with such brilliance that one wonders whether it's the work of a genius or a great detective, or both. <laughs> genius or great detective. <laughs> Can't eat reviews all the time. I was starving in a garret room. Come in. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Barnum. Yes, it's me. I haven't had a penny out of you in six months. I know. How much longer do you expect me to wait for my rent? Well, can you stand the strain another half hour? Oh, so you're going to pay me in half an hour? Yes. Just how are you going to raise the money? Oh, that's very simple. I, I'm going to rob a bank. Think you're funny, huh? Well, I don't. You're a disgrace to my house. Maybe, but someday, someday they'll put a sign on this house that I, Raskolnikov, had the privilege of starving here. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh. Uh, is there a pawnbroker? I, I think it's an old woman by, by the name of Leona. Does she live here? Yes. One more flight up. I'll show you. Yeah. I'm going there myself. Thank you very much. May I carry your package? No. No, I can manage. It's this door here. Just ring the bell. What do you want? Ah, oh, it's you, Sonia. Come in. Who's this? One of your gentleman friends? No, I met him on the stairs. Well, what have you got this time? This. 
This Bible. Hmm. And where did you steal this? I didn't steal it. It's been in our family a long time. What do you want for it? The cover's inlaid with mother of pearl. Stones are garnets. It's worth at least a hundred rubles. I'll give you six rubles for it. But that... If you don't want it, leave it. What have you got, mister? I have a watch. I'll take the six. Here you are. You said six rubles. You gave me one. That's right, six rubles. Less three months' interest for your shawl and two months on the necklace and silver buckles. That makes five rubles. Five from six is one ruble. Well, what are you waiting for? Want your Bible back? No. Well, come on. Get out. Get out. Common little gutter snipe. All right, mister. Let me see your watch. Here. Hmm. To Roderick Raskolnikov. That's me. May his great gifts bring him the reward of honor and good fortune. It's inscribed. I can't give you as much. I want 50 rubles on it. I'll give you 10. All right, give me the 10. There you are. What are you staring at? Don't look at me like that. I'm not looking. I'm not staring. I was watching you put the young lady's Bible and my watch into that trunk. That's all. But I've got nothing in here. Nothing but a lot of trash. A lot of trash. Get out of here. As you say. Oh, Oh, uh, forgive me. Oh, it's you, Miss Sonia. What are you looking for? My ruble. Dropped out of my hand when she pushed me out the door. Somebody ought to push her straight into the next world. What use is all that money to her? Is is her miserly life worth a hundred others like you, Sir Monod? I'd like to take her by the throat. You shouldn't and... say things like oh, that. that black beetle. Here's your ruble. I found it. You didn't find that. You took a ruble out of your pocket. I didn't. No, I swear I didn't. Well, I... Thank you. I forgot there was still some kindness in the world. I forgot that there was still some beauty in it. What do you want at this hour? It's after midnight. It's me, Raskolnikov. Don't you remember? Got a valuable vanity case this time. Fine hour this is to come around with your rubbish. But come in. Let's see this valuable vanity case. Here. It's heavy enough. What's it made of? Lead? Gold. I'll believe that when I see it. Oh, what's the idea of making so many knots? I can't untie this thing. I'll, I'll show you the idea. Put down that pocket! Put down that pocket! I will! Please! On your head, you... You dirty... You old... Hag! Uh, come in. Oh... oh <laughs> good morning, Miss Parson. Uh... Fine day, don't you think? Very fine day, huh? I didn't come up here about the weather. Oh, no. Uh, oh, it's about the money, yes. Well, I'll have it today. I promise I'll have it today. Not uh, about the money, either. No, uh, about what? There's a policeman downstairs. Hmm? Policeman? What is he? Yeah. Here he is now. Ask him yourself. Are you the writer of Skolnikov? Yes. Well, come along with me. You're wanted at headquarters. Uh, and... There must be some mistake. Yes, there must be some mistake. I I haven't done anything. What have I done? You'll find out when you get there. Come along. In a few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present act two of Crime and Punishment. You've got to be good 
really good, you know, to be a champion. You've got to have what it takes, and it takes plenty of skill, plenty of training, and above all, plenty of experience. Yes, sports champs have proved it time and time again. Experience is the best teacher. Cecil Smith, the polo star, thanks experience for his goals. Don Whitfield says experience made him what he is today, the world's outboard speed champion. That goes for Jerry Ambler, too. He says it took experience to win his bronc-busting crown. Yes, the champions agree that experience is the best teacher in the world of sports. And millions of smokers agree that experience taught them plenty about cigarettes. Back in the days of the wartime cigarette shortage, folks smoked brand after brand. They had to take whatever brands they could get. They compared those brands, became experts on the differences in cigarette quality. And that experience convinced thousands and thousands of smokers that camels are their first choice. They learned that camels are the cigarette with a rich, full flavor and cool mildness. Yes, smokers everywhere learned they prefer camels to all other cigarettes. Result? More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. <laughs> Roderick Raskolnikov, trembling with fear, now stands before the clerk in the police station. Raskolnikov. Yeah. Let's see. Well, yeah. you owe your landlady 30 rubles, yeah. and you refuse to vacate the premises. Uh, is that why? <laughs> is that why I've been brought here? Yes. <laughs> Are you going to pay, or must we throw you out? No, I... No. <laughs> I'll pay, I... <laughs> I'll pay tomorrow. No, I... Oh, it's Quiet. my rent. It's... <laughs> it's not funny. Quiet. No, it's the rent, you see. It... <laughs> Do you hear Quiet, it? I say. Thirty rubles. <laughs> no. That's why I've been brought here. Oh, it's one. Stop that shouting. No, stop it. <laughs> What's going on here? Who's that maniac? He's a writer. Named Raskolnikov. Huh? Oh, Raskolnikov. Just the man I want to see. Me? Why, sir? I'm Inspector Porfiry. Oh, Commissioner. I read your excellent book about the crime and criminals. Oh, you flat, Commissioner. Oh, no, I really mean it. You know, I thought I knew something about the subject, but your book put me and my staff in the kindergarten class. Oh, I must talk to you. Uh, come into my office. Thank you, sir. Uh, by the way, perhaps you'd like to help us on a new murder case. It'll give you a chance to see how the blundering police work. Well, a murder case? When... An old pawnbroker was killed last night. Huh? A well-known character named Leona. I... Yes, I... I've heard of her. I... Oh? What do you know about her? Uh, nothing. Uh, nothing at all. Think you'll get him easily? Guilty man? Who knows? We may have him now. What do you mean? We brought a man in this morning, a house painter. He had been working in a flat under Leona's. Oh, do you think he did it? <laughs> well, it doesn't really matter. He was found with a pair of earrings. He had blood on his hands. Oh, of course, he has an explanation for these things, but uh, he'll do as a suspect just to keep our records clear. Records clear. You mean that... Of course, of course. But come, come, let's discuss your book. Let's see if your theory can be applied to this case. My theory? What... Yes, you wrote that ordinary men must obey the law because they are ordinary. But extraordinary men have the right to transgress the law. No. Isn't that right? No, 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 not exactly. What, what I said was that extraordinary men shouldn't be judged by ordinary standards. Uh, for example, take Napoleon if... Uh, I doubt if Napoleon murdered the old pawnbroker. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad my theories give you a chance to be witty. <laughs> if your theory is right, it would take, make it a lot simpler for us policemen. Your extraordinary men had some distinguishing mark. Hmm? Say a medal or a ribbon or a resemblance to Napoleon. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, like yourself, for instance. But uh, to get back to our murderer in this case, he was ordinary enough, all right. Nothing but a stupid coward. What do you mean? If he hadn't been in a panic, he'd have found the old woman's money. Fifteen hundred rubles tucked away in the mattress. Huh? Instead, he took a lot of junk that's no use to him. And he can't unload it. I've got my men watching every outlet. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Inspector, you've promised to show me your blundering police methods, and you certainly have. You're holding a man who's probably entirely innocent just to keep your records clear, huh? Well, the painter will do until the real murderer comes in. And he will come in. He'll give himself up through fear. Fear of the law or of God. Oh, yes? In the meantime, I'll just wait. I admit I was furious, stupid, coward indeed. and But then I realized that I wasn't a coward at all on the country. And in facing the inspector so calmly, I, I'd learned not to be afraid. Still, I needed money, and now I didn't dare to sell any of the old woman's stuff. I, I determined to try my newfound courage on a publisher of my book. Sit down, Mr. Raskolnikov. I'm glad to see you. We had very nice response on your book. Oh, that's good. Uh... I've almost finished another one. Oh, is that so? Oh, you might let us see it when it's done. Well, uh, you see, as a matter of fact, another publisher, well, he has offered me an advance of 750 rubles on it. He has? Yes. Oh, uh, the pirate. You're my discovery. Well... Look, I'll give you a thousand rubles advance. Hmm? How's that? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> Yes, it's wonderful. I took the money. I paid my landlady in full. I, I bought myself a whole new outfit of clothes. Oh, I, I was riding on top of the world. And, but then a disturbing thought occurred to me. And of course, the inspector hadn't suspected me for a moment, but, but undoubtedly he, he would find my name in the old pawnbroker's books. He, he might think you're curious. I hadn't mentioned it myself. I, I decided to go and see him again, voluntarily, yes, out of my own free will. That's what an innocent man would do, or, or, or would he? Well, anyway, I'm going. The inspector will see you in just a moment. Thank you, I'm in no hurry. Oh, Mr. Raskolnikov. Sonia, what are you doing here? The inspector sent for me. He returned my Bible. He asked me a few questions. Questions? What, what kind of questions? About the day I went to the pawnbroker. Did he want to know anything about me? Yes. What did you tell him? About the money you gave me. Oh. And then he wanted to know. Why? What did he want to know? Before I knew what had happened... He made me tell him what you said. Oh. That she deserved to die. Well, she did, she... The inspector will see you now, Mr. Raskolnikov. Sonia, I must see you later. Where do you live? Catherine Street. First house from the bridge, second floor. I'll be over as soon as I can. Wait for me. This way, sir. Thank you. Ah, Mr. Raskolnikov. I am delighted to see you again. I've come to claim my watch. Yeah. Your watch? Come on, let's not beat around the bush. I hated to part with it, but I need the money, so so I took it to the old woman and then What I... old woman? Oh, you know the palm broker, the one that the one we were talking about. Oh. Oh, did you have dealings with her? Did I you know I had. You know I was there. I'm I mean, isn't my name in her book? Oh, wait a minute. Why, so it is. Funny I didn't notice it. What are you trying to do? Upset me? Upset me? No, not at all. And I'm sorry, but there's no watch listed among her effects. I'm mm. afraid it's still in the murderer's possession. Well, thank you very much. I must be going out. Oh, uh, by the way, that's a new suit, isn't it? Hmm? Yes, it is. What of it? Why shouldn't I be wearing a new suit, huh? Mm. Things have taken a turn for the better, eh? Yes, things have taken a turn for the better. I sold another book. Congratulations. I hope you'll have some theories in this one that'll help me solve this murder. We're uh, still holding that poor wretch of a painter. Oh, oh, here. Your real murderer hasn't come in, huh? No, not yet. But I haven't given up hope. Oh, you're very optimistic. That's good. Suspect anyone in particular? Oh, I suspect anyone and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I'll admit now that for a time I even connected you with the murder. Me? Yes. You know how a policeman's mind functions. No, I don't. I began piecing things in a pattern. 
Your desperate poverty, the fact you almost fainted when I mentioned the murder the first time. Oh, oh, oh. Your talk of supermen being above the law. Oh, now I can see You're that. going around town flashing all that money, yes, which yes. I didn't know until just now came from your publisher. You had me followed, huh? Well, a matter of routine. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. If I were the guilty man, I'd be too smart to try to sell that junk. I'd have gone into the country and, and buried it under stone. You hear me? Yes, under a big heavy stone. So? Come on, accuse me of murder if you like, but, but don't insult me by believing that I'd overlook 1,500 rubles in a mattress. <laughs> Try your clumsy methods on half-wits, like that poor fool you are going to sacrifice just to keep your records clear. But I'm not accusing you. I don't accuse a man I think is guilty if I have no proof. I just sit and wait. Yeah, you sit and wait. Stop playing this cat and mouse game with me. Yes. If you think you have a chance against me, come on, arrest me or, or bring me to trial. I'll show you how. Yes, I did it. Inspector, I did it. this man just confessed. Yes, what? I confess. I'm guilty. I'm the murderer. Punish me. You're lying, you fool. You didn't kill her. I hit her over the head with a poker. I hate her. You idiot. You didn't even know about her until we arrested you. You didn't know anything about it until we beat it into you. Uh, take him away, officer. If you want to go to Siberia that badly. I'm guilty, I tell you. I'm guilty. Get him out of here. Oh, oh what a triumph for your methods, Inspector. <laughs> First you try to make him confess, and now you try to make him believe he's innocent. <laughs> Doesn't your conscience ever bother you? No. Let the real murderer suffer from his conscience. It'll trouble him. He's no Napoleon. No, he's not hard enough. He'll come in, and I'll be waiting for him. I'll be waiting. Good luck. <laughs> Have you been? Oh, I'm walking the streets. I, I don't know how long. I know it's late. And I had to talk to you, Sonia. I may never see you again. You're going away? Yes. Where are you going? I don't know. Then why? Because I'm free now. Yes, I'm free. I'm free to go where I please and, and do what I please. And Free? From what? Police. They suspected me of the murder. <laughs> oh, it's all over now. Sonia, come away with me. Did they find the guilty man? They had him all along. He confessed this morning. Who was it? Oh, a painter who worked in a house. Why all these questions? Leave me alone. I, I've been questioning enough. Please put that Bible away. I, I don't want to be reminded of that old hag. I, and Jesus said, take away the stone. What stone? What stone are you talking about? How do you know I hid it under a stone? It's the stone under which Lazarus was buried. Huh? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, thou hast heard me. And when he had thus spoken cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Sonia. Sonia. You should kneel to me. Have mercy on me, Sonia. I killed that old woman. I, yes, I, I killed her. Why did you do it? Uh, I was mad. What shall I do now? I don't know what to tell you. Because you have no faith. What did I do to have faith? Then I would tell you to confess. Huh? Atone for what you've done. Confess to the police? How else can you save the one who's being confess punished in your and place? Confess and go to Siberia and, and rot in prison, Sonia. How can you ask me to do that? Because I love you. <sighs> Sonia, I know, I know it now, I, you know, I have faith, you have given it to me, 
You have made me see myself, uh, yes, I, as I really was, and just a coward who, who thought himself brave. All right, Sonia, I'll go and do as you say. Oh, my darling. I'll wait for you. I'll always wait for you. Forever. Come in. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Raskolnikov. I've been expecting you. I've been expecting you for quite a long time. Just a moment for Camel Cigarettes. Each week, the makers of Camel Cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Muskogee, Oklahoma, U.S. Army Tilton General Hospital, Fort Dix, New Jersey, U.S. Naval Hospital, Key West, Florida, U.S. Marine Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee, and Veterans Hospital, Tucson, Arizona. When three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, doctors living in every state of the Union... What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. And now here is Peter Lorre for a final word. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, in a way, this is my final word because tonight our summer series of classic mysteries comes to a close. I feel deeply grateful for your response to our efforts. Also, at this time, I'd like to thank our sponsor, makers of Camel Cigarettes, for giving me the opportunity. And I certainly feel compelled to express my deep appreciation for, for all those men who have worked with me, especially our director, Mr. Cal Kuhn. Next Thursday night, Camel's Bob Hawk Show, one of America's favorite quiz shows, will be heard over these same NBC stations. They tell me Mr. Hawk doesn't murder anybody. Oh, he just quizzes them. Well, to each his own. Good night. <laughs> Shopping around for just the right tobacco for your pipe? Don't miss Prince Albert, the tobacco specially made for smoking pleasure. Prince Albert is a mild tobacco with a rich, full, mellow taste. Its choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. More pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco. So see if PA doesn't give you more pleasure from your pipe. If your community did not observe daylight saving time this summer, listen in for The Camel Show one hour later next week when The Bob Hawk Show will be heard at this time over these same NBC stations. Crime and Punishment has been adapted from the screenplay Crime and Punishment by arrangement with Columbia Pictures, producers of the Technicolor musical Down to Earth. Listen next Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Mountain Time, and 7 p.m. Pacific Time for the Bob Hawk Show over these same NBC stations. Music for Mystery in the Air was composed and conducted by Paul Barron. The artists supporting Mr. Laurie tonight were Henry Morgan, Peggy Weber, Joe Kearns, Ben Wright, Louis Van Ruten, Gloria Ann Simpson, and Herbert Butterfield. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.
It's half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stop the experts. Each week at this time, Lucky Strike stages a quiz party with four experts providing the floor show. For every question we use, Lucky Strike pays out $10 plus a copy of the new Information Please quiz book. If your question stumps us, you get $25 more plus a 24-volume set of the current Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of duplication, Information Please uses the question that was received first. And all questions become the property of Information Please. And now light up a lucky strike as I present our Master of Ceremonies, the literary critic of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, as always... Information, Please is a completely unrehearsed and spontaneous performance. And tonight, the performers include Franklin P. Adams of the New York Post's Cunning Tower, John Kieran, Sports Authority and General Fount of Wisdom, Louis E. Laws, famed as Warden of Sing Sing and author of Meet the Murderer, who has been with us before, I mean the Warden, and uh, doing his best to scare up a little information for us this evening, Mr. Boris Karloff, now appearing in the Broadway hit arsenic and old lace. We have placed the warden and Mr. Karloff side by side. (laughs) Now remember, listeners, for each question that's missed, Lucky Strike rings up $25. And that's paid out to the sender, plus 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And before we start the more formal part of the program, Mr. Karloff, would you have any objection to my asking you a question? This won't count for money. No. Uh, You're now appearing and (coughs) scaring people wholesale in arsenic and old lace, are you not? That's true. Very good. So far, you have made a perfect response. (laughs) Now, Mr. Karloff, how many murders are supposed to have been committed by you and the old ladies, maybe I better say by the old ladies and you, politeness first, uh, in arsenic and old lace? How many murders in all? Well, this is for Mr. Karloff, Mr. Adams. It'll be 26 by the time the final curtain comes down. 26? Now, I have it on good authority that it's only 25. 25. How do you make it, Mr. Adams? It's 12 all, and the tie is broken when the... uh, 25th or uh, the 13th boy comes in. Yes. I beg to differ. 12 all is a very disputed point. I claim That is 13. also known as deuce. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'd, like to get, I'd like to get this straight, Mr. Karloff. I mean, what's a murder between friends? But still... I have a perfect tally of 13. The old ladies have 12. And at the end of the play, they get Mr. Witherspoon, which makes 13 for them. It's a tie still, but makes a grand total of 26. Is that right? Well, I, I, think so. I, I have it as 25. I'm going to go down next Wednesday and see which is right. I'd like the old ladies to come out ahead, though. (laughs) All right. Now, here's a question from Mrs. P.F. Wilson of Utica, New York. A very unsanguinary question. If you received an invitation to dinner from the following Mother Goose characters, what would you be most likely to eat? Now, we have to get two out of three. Suppose you received an invitation from Taffy the Welshman. What would you have for dinner at his home? Uh, Mr. Karloff. You get a side of beef and a marrow bone. How do you make out the marrow bone? Uh, Because... When the man who was robbed of the side of beef, when he went back to Taffy's... When he went back to his home, he was out, and he had a marrow bone, yeah. and he hit Taffy on the head with it. Why, uh, <laughs> Mr. Karloff, your, your accuracy terrifies me. It really does. I, I was just going to say a side of beef, but the marrow bone is certainly correct. I think that comes in the last verse. Very good. Should we should we have him with us again, Mr. Adams, to Kieran, Warden Lloyd? Sounds good. very good. good. All right. Now, suppose you went to the home of uh, little Tom Tucker, Mr. Tucker Jr. What would you have to eat there, Mr. Kieran? They could go hungry. He sings for his supper. Uh, well, how about going on with a poem a little, and you'll see that he may get White something. bread and butter. Yes. What shall he eat? White bread and butter. He sings, but he gets something for singing, which is much more than we can say to Mr. Adams. Uh, in the case of the three little kittens, in the three little kittens, if you were invited there, Mr. Kieran. Pie. Uh, yes, short and sweet. If you pie. found your mittens. Yes, and you may have some pie. That's right. That gives us three out of three. Thank you. Now, the next question comes from Albert Miller of New York City. Can you name three men, gentlemen, who appeared before the House Foreign Affairs Committee to testify in favor of the lease lend bill? and three who testified against the lease lend bill. Now, you may get together on this. Uh, Warden Laws, will you start us off? Well, in favor of the bill were the Secretary Hull, Secretary of the Navy Knox, Secretary of War Stimson, 
That's three. That's three. That's very good. That's perfect. Against there uh, was uh, Colonel Lindbergh. Correct. And uh, the socialist, Mr. Thomas. Correct. And the uh, uh, General Johnson. General Johnson. You do read the papers down at Sing Sing, don't That's you? That's all we that? do. That's very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very well answered. Thank you very much. Now, the next one will be in the nature of uh, oh, a few little playlets. El Madden of Hollywood, California, dreamed this one up. We have uh, an actor and an actress here, and they're going to give you some bits of dialogue. Name the play in which each of these bits of dialogue occurred. Let's have the first. No, I won't. Even though you do hate me, you're still my wife. Who were you till I married you? Nobody. What were you? A telephone girl getting $10 a week. And now who are you? You're Mrs. Robert Stafford. And what are you? You're the wife of one of the richest men in the country. And how did he get his wife? He bought you and he paid for you. Robert Stafford, you didn't. Goodness gracious. Uh, uh, Mr. Carlisle. That'd be bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. That's very good. Very good. Now, shall we have the second bit of dialogue? Go ahead. found you at last. Now, won't you come home with me? Blessings on thee, my little one. Darkly shadowed is the sky that hangs gloomily over thy young head. Come, father. Mother has been waiting a long time, and I left her crying so sadly. Now, do come home and make us all so happy. Yes, my child, I'll go. You have robbed me of my last penny, Simon Slade, but this treasure still remains. Farewell, friend Slade. Come, dear one. Come. I'll go home. I'd like to inform the audience that Mr. Adams has broken down completely. <laughs> uh, Mr. Carlock. That's Joe Morgan and his daughter Mary in Ten Nights in a Bar Room. That's very good, Mr. Carlock. Very good indeed. Uh -huh. <laughs> you certainly have been in some odd places. Oh, we're going to have one more. If you can give us a perfect score, Mr. Karloff, we'll be very much surprised and gratified. Let's have so a will I. <laughs> Go ahead. Isabel, they are as dear to me as you once were. As I once was, and might have been now. Oh, Archibald, I am now on the very threshold of the other world. Will you not say one word of love to me before I pass it? Let what I am be blotted for the moment from your memory. Will you not... Bless me. Only a word of love. My heart is breaking for it. You nearly broke mine when you left me, Isabel. May he so deal with you as I fully and freely forgive you. May he bless you and take you to his rest in heaven. Farewell, my once dear husband. Until eternity. Until eternity. Gosh, now Karloff is broken down. <laughs> uh, Mr. Karloff, you had your hand up. That's the death of Lady Isabel in East Lynn. I wonder how you can say it through your tears, Mr. Karloff. <laughs> That's three out of three for Mr. Boris Karloff, and brilliant going. <laughs> they run pretty far back, don't they, Mr. Karloff? Hundreds of years, so far as I'm concerned. <laughs> the next question from Robert N. Blewett of Stockton, California. Now, listen carefully. A young crime reporter sent the following statement in to his editor, and he was corrected on several counts. Enumerate three of his errors. It's a very short statement. Quote, Sent to state prison for two years for disorderly conduct, John Doe was released on probation after serving half his sentence. There are three errors in the reporter's statement. Uh, Warden, do you want to start us off? Yes. Uh, in the first place, you can't send a man to state prison for disorderly conduct. It's a misdemeanor and not a felony. Good enough. And secondly, it's probation. Probation is incorrect. It would be parole. And uh, it's incorrect to, to say one half the time, but that is probably not what you mean there. No. Uh, no, uh, perhaps you're, you're mistaken. Sir, uh, he was released on probation after serving half his sentence. You mean that couldn't be possible? Not if he were on probation. Uh, that wasn't the error I was after, though. Can you think of a third? You've got two of them, Warden Laws. Sent to state prison for two years for disorderly conduct. A John Doe is released on probation after serving half his sentence. Well, we have to get the third. Now, the third error 
is that disorderly conduct is punishable by not more than a year. And in most states, well, I uh, said six it was a misdemeanor at first. I said it was for a felony and not a misdemeanor. And you assumed I knew... misdemeanor means a, a year. Oh, well, how should I know that? I've lived a clean <laughs> life, uh, Warden. I assumed I... after reading the Saturday Evening Post that you knew everything. Oh, I paid for that. <laughs> uh, three out of three, then, for Warden Laws, and thank you very much. Uh, Joseph C. Flood of Malvern, Long Island, sends this one in. I'm going to ask you to quote for me three poems. Adams, not songs, poems. <laughs> Uh, three poems beginning, it was. Have to begin with the two words, it was. Uh, Mr. Adams had his hand up first. It was a summer evening. Old Casper's work was done. That's a good one. It's from what poem? The Battle of Blenheim by Robert Southey. Very good. Uh, Mr. Carlop had his hand up second. It was the schooner Hespers that sailed the wintry sea, and I don't know who wrote it. <laughs> Mr. Carlop, apparently you were once a child. It's very hard to, uh, to uh, realize, looking at you now. Longfellow. <laughs> Longfellow. Longfellow, yes. That gives us two it wases. How about a third it was? Mr. Kieran, your hand was up. Why, he took the schooner Hespers right out from under me. <laughs> Karloff is a thief as well as a murderer. How about another it was? Well, I can think of one from uh, Lewis Carroll. Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did something in... Twas. Yes, but that's approximately the same thing. Uh, how about another one, gentlemen? We have to get three. Well, how about uh, your favorite poem, Mr. Kieran? It was many and many a year ago by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. Uh, I'll take Edgar a Allen dozen Poe. later. Uh, <laughs> that, I think, sends $25, courtesy of Lucky Strike, to Mr. Flood, plus a set of Lee Britannica. Now, the next question comes from Mrs. M. W. Self of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Get two out of three if you can. This is right up your alley, uh, Mr. Karloff, and also to some extent up yours, Warden. Who killed the following people? <laughs> Who killed Jesse James? Who killed Jesse James? Now, we have one, two, three hands. I think the Warden had his hand up first. We have four hands up. <clears throat> Who killed he the was... Warden? Killed by one of his followers. In fact, two of them shot him in the back, and the name was uh, one of his own men. So I, I'm, I'm sure you know him if you saw him, but we have to have the exact name. I know. I'm thinking. Uh, Mr. Carlos. I think his name was Ford. Yes, it was. That's right. Robert Ford. That's right. Dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Adams. You apparently are interested in the history of your profession, Mr. Carlos, as uh, well as just acting it out. How about who killed Lenny? Who killed Lenny? I won't tell you who Lenny was. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, the other man in Of Mice and Men. Yes, but you've got to give me his name. That's right, Mr. Adams. It was the other man in Of Mice and Men. And his name? I'm sorry. We have to get it exactly. It was George. George in Of Mice and Men. You have to have a pretty good memory to remember that, I think. Now the third. Who killed Queen Gertrude? Queen Gertrude. Who is Queen Gertrude? Mr. Kieran. I think, uh, she drank poison. Uh, yes. Who, who is she? Where uh, do you mean? She's, meet her? uh, Mrs. Uh, Hamlet Sr. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is an intimate program, Mr. Kieran. Now, you don't have she to She was so the strong. mother of Hamlet. She was the mother wife of Hamlet. of Hamlet, the late Hamlet, deceased. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, Hamlet, no doubt, called a mom. the king put poison in the drink, and she drank it by mistake. Yes. Who would be guilty of the murder in that case? Uh, well, the king was certainly an accessory before the fact. Well, I... I <laughs> that's right, Mr. Kieran. He would be guilty of murder even if he got the wrong victim. Mr. Carlop, don't let this conversation put any ideas in your head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, so far, Lucky Strike has paid out $25 and one set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And now Mr. Milton Cross, of all people, wants to de-glamorize that weird chant of the tobacco auctioneer. Not at all, Mr. Fadiman. I simply want to point out that in spite of the color and excitement of the auctions, tobacco sales are, after all, a dollars and cents proposition. That's why it means so much that Lucky Strike consistently pays more, much more than average market prices, to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder leaf. For example, final reports for the season from Abingdon, Virginia, show that at the auctions there, the American Tobacco Company paid 36% more per pound for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and 6% above the average market price paid for all the various types and grades of tobacco sold there. And the best we bought will go to Lucky's. Now, this is typical of reports from market after market, year after year. 
We want and pay for and get that finer, lighter, milder leaf. Try Lucky's for a week and see for yourself. Mr. Cross, you made your point in just 57 seconds. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the second half of the program, may we remind you that the annual campaign against infantile paralysis is now underway in your community. Support it, give all the dimes you can, and help make every town and city in the nation a front line of America's national defense against infantile paralysis. Remember, every dime helps protect the health of the youngster just around your corner. And now we'll go on with the second half of the program with a question coming to us from Alvin P. Hosenberg of South River, New Jersey. Distinguished gentlemen, among robbery, burglary, and larceny. I know these crimes are beneath your notice, Mr. Carlyle. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Kieran, would you start us off? Robbery? Yes. You rob a man. You burglarize a house. Why you? Uh, this all... Uh, <laughs> and you... Uh... One, one, one. What? One robs a house. One robs a house. <laughs> One robs a man. Two burglarize a house. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, well, larceny is uh, theft uh, uh, of rather, on a rather wide scale. Uh, well, just, just uh, removal of any personal property with intent to deprive rightful owner of possession. It yes, but I mean, so... you don't have to do it in a house, and you don't have to take it off a man on the street. No, no, you can do it in an airplane, anywhere at all. <laughs> uh, those are, that's approximately the distinction. Do you want to make it any clearer for us, Warden Laws? You probably know more about thing, these things even than Mr. Oh, Karen well, does. robbery, of course, is always a threat against with violence. Yes, robbery, he, that's right. The gentleman missed that. He did miss the but threat. But he assumed it, of course. Excuse me if I'm not right with Karloff punching me on the left and this fellow on the right. <laughs> You're darn glad you haven't got a stiletto in your side by this time. I may have. <laughs> but that is the only distinction. I think otherwise he did very yeah, well. Yeah, he did very well indeed. Thank you, Mr. Kieran, and thank you, Warden Laws. They'll all get you in trouble, won't they, Warden? <laughs> <laughs> they give me a job. <laughs> uh, Edmund Ferguson of Westfield, New Jersey, sends this one in. Uh, this is all about ships. Who, in the absence of orders, get two out of three, gentlemen, who, in the absence of orders, remained on a ship which was in serious danger? Mr. Carlyle. The boy stood on the burning deck. Very good. You've had a variegated career, Mr. Carlyle. Very. You're coming through on the oddest questions. The boy stood on the burning deck. He he wouldn't go, uh, he wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to hear his father. The boy stood on the burning deck, Prince all but him him had fled. (laughs) That's right. The flames rolled on. He would not go without his father's word. Do you remember that? That father, faint in death below, his voice no longer heard. Remember that, Mr. Carla? No, I yeah. don't. <laughs> uh, who left a threatened ship too soon? Who left a threatened ship too soon? Mr. Carla, our naval expert. It was Lord Jim and Joseph Conrad's Indeed book? Indeed it was, Mr. Carla, and I think that's very good going. That's exactly what the novel I think turns so about. Too, isn't Very it? Fresh. <laughs> Are you uh, surprised at yourself, Mr. Carla? Uh, amazed. <laughs> you know, I really expected you to be terrified. At, uh, I am. <laughs> well, one would never suspect. Well, you don't know your own strengths, boy. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you say to that man, Adams. Uh, whose ship, gentlemen, rested on a mountain peak? Mr. Kieran. Noah. Noah. Yes, uh, Mr. Carla and Mr. Adams had their hands up too, and I think they probably would have said the same thing. Warden, uh, did you know? I had my hand up. You saw three of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, you and, three out of four. And on what mountain, then, Warden Laws? On what mountain did the ship rest? Well, you say Ararat, was it somewhere? Ararat, like that? that's exactly right. You did know after all. Uh, Mrs. C.E. Wilkinson. <laughs> Mrs. C.E. Wilkinson of Oakland, New Jersey, sends this one in. Get two out of three. Give the family name at birth of each of these royal ladies. The first is Mary, Queen of Scots, her family name. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Stuart. Stuart is right. The 16th century Queen Elizabeth of England. Her uh, family name. Uh, Mr. Kieran again? I think she was a Tudor. She was indeed. Uh, Elizabeth Tudor. And the present Queen Elizabeth of England? That's a little harder. Is it Uh, Douglas? No, it is not. I didn't think so. No, no. (laughs) Uh, Bose Lyon. It's a, a hyphenated name, Bose Lyon. Elizabeth Bose Lyon, the family name of the present Queen of England. That gives us two out of three, however, and sends us on to a question from Mr. James M. Sinclair of Brooklyn. 
Name three books, gentlemen, which mention vices or human weaknesses in their titles. That gives us a large field. Uh, Mr. Adams, punishment. Which of them is the vice and which the uh, weakness? I think crime is the uh, vice. Crime is the vice, yes. And uh, punishment uh, may the, or may not be the weakness. It's just the job for, for the warden. Crime and punishment, very good, by Dostoevsky. Mr. Karloff. Uh, I think a book named Drink by Zola. Emil Zola. That's rather puritanical of you. Uh, How? You think drink is a, is a human weakness? Not altogether. Why, it's some people's strength. Uh, I'll accept drink by Zola. Thank very you. good. Uh, any others? Well, think of some human frailties. Uh, Warden Law is your expert in this. by beers. A big one. pardon? Mental deficiency by mm. beers. That's the uh, B W R S. Yes. And is a, a very fine book. All right, I'll uh, take mental deficiency. Uh, I'll split it with you. You got Karen. it right ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Karen? Alibaba and the Forty Thieves. Oh yes, that's a good one. Uh, thieves, thievery. Uh, James Thompson wrote a poem called The Cats which is a human frailty. Uh, the Miser by Moliere. Uh, the Misanthrope, also by Moliere. Can you think of any others? Hours of Idleness, a poem by whom, Mr. Kieran? Byron. Byron. Idleness. Well, there are three. We could perhaps get many more. Joan Stone of New York City sends this one in. This is all about numbers. These numbers have been mentioned in the news very recently. Identify them. The first is 26 years. 26 years. What does that mean to any of you? No, Warden, it is not a sentence. I don't know. It seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, it's the number of years that Justice McReynolds has been on the bench of the Supreme Court. Uh, just a day or two ago, the Justice sent in his resignation to the President, as you know, after a long and honorable term of service of 26 years. That's one wrong. Now, how about 59 years? 59 years, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, the president will be, uh, 59 years old this... Uh, what, uh, day? Jan 30. That's right. And <laughs> Jan 30, and don't forget the March of Dimes, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. 59 years, uh, will be President Roosevelt's age. Uh, how about four million? Four million. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, Mr. Carlock? That's the number of men under arms in England at the moment. Yes. In the Empire. Yes. Uh, waiting to repel... Uh, any possible invasion. That gives us three... No, it gives us two out of three, which is all we were required to get. Now, how about this one? It's a very simple question from Lewis M. Moss of this city. Which of these elements is most difficult to find free in nature? Gold, platinum, iron. Is the question clear? Because gold is the most difficult to find free under any circumstances, but th they mean chemically free. Uh, Mr. Kieran. I think iron... Uh, why would you say that? That's well, because correct, generally Mr. found is Fe two o three, that means uh, a lot to me. which is a common iron ore. Gold is certainly found uh, pure and free in uh, in nature, and I think uh, uh, platinum may be. I'm not sure about. I'm that. not sure either. The point about iron uh, is that it's very active chemically and has a tendency to combine with many other elements. That's right, Mr. Kieran. Thank you. Now, how about this one from Walter P. Carr of Philadelphia? Uh, get two out of three if you can. What was the name of the following characters? The first is Charlie's Aunt. Charlie's Aunt, of course, is a well-known farce which is now running in New York. Uh, Charlie's Aunt had a name. Mr. Karloff. I think it was Lord Fancourt Babberley. I think you're thinking of the... Of the... Uh, yeah. Of the... Uh, I'm thinking of the fictitious Charlie's yes, Aunt. Yes, that is, of the one who disguised himself as Charlie's aunt, but the aunt's name the herself... Name is Donna Lucia Dalvadori. Very good, Mr. Carl. <laughs> I forbear to ask you whether this comes out of your recent memory or, or out of the memory of long ago. Had long, long ago. Long, long ago. What an interesting thing the inside of your mind must be, Mr. Carl. Extraordinary. The, uh, the lost lady. What was her name? Who was she? Uh, Mr. Adams. Well, she is the heroine of uh, Willa Cather's book. That's quite right. Uh, Willa Cather's uh, novelette or short novel. Don't know her name? Don't know her read. name. Uh, any of you remember? Marion Forrester. Marion Forrester. That's a rather hard one to remember. Now, the third is the Vagabond King. What was his name? The Vagabond King, Mr. Adams. Uh, F. Villon. F. Villon. That's right. And uh, his full name? Francois. Francois. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's right. Francois Villon, the uh, hero of the musical comedy, Vagabond King. That gives us two out of three. Now, how about this one? Mr. Karloff and the warden, we're back on crime again. Uh, Mrs. A. Silbert of Jamaica sends this one in. What real crime... Uh, describe the real crime on which the following books were or appear to have been based. The first is The Lodger by Mrs. Belloc Lowndes. You know the real murders on which those were based? Um, Warden Laws? No. Mr. Karloff? It might have been Jack the... How about Three Roger by Poe? Uh, Mr. Kieran? Well, there's a girl by the name of Rogers. You're right. And how about the Benson murder case by S.S. Van Dyne? Uh, that doesn't awaken any response, uh, even in the professional well, eye of Mr. Carlock. Was that the uh, murder of the bridge uh, player? That's right, Mr. Kieran. What's his name? Uh, I can't think of it all. Well, I think that's good enough. Joseph P. Elwell, and that's that gives right. us three yeah. out of three. I think that's very good. And now here's Mr. Cross in a reminiscent mood. Those tobacco market reports we brought you a few minutes ago from Abingdon, Virginia, made me recall a little tobacco lesson I got one day from the Lucky Strike tobacco buyer at another Virginia auction. We were standing on the auction floor beside two baskets of leaf. One basket had just been sold American at $31 a hundred pounds. The other basket had gone to another buyer at $22 a hundred pounds, nine dollars less. So I asked the buyer, what makes this tobacco worth more? He answered, a made difference in quality and real mildness those few dollars make. This tobacco for Lucky Strike is finer, lighter, and milder, so of course it costs more. Well, I've often thought that little tobacco lesson should be learned by more smokers. Remember, we pay the price to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. So next time, why not ask for Lucky Strike? Thank you, Mr. Cross. Now, tonight, Lucky Strike has paid out the rather small sum of $25 and only one set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you, Warden Laws, and thank you, Mr. Boris Karloff, for coming to Lucky Strike's party tonight. Next week, Mr. Kieran and Mr. Adams will be on hand, and as our guests, we present the celebrated author, critic, and actor, Mr. Alexander Wilcott, and Mr. S.J. Perlman, a familiar contributor to the New Yorker magazine, and the author of the recent humorous book, Look Who's Talking. Remember, listeners, for every question we use, whether or not it's answered correctly, the sender gets the sum of $10. If the question should happen to stump our experts, you not only get $25 more, but in addition, the complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember to send your letters with questions and the correct answers to Information, Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. And now, a parting message from Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs, famous tobacco auctioneer of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And that chant, fully interpreted, ladies and gentlemen, means luckies pay higher prices for the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. With independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, warehousemen, with men who know tobacco best, it's luckies two to one. This is the National Broadcasting Company. From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays, transcribed with John Chapman. of hour-length dramas based on famous theatrical books begun by the late Burns Mantle, now edited by the distinguished drama critic of the New York Daily News, John Chapman. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Almost 600 years ago, a man named Geoffrey Chaucer coined a phrase. He couldn't spell very well, apparently. So what he wrote must have sounded to him something like this. Mordra wall out. 
Certain. It wall not file. We've been practicing up on spelling and pronunciation during the last few centuries and have figured out that what Chaucer meant was murder will out, certainly. It can't miss. And so it can't. It rarely misses in the theater. The season of 1940-41 was an excellent one for murder and for comedy in the best plays of the Broadway theater. Owen Davis had adapted a novel by Francis and Richard Lockridge, Mr. and Mrs. North, about an attractive young couple blundering their way into the detective business, and this play was a hit. Joseph Kesselring wrote another one about murder by the dozen, which he originally titled Bodies in Our Cellar. This turned out to be Arsenic and Old Lace, which had 1,444 performances. Only six other plays in the history of the Broadway stage have run longer. In the company on the first night of January 10, 1941, were Boris Karloff, Jean Adair, and other fine comedians. Now, in this best play's performance, we have Mr. Karloff and Donald Cook as two strangely different brothers. Mr. Cook currently is starring in the Broadway hit The Moon is Blue. Our company also includes Jean Adair and Edgar Staley from the original production... And Evelyn Varden is the nice little lady who likes to give all our guests elderberry wine. The performance is beginning. On a quiet street under the arching elms in the town of Brooklyn, New York, the old Brewster home stands in dignified and over-decorated glory. The gas mantles are still in the hall, although electricity was installed several years ago. It's tea time. And Miss Abby Brewster pours. The minister is visiting, and Miss Abby and her nephew Teddy are most attentive. Won't you have another biscuit, Dr. Harper? Oh, no, Miss Abby. I always eat too many of your biscuits just to taste the lovely jam. But you haven't tried the quince. We always put a little apple in with it to take the tartness out. We'll send you over a jar. Teddy, more tea. What? Oh, bless. Bless. Uh, Miss Abby, I've been meaning to speak to you about your nephew, Mortimer, I mean. Oh, yes, I understand he's taking Elaine to the theater again tonight. Uh, Teddy, your brother Mortimer will be here a little later. Delighted. We are so happy it's Elaine that Mortimer takes to the theater with him. Uh, <clears throat> Miss Abby, I'll be frank with you. I do not entirely approve your nephew's unfortunate connection with the theater. A drama critic is constantly exposed to the theater, and I fear some of them do develop an interest in it. Well, not Mortimer. You need have no fear of that. Why, Mortimer hates the theater. Really? Oh, yes, he writes awful things about the theater. But you can't blame him, poor boy. He was so happy writing about real estate, which he really knew something about. And then they just made him take this terrible night position. My, my. But as he says, the theater can't last much longer anyway. And in the meantime, it's a living. Oh, now, who do you suppose that is? I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, hello, Miss Brewster. How are you, Officer Brophy? Come in. Thank you. Oh, Afternoon, sir. Sir, what news have you brought me? Uh, Colonel, I have nothing to report. Splendid. Thank you, sir. At ease. Yep, we've uh, come for the Christmas toys, Miss Booster. That's a splendid job you men do fixing toys for the children. Yeah, well, it gives us something to do when we sit around the station. You get tired playing cards. Then you start cleaning your gun, and the first thing you know, you've shot yourself in the foot. Uh, Teddy, dear, go upstairs and get that big box from your Aunt Martha's room. Delighted. That's right, dear. Up the stairs. How is Mrs. Brophy today? Pneumonia. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Ah! Oh, she's much better now. Um, a little weak still. Well, I'm going to tell Sister Martha, and she'll bring you over some beef broth for her. And I'll be right back. Now. Oh, don't bother, Miss Abby. You've done so much for her already. Ah! Oh, oh. Hey, Colonel. You promised not to do that. But I have to call a cabinet meeting to get the release of those supplies. Uh, He used to do that in the middle of the night. The neighbors complain about him. Oh, he's quite harmless. Oh, sure, sure. I suppose he does think he's Teddy Roosevelt. There's a shame a nice family like this hatching a cuckoo. The grandfather made a million dollars. Uh, patent medicine. Well, 
Officer Brophy. And Dr. Harper. How nice. Oh, uh, hello, Miss Martha. I, uh, I come to get the Christmas toys. Oh, yes. Teddy's Army and Navy. They wear out. Oh, you're that, Martha. Uh, how is poor Mr. Benitsky? Well, dear, it's, it's pretty serious, I'm afraid. Uh, the doctor was there. He's going to amputate in the morning. Can we be present? No, dear, I asked him. But he said it's against the rules of the hospital or or something. Oh, oh here's Teddy with the Army and Navy. Oh, thanks, Colonel. This will make a lot of kids happy. What's this? What's this? What's this? The USS Oregon? Oh, no, Teddy, dear. Put it back. But the Oregon goes to Australia. Uh, thank you again, ma'am. <coughs> yes, sir, Colonel. Dismissed? Yes, sir. I shall retire to field headquarters. Fire! The blockhouse? The stairs are over San Juan Hill. Uh, have you ever tried to persuade him he wasn't Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, no. Oh, he's so happy being Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, once a long time ago, remember, Martha, we thought if, we, if he could be George Washington, it might be a change for him. But he stayed under his bed for days and just wouldn't be anybody. And we'd so much rather he'd be Mr. Roosevelt than nobody. Well, if he's happy... <clears throat> I'd better be running along. Give our love to Elaine. And Dr. Harper, please don't think too harshly of Mortimer because he's a dramatic critic. Somebody has to do these things. Uh, goodbye. Did you just have tea? Isn't it rather late? Yes. And dinner's going to be late, too. So? Why? Teddy! Yes, Aunt Abby? Good news for you. You're going to Panama and dig another lock for the canal. Delighted. That's bully. Just bully. I shall prepare at once for the journey. Oh. Fire! Abby, you mean... Yes, dear? While I was out? Yes, dear. I just couldn't wait for you. I didn't know when you'd be back and Dr. Harper was coming. But, dear, all by yourself. I run right downstairs and see. Oh, no, no, there wasn't time. Then where did you... Martha, look in the window seat. The window seat? Mm. Go ahead, dear, lift the lid. Oh, Abby, Abby, isn't it just too delightful? And to think you managed it all by yourself. <laughs> We're almost home, Elaine. Now, make up your mind. Where do you want to go for dinner? No, I don't care, Mortimer, really. Well, suppose we wait till after the show. Well, that'll make it pretty late, won't it? Not with a little stinker we're seeing tonight. Well, I was hoping it'd be a musical. They seem to have a humanizing effect on you, darling. After a serious play, we joined the proletariat in the subway, and I listened to that lecture on the drama. It wasn't until we saw a musical that you took me home in a taxi, and, uh... Notice my legs. Elaine, uh, where could we be married in a hurry, say, uh, tonight? <laughs> now, I'm afraid Father will insist on officiating. Now, I bet your father could make even the marriage service sound pedestrian. Are you by any chance writing a review of it? <laughs> Sorry, darling. Occupational disease. <laughs> yeah, here we are. The Bruce Dimension. <sighs> Thanks, darling. Is that Teddy at the door? Yes. Well, what's he doing in shorts and a sun helmet? Hello, Mortimer. How are you, Mr. President? Bully, thank you. Just bully. What uh, news have you brought me? Just this. Mr. President, the country is squarely behind you. Yes, I know. Isn't it wonderful? Well, goodbye. Where are you off to, Teddy? Panama. Well... Uh, Panama's the cellar. He digs locks for the canal down there. Oh. You're very sweet with him. Uh, Teddy always was my favorite brother. Favorite? With him more of you? There's another brother, Jonathan. We don't talk about him. He left Brooklyn very early, by request. Jonathan was the kind of boy who liked to cut worms in two with his teeth. What became of him? I don't know. He wanted to become a surgeon like Grandfather, but he wouldn't go to medical school first, and his practice got him into trouble. Oh. Well... 
Goodbye, darling. I'll uh, run over and say goodnight to Father before I go out with you. He likes to pray over me a little. Mm-hmm. I'll be right back. I'll cut across the cemetery. Hello, Mortimer. Oh, hello, Aunt Abby. Hey, did you see my chapter on Thoreau? I want to show it to Elaine. No, I haven't seen it, dear. We thought you'd like a little something before you leave. Martha's getting a piece of the Lady Baltimore cake. Dr. Harper was here to tea. He's uh, concerned about Elaine going to the theater so much. <laughs> he loved tonight's horror, Murder Will Out. Oh, dear. Well, I think I'll open a bottle of wine. It'll be nice with the cake. Yeah, I can see it all now. The same old thing. When the curtain goes up... Uh, where is that chapter? Uh, the first thing you will see, uh, maybe uh, in the window seat, uh, will be a dead body. I'm sure, just like this one. A, a dead... A dead body. A dead body. There is a happy land far, far away. Lady Baltimore cake is so nice with a little wine, don't you think, dear? Uh, Aunt Martha uh, and Abby... Yes, dear? You, um, you told me you were going to make plans for Teddy to go to that uh, sanitarium, Happy Dale. Yes, dear, it's all arranged. Teddy has to sign the paper. Uh, he's got to sign them right away. Well, you've got to know sometime. I'm frightfully sorry, but I- I've got some shocking news for you. Teddy's killed a man. Nonsense, dear. There- there- there's a body in that window seat. Yes, dear, we know. Oh, well, you... Did you know? Now, uh, Mortimer, just forget about it. Forget you ever saw the gentleman. Forget? We never dreamed you'd peek. But, but who is he? His name is Hoskins, Adam Hoskins. That's really all I know about him, except that he's a Methodist. Well, what's he doing here? What happened to him? He died. Uh, Martha, men don't just get into window seats and die. No, he died first. Well, how? Oh, Mortimer, don't be so inquisitive. The gentleman died because he drank some wine with poison in it. How did the poison get in the wine? Well, uh, we put it in the wine because it's less noticeable. When it's in tea, it has a distinct odor. You put it in the wine? Yes. And I put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat because Dr. Harper was coming. Oh, so you knew what you'd done. You, You didn't want Dr. Harper to see the body. Well, not at tea. That wouldn't have been very nice. Now you know the whole thing, Mortimer. Just forget about it. I do think Martha and I have the right to our own little secrets. Butter plate, Martha. Butter plate. Yes, of course, dear. Oh, oh, Abby. While I was out, I dropped in on Mrs. Schultz. She's much better. Yes, and uh, she would like us to take Junior to the movies again. Well, we must do that tomorrow or the next day. Yes, but this time we'll go where we want to go. Junior's not going to drag me into another one of those... Carry picture. Uh, Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, wh- what are we going to do? What are we going to do about what, dear? There's a body in that window seat. Yes, Mr. Hoskins. Well, good heavens, I can't turn you over to the police. What am I going to do? Well, for one thing, dear, stop being so excited. And for pity's sake, stop worrying. We told you to forget the whole thing. Forget? My dear Aunt Abby, can't I make you realize that something has to be done? Now, Mortimer, you behave yourself. You're too old to be flying off the handle like this. But you can't leave him there. We don't intend to, dear. No, Teddy's down in the cellar digging the rock. You you mean you're going to bury Mr. Hotchkiss in, in the cellar? Hoskins, dear. Oh, yes, dear. Of course, that's what we did with the others. Oh, no, no, no. You can't bury Miss... Others. The other gentlemen. When you say other... Do, do you mean others? I, 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 more than one others? Oh, yes, dear. Let me see. This is um, 11, isn't it, Abby? No, dear. This makes 12. Oh, I think you're wrong, Abby. This is only 11. No, dear, because I remember when Mr. Hoskins first came in, it occurred to me that he would make just an even dozen. Well, you really shouldn't count the first one, dear. Oh, well, I was. I was counting the first one. So that makes it 12. Now, hello. Uh, oh. Hello? Al? Oh, my, it's good to hear your voice. Twelve. Eleven. Shh, shh, shh. Al? Oh, uh, checking up. Well, I know I didn't pick, uh, pick up the tickets. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Now, uh, get a hold of George right away. He's got to review the play for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll explain later. Now, now, let's see. Where were we? Twelve? Yes. Addie thinks we ought to count the first one, and that makes it twelve. Well, all right. Now, all right. Who was the first one? Mr. Midgley. 
He was a Baptist. He came here looking for a room. He was such a lonely old man. All his kith and kin were dead, and it left him so forlorn and unhappy. We felt so sorry for him. And then when his heart attack came and he sat in that chair looking so peaceful, Remember, Martha? Mm -hmm. We made up our minds then and there that if we could help other lonely old men to the same peace, we would. He dropped dead right in that chair? Oh, how awful for you. Oh, no, dear. Why, it was rather like old times. Your grandfather always used to have a cadaver or two around the place. Well, I know, but... You, uh, you see, Teddy had been digging in Panama, and he thought Mr. Midgley was a yellow fever victim. That meant he had to be buried immediately. So we all took him down to Panama and put him in the lock. And that's how it started? Of course, we realized we couldn't depend on that happening again, so... Uh, you remember those jars of poison that have been up on the shelves in Grandfather's laboratory all these years? You know your Aunt Martha's knack for mixing things. You've eaten enough of her pickle <laughs> <laughs> Well, dear, for a gallon of elderberry wine, I take one teaspoonful of arsenic, then add half a teaspoonful of strychnine, and then just... A pinch of cyanide. Should have quite a kick. Yes, as a matter of fact, one of our gentlemen found time to say, how delicious. Yes, he did. Oh, well, well, we'd have to get things started in the kitchen for supper. I wish you could stay, Mortimer. I'm trying out a new recipe. I couldn't eat a thing. darling. I keep you waiting. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's you. Uh, you run along home, Elaine. I'll call you up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, you know, I always call you every day or two. Uh, well, we're going to the theater tonight. Oh, no, no, we're not. Uh, Elaine, uh, something's come up. Now, uh, now, you run along home. What's happened? If we're going to be married. Married? Have you forgotten that not 15 minutes ago you proposed to me? I did. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, as far as I know, that's still on. Now, now you run along home. If, listen, you can't propose to me one minute and throw me out of the house the next. Well, I'm not throwing you out of the house, darling. Uh, will you get out of here? Yes, of course. Uh, now, you get out, and I'll, I'll call you in a few days. Mortimer, you... Mortimer! Phew. Yeah. Hello, Al. What? Uh, George is in Bermuda. Oh, well, get somebody. Uh, get the office boy. Uh, you know, the bright one, the one we don't like. All right, then. Get the printer. He knows what I write. A third machine from the left. Yeah, but Al, he might turn out to be another John Chapman. Yeah, all right. All right. Was that Elaine, dear? Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, sit down. But Mortimer... Uh, sit down. There. Well, dear? You can't do things like that. Now, I don't know how to explain this to you, but it's not only against the law. It's wrong. It's not a nice thing to do. People wouldn't understand. Abby, we shouldn't have told Mortimer. Well, what I mean is, well, well this has developed into a, a very bad habit. Now, Mortimer, we don't try to stop you from doing things you like to do. I don't see why you should interfere with us. Uh, hello, Al. Oh, all right. Well, all right, I'll see the first act and tear it to pieces. All right. Now, look, I've got to go to the theater, but before I go, will you promise me something? Well, we'd have to know what it was first. W will you do this for me? What do you want us to do? Don't do anything. I mean, don't do anything. Don't let anyone in this house and leave Mr. Hoskins right where he is. Why? We were planning on holding services before dinner. Services? Certainly. You don't think we'd bury Mr. Hoskins without a full Methodist service, do you? Why, he was a Methodist. Well, can't that wait till I get back? Oh, then you could join us. Oh, you'll enjoy the service, especially the hymns. Remember, Martha, how beautifully Mortimer used to sing in the choir before his voice changed? And remember, you're not going to let anyone in this house while I'm gone. Uh, have you got some paper? Uh, here's some stationery. Will this do? Oh, that'll be fine. I can save time if I write my review on the way to the theater. <laughs> Oh. 
Come in, Doctor. I'm right behind you, Johnny. Well, this is the home of my youth. As a boy, I couldn't wait to escape from this place. Now I'm glad to escape back into it. Yeah, Johnny, it's a fine hideout. The family must still live here. There's something so unmistakably Brewster about the Brewsters. <laughs> I hope there's a fatted calf awaiting the return of the prodigal. Yeah, I'm hungry. Oh, look, Johnny, a drink. <laughs> Elderberry wine. A good omen. Here's to you, Johnny. Who's that? Who's that? Who are you? What are you doing here? Why, Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha. It's Jonathan. You get out of here. But I'm Jonathan, your nephew, Jonathan. Oh, no, you're not. You're nothing like Jonathan, so don't pretend you are. You just get out of here. But, Aunt Abby, I am Jonathan, and this is Dr. Einstein. And he's not Dr. Einstein either. Not Dr. Albert Einstein, Dr. Herman Einstein. His voice is like Jonathan's. Have you been in an accident? No. My face. Dr. Einstein is responsible for that. He changes people's faces. Abby. Abby, I've seen that face before. Oh, do you remember when we took the little Schultz boy to the movies and I was so frightened? It was that thing. Aunt Martha. Oh, easy, Johnny, easy. <laughs> now, no, don't worry, ladies. The last five years, I give Johnny three new faces. This last one, well, I, I saw that picture too, just before I operate, and <laughs> I, I was intoxicated. You see, Doctor? You see what you've done to me? Even my own family. Johnny, Johnny, you're home. These are your lovely aunts. They know you. <laughs> well, Jonathan, it's been a long time. Um, where have you been all these years? Oh, England, South Africa, Australia. And the last five years, Chicago. <laughs> Dr. Einstein and I were in business there together. Oh, we were in Chicago for the World's Fair. Yes, we found Chicago awfully warm. Yeah, it got hot for us, too. Oh, well, it's wonderful to be in Brooklyn again. And you, Abby, Martha, you don't look a day older, just as I remembered you. Sweet, charming, hospitable... And dear Teddy, I remember him so high. And did he get into politics? You know, Doctor, my little brother was determined to become president. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Jonathan, it's very nice to have seen you again. Bless you, Aunt Martha. It's good to be home again. Well, Martha, we mustn't let what's on the stove boil over. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. If you'll excuse us, Jonathan, unless you're in a hurry to go somewhere. Martha! Oh, yes, I'm coming, Abby. Well, Johnny, where do we go from here? The police have pictures of that face. I got to operate on you right away. We got to find some place for Mr. Spinalzo, too. Don't waste any worry on that rat. But, Johnny, we got a hot stiff on our hands. You can't leave a dead body in a rumble seat. We shouldn't have killed him, Johnny. He was a nice fellow. He gives us a lift. And what happens? He said I looked like Boris Karloff. That's your work, Doctor. You did that to me. No, no, Johnny. We, we find a place somewhere. I, I fix you up, Trish. Tonight. Now, Johnny, I, I got to eat first. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm weak. Jonathan, we are, we're glad you remembered us and took the trouble to come in and say hello. But um, you, you were never happy in this house, and we were never happy while you were in it. So we've uh, just come in to say goodbye. But, Aunt Abby, I promised Dr. Einstein that if ever we came to Brooklyn, I'd bring him here for for one of Aunt Martha's home-cooked dinners. Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm afraid there wouldn't be enough. Oh, Abby, it's a pretty good size, pot roast. Pot roast. I think the least we can Thank do is... Thank you, Aunt Martha. We'll stay to dinner. Uh -huh. Well, we'll, uh, we'll hurry it along. And, uh, Jonathan, if you want to freshen up, why don't you use the washroom in Grandfather's old laboratory? Huh? Is that still there? Oh, yes. Uh, come along, Martha. We're all in a hurry. <coughs> Well, we get a meal anyway. Grandfather's laboratory. Hmm? Doctor, 
A perfect operating room. Oh, too bad we can't use it. Oh, I'll handle this. Why, this house will be our headquarters for years. You mean it? Oh, that would be beautiful, Johnny. This nice, quiet house. And those aunts of yours. What sweet ladies. I love them already. I get the bags from the car. What? <laughs> we must wait till we're invited. And if they say no... Doctor, two helpless old ladies. Oh. <laughs> oh, it all comes to a beautiful dream. It's so peaceful. That's what makes this house so perfect for us. It's so peaceful. <laughs> Richard Lockridge, co-author of Mr. and Mrs. North, took a sporting view of arsenic and old lace on that January 1st night in 1941. His own play was to open two nights later. But here he was, the drama critic of the New York Sun, bound to report truthfully on what he thought about arsenic. Lockridge wrote, It is a noisy, preposterous, incoherent joy. You wouldn't believe that homicidal mania could be such great fun. This was gallant of him, and accurate, too. Now our second act of Arsenic and Old Lace begins. Oh, Aunt Martha, you haven't lost any of your skill. Why, thank you, Jonathan. And now I know you and Dr. Einstein both want to get where, where you're going. But, my dear aunts, I'm so full of that delicious dinner, I just can't move a muscle. Yeah, it's so nice here. <laughs> well, after all, it, it's very late. I found it. I found it. Did you lose something, Teddy? I found it. The story of my life, my biography. You see, here we are, both of us. President Roosevelt and General Gothels at Culebra Cut. That's me, General, and that is you. My, how I've changed. Well, you see, that picture hasn't been taken yet. We haven't even started work on the Calabra Cut. General, we will both go to Panama now to inspect the locks. Uh, no, Teddy, not to Panama. Yeah, Panama's a long way off. Nonsense! It's just down on the cellar. The cellar? Yes, we let him dig the Panama Canal in the cellar. General, as President of the United States, I demand that we inspect the locks immediately. Teddy, I think it's time you went to bed. I beg your pardon? Who are you? I'm Woodrow Wilson. Go to bed. No. You're not Wilson. But your face is familiar. Let me see. Yeah. Perhaps I meet you later on my hunting trip to Africa. Yes. Yes. You look like someone I might meet in the jungle. Teddy. It's your brother, Jonathan, dear. He's had his face changed. Oh, so that's it. A nature figure. And uh, perhaps you had better go to bed, Teddy. Jonathan and his friend have to go to their hotel. General Gotels, inspect the canal. But Johnny... Inspect the canal. All right, Mr. President. We go to Panama. Bully. Bully. Follow me, General. Oop. I have to wear a sun helmet. It's down south, you know. Of course. Well, boyage. Aunt Abby... I must correct your misapprehension. We have no hotel. We came directly here. This is my home. But, Jonathan, you can't stay here. Aunt Abby, you have a most distinguished guest in Dr. Einstein. I'm afraid you don't appreciate his skill. <laughs> in a few weeks, you'll see me looking like a very different Jonathan. Oh, but he can't operate on you here. Oh, I forgot to tell you. We are turning Grandfather's laboratory into an operating room. We expect to be quite busy. Hey, hey, shut him down in this head. Dr. Think... Einstein, my dear aunts have invited us to live with them. Oh, you fixed it. Well, you're sleeping here tonight. Aunt Abby, please get our room ready. But... Now. Well, come along, Martha, dear. Johnny, when I go down in the cellar, what do you think I find? What? 
the Panama Canal. Ah, the Panama Canal. It's a hole, Teddy Doug, six feet long and four feet wide. Down there? And it just fits Mr. Spinaldo. Oh, 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 rather a good joke on my aunts. <laughs> They're living in a house with a body buried in the cellar. <laughs> Come on, we'll bring it in through the window. <laughs> Oh, dear Mr. Hoskins, he's been so patient in the window seat. I think Teddy had better get Mr. Hoskins downstairs right away. Abby, I will not invite Jonathan to the funeral services. Oh, no, we'll wait until they've gone to bed and then come down and hold the services. The general was very pleased. He says the canal is just the right size. He says that... Teddy. Uh, Teddy, there's been another yellow fever victim. Oh, dear me. This will be a shock to the general. But I'll have to tell him. Army regulations, you know. Uh, no, Teddy, we must keep it a secret. Yes. A state secret? Yes, a state secret. Promise? You have the word of the President of the United States. Cross my heart and hope to die. Now, Teddy, you must take the poor man down to the canal. And we'll come down later and hold services. You may announce that the President will say a few words. Where is the poor devil? He's in the window seat. Oh, seems to be spreading. We've never had yellow people there before. Ah, well, up we go. Ah, he died for his country. Open the cellar door, Aunt Abby. Johnny. Johnny. Are you out there? Wait. I'll lift up Mr. Spinal's home. Wait, I can't see good, Johnny. It's so dark. Oh, yes. uh, what happened? Someone left the window seat off and I fell in. Well, get out. And take Mr. Spinal's home. Uh, oops. Uh, I, I lost here. the leg. What's that? Here. Yeah, Johnny, somebody's coming. Get him in the window seat. Quick. All right, all right. Here. Give me a hand in through the here, window. Here, here. Are you in? Yes. Miss Abby? Miss Martha? Miss Abby, it's so dark in here. <gasps> Who are you? Elaine Harper. I li live next door. Turn on the lights, Doctor. Yeah. Oh, who are you? Where are Miss Abby and Miss Martha? Perhaps we'd better introduce ourselves. This is Dr. Einstein. Dr. Einstein, I... I suppose you're going to tell me you're Boris. I'm oh. Jonathan Brewster. Oh, you're Jonathan? Oh, you've heard of me. <laughs> Just this afternoon. Well, I'd be running along oh, home no. now. I think she's dangerous. She's seen us. They really let her go, Jimmy. She saw us. Remember that. Stay away from me. Take your hands off me. Oh, Teddy. It's going to be a private funeral. Teddy, tell these men who I am, please. What? That's my daughter, Alice. Oh, no. Ah! Oh, Give your handkerchief. Oh, help. Get her down to the cellar, Get quick. This way, come, please. What's going on down there? What are you doing? We caught a burglar, a sneak thief. Go back to your room. Look out, Johnny. She got away. Don't let go of me. Elaine. Mortimer, where have you been? At the Henry Miller Theater. Well, who's this? This is your brother, Jonathan. And this is Dr. Einstein. Well, I know this isn't a nightmare, but what is it? I've come back home, Mortimer. Jonathan? Jonathan? But you always were a horror, but you have to look like one? Mortimer, have you forgotten the things I used to do to you when we were boys? Remember the times you were tied to the bedpost, to the needles, under your fingernails? It is, Jonathan. Oh, I remember. I remember you as the most vicious, venomous form of animal life I ever knew. Now, don't you boys start quarreling again the minute you've seen each other. Jonathan, you're not wanted here. Now, get out. Well, I'm sleeping here tonight in your room. Uh, John here, maybe we better sleep down here, hmm? On the window seat. Window seat? Window seat? Yeah, the window seat. Oh, the window seat. Well, uh, maybe I'd better sleep down oh, here. Oh, we wouldn't trouble you. We insist on sleeping down here. Doctor, we'll go up and get our bags. You can have the room in a moment, Mortimer. Mortimer. Oh, what's the matter with you, dear? I have almost been killed. You've almost been... Abby. Martha. Oh, no, 
it was Jonathan. He mistook her for a sneak thief. Uh, would you like some coffee, dear? Oh, great idea. Coffee, sandwiches. I haven't had any dinner. Well, we'll get it ready. Come, Abby. Uh, no wine. No, no, dear. I'm sorry I'm so late, Elaine, but it's after 12 and I... 12? Elaine, you've got to go home. What? Mortimer, I want to know where I stand. Do you love me? I love you very much, Elaine. I love you so much I can't marry you. Have you suddenly gone crazy? Oh, I don't think so, but it's just a matter of time. You see, insanity runs in my family. It, it practically gallops. Oh, now, just because Teddy is a No, little... no, no, it goes way back. The first Brewster, the one who came over on the Mayflower. You know, in those days, the Indians used to scalp the settlers. He used to scalp the Indians. Well, but darling, this doesn't prove you're crazy. Well, look at your aunt. They're Brewsters, aren't they? And the sanest, sweetest people I've ever known. Well, even they have their peculiarities. Mortimer, you're not even looking at me. Come away from that window seat. Yeah, right away, Elaine. Uh, uh, oh, another one. Uh, Elaine, you've got to go. Something very important has just come up. Up from where? We're here alone together. Elaine, if you love me, will you get the devil out of here? Uh, Mortimer. Will you kiss me good night? Why, of course, darling. Uh, quickly. Oh. Mm. Well, good night, dear. And I, I'll call you in a day or two. Oh, you, you, the critic. And Martha, Aunt Abby, come in here. Yes, dear. What is it? Oh, where's Elaine? You promised me. Who is that in the window seat? No one, dear. Look. And it is not Mr. Hoskins. Well, who can that be? Are you trying to tell me you've never seen that man before? I certainly am. Now, Aunt Abby, don't try to get out of this. That's another of your gentlemen. Mortimer, how can you say such a thing? That man is an imposter. And if he came here to be buried in our cellar, he's mistaken. But, Aunt Abby, you put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat. Now, this man couldn't have just gotten the idea from him. By the way, where's Mr. Hoskins? In Panama, waiting for the services, poor dear. We haven't had a minute with Jonathan in the house. Oh, dear, we always wanted to have a double funeral, but... But I will not read services over a total stranger. A stranger? Aunt Abby, how can I believe you? There are 12 men down in the cellar, and you admit you poisoned them. Yes, I did. But you don't think I'd stoop to telling a fib. <laughs> Jonathan, I want a word with you. Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, I think Jonathan is leaving at once. Oh, no, Martha. Oh, yes, and you're taking your cold companion with you from the window seat. Oh, the window seat? You're my brother, and I'm going to give you a chance to get away. And if you don't take it, I'm going to call the police. Mortimer, remember, what happened to Mr. Spinalzo can happen to you, too. Oh, dear. Come in. Why, Officer Brophy. Oh, hello, Miss Martha, Miss Abby. I... I saw your lights on, and I thought there might be sickness in the family. Oh, come in. Well, come in, officer. This is my brother, Jonathan. Oh, ha Hey, he looks familiar. Ain't I seen him somewhere? I don't think so. Yeah, it's too bad Jonathan can't stay, isn't it? Well, uh, if everything's all right... Oh, uh, don't, don't, don't go, officer. Stay and have some, have some coffee and a sandwich. Well, if you say so. Yeah, we'll all go into the kitchen while Jonathan collects his things. All his things. Come along, officer. Yeah, sure. Say, Mr. Brewster, I've been meaning to ask you about a play I've been writing. Doctor, this affair between my brother and me has got to be settled. Now, Johnny... We're going to sleep right here tonight. With a cop in the kitchen and Mr. Spinalzo in the window seat? That's all he's got on us. So we take Mr. Spinalzo down and we dump him in the bay and come right back here. Hide the suitcases in the cellar. Go on. I think we should get out, Johnny. <coughs> Johnny, come quick. What is it? That hole in the cellar. We got an ace in the hole. Still here, Jonathan? I, I thought I told you. We're that... staying. You think I was bluffing? You think I won't tell Officer Brophy what's in the window seat? Officer Brophy. If you tell Brophy what's in the window seat, I'll tell him what's in the cellar. The cellar? There's an elderly gentleman down there who seems to be very dead. Well, what were you doing in the cellar? 
Ah, what's he doing in the cellar? No, thank you, ma'am. That, that's all the coffee I can drink. Oh, oh Mr. Brewster, uh, I'd like to tell you the plot of that, that play. Uh, no, I no, no Brophy, no, you can't stay here. You've got to go and call in the yeah, precinct. Yeah, but I, I want to tell you about this here play. Oh, well, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, all right. later. Well, how about the back room at Kelly's? Fine, fine. I'll meet you at Kelly's uh, later. Great, Mr. Brewster. I'll be there. Unless I drop dead. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is that you, Mortimer? It's Jonathan, Aunt Abby. Mortimer went out. Where are you going? To Panama to bury Mr. Spinalzo. But he can't stay in our cell. There's a friend of Mortimer's downstairs waiting for him. He and Mr. Spinalzo will get along fine together. They're both dead. They must mean Mr. Hoskins. You, you know about what's downstairs? Of course we do, and he's no friend of Mortimer's. He's one of our gentlemen. Your gentleman? Besides, there's no room for Mr. Spinalzo. The cellar's crowded already. Crowded? With what? There are twelve graves down there now. Twelve graves? And that leaves very little room, and we're going to need you, it. You mean you and Aunt Martha have murdered... Murdered? Certainly not. It's one of our charities. So you just take your Mr. Spinalzo out of there. You've done that here in this house, and... You buried them down there? Johnny, we've been chased all over the world. They stay right here in Brooklyn and do just as good as you do. What? You got 12 and they've got 12. I've got 13. No, Johnny, 12. 13? There's Mr. Spinalza. Yeah. Then the first one in London. Two in Johannesburg, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, two in San Francisco, one in Phoenix. Phoenix? The filling station. Oh, yeah. The three in Chicago and the one in South Bend. That makes 13. But you can't count the one in South Bend. He died of pneumonia. He wouldn't have got pneumonia if I hadn't shot him. No, Johnny. You got 12 and they got 12. The old ladies are just as good as you are. Oh, they are, are they? Well, that's easily taken care of. All I need is one more, that's all. Just one more. Well, here I am. Mortimer, where have you been? Yeah, I've been over getting a doctor's signature on Teddy's papers. Mortimer, what is the matter with you? Running around, getting papers signed at a time like this. Do you know what Jonathan is doing down there? He's putting Mr. Hoskins and Mr. Spinalzo in together. Oh, well, let him. Is Teddy in his room? Teddy won't be any help. Well, you had to go and tell Jonathan about those 12 graves. If I can make Teddy responsible for those, I can protect you, don't you see? No, I don't see, and we pay taxes to have the police protect us. We'll call them. Oh, but you can't. They'll find out about Mr. Hoskins and the other 12 gentlemen. Mortimer, I don't think the police would pry into our private affairs if we asked them not to. No, no, you, you can't do this. I won't let you. Well, if Jonathan and Mr. Spinalzo are not out of this house by morning, we're going to call the police. There. It's all done, Johnny. Mr. Hoskins and Mr. Spinals are all put away, neat and tidy. We're all done. You're forgetting, Doctor. My brother, Mortimer. No, no, Johnny, no. Tonight, and the way we, we do that tomorrow, or the next day. Oh, tonight, no, now. Johnny, please, I, I'm tired. Tomorrow I got to operate. Uh, uh, tonight we go to bed, huh? Doctor, it's going to be done tonight. Uh, Johnny, I know that look. Okay, but uh, the quick way, huh? The, the quick twist, like in London. No, Doctor, this calls for something special. I think perhaps... The Melbourne method. Johnny, no, not that. Two hours. And when it was all over, the fellow in London was just as dead as the fellow in Melbourne. Get your instrument. No, Johnny. Get them. We operate tonight, Doctor. 
on Brother Mortimer. My bugle. Mortimer, hand me my bugle. Uh, no, Mr. President, just sign these papers. I cannot sign any proclamation without consulting my cabinet. Uh, but this must be a secret. A secret proclamation? How unusual. Japan oh, mustn't know until it's signed. Oh, Japan, eh? I'll sign it right away. I'll take it into the closet. A secret proclamation has to be signed. In secret. But at once, Mr. President. I'll have to put on my signing clothes. The interview is at an end. Thank you, Mr. President. Sign it right away to... Oh, no! Close the door, Doctor. <laughs> now, won't you sit down, Mortimer? Don't chew on the handkerchief. It's imported lace. Doctor, the curtain call. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mortimer, I've been away for 20 years, but every night I've dreamed of you. In London, I dreamed of you, and in Melbourne, I... There. Tight and neat. Now, Doctor, your instruments. We go to work. Please, please, Johnny, for me the quick way. All ready for you, Doctor. <laughs> now, i got to have a drink. I can't do this without a drink. That wine, remember, this afternoon? Where did the old lady put... Oh, here. Elderberry wine. I, I split it with you. We both need a drink. Very well, Doctor. We'll drink to Mortimer. <laughs> to my dear dead brother. That's a meeting on the double. That idiot. He goes next. No, not Teddy. That's where I stop. I draw the line at Teddy. Now ah, we've got to work fast. Yeah, yeah, the quick way. Yes, Doctor, one quick twist of the silk handkerchief. Hey! Oh, what? Hey, the Colonel's got to stop blowing that horn. It's all right, officer. We're taking the bugle away from him. We promised the neighbors he wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, hey, Mr. Brewster. Why are you all tied up? Uh, he, uh, he was explaining the play he saw tonight. That's what happened to the fella in the play. Oh, yeah? Gee, they practically stole that from the second act of my play. I'll tell you, <laughs> No, no, wait a minute. I I'm going to leave you this way. This time, Mr. Brewster, you listen to the plot. Well, it starts... It starts in my mother's dressing room where I was born. Only I ain't born yet. Now, now then, we, we get back to my mother. There she is, lying unconscious in her lingerie. The fiend is standing over her with an axe. There. How do you like it so far, huh, Doctor? Well, it put Johnny to sleep. Oh, that's just the second act. Now the third act. Johnny, Johnny, wake up. Oh, I can't wake him. What's going on? Johnny, Johnny, it's cop, it's cop. Brophy. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. Uh, this is Mortimer Brewster. He, he's going to help me write me play. Did you have to tie him up to make him listen? The whole precinct is out looking for you. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Give me the phone and untie him. Oh, gee, Mr. Brewster, I'll have to run through the third act quick. Hello, Captain. Brophy's here. You don't have to worry. Hmm? Yeah, we found him in the Brewster uh, house, so you can call off the big manhunt. Uh, you want us to bring him in? Manhunt? Oh, so I've been turned in, huh? Oh, no, buddy, you got us wrong. I suppose you and that stool pigeon brother of mine will split the reward. Reward? Grab him, Brophy. <laughs> you stay still, Mac. Now I'll do some turning in. There are 13 bodies buried in our cellar. Oh, uh, yeah? I'll show you. You come on down to the cellar with me. 13 bodies. Maybe you better go down, Joe. Uh, with him? Not me. He looks like Boris Carl. Ah! Oh, get him off me, Rooney. Help him. Help him. Ah, get your head out of the way. Oh. Well, what do you know about that? Imagine him claiming there was 13 bodies buried in the cellar. Ah! Get him out of here. Well, I'll have to drag him by the feet. I'll take him into the kitchen. What a story. <laughs> thirteen bodies buried in the cellar. Sir, there are thirteen bodies buried in the cellar. Who are you? I'm President Roosevelt. What is this? He's the one that blows the bugle. Oh, dear, dear me. Brother Jonathan, the yellow fever victim. No, no, Colonel, he's a spy. We caught in the White House. Well, will you get him out of here? Now, you. <laughs> Didn't anybody untie you yet? Here, I'll do it. Oh, 
can't. Now, Lieutenant, listen to me. That crazy brother of yours has got to be put away. We don't want no more bugles blowing. Oh, yes, yes, I know. I have the papers right here. Uh, Teddy's going to Happy Dale. Now, about those 13 bodies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you imagine what would happen if that cockeyed story got around? And now he's starting a yellow fever scare. It's lucky I didn't fall for that story. <laughs> 13 bodies. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm Mr. Weatherspoon of Happy Dale. I believe I'm to pick up a gentleman. Oh, uh, Teddy. Just finished my cabinet meeting. Yes, Mortimer. Uh, Mr. President, I have very good news for you. Your term of office is over. Oh, then I start on my hunting trip to Africa, don't I? Well, who's this? Trying to get into the White House before I've moved out? Uh, who, Teddy? Taft! Oh, this isn't, uh, this isn't Mr. Taft, Teddy. This is Mr. Witherspoon. He's your guide for Africa. Oh, bully, bully, bully. Glad to meet you, sir. Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, I'm on my way to Africa. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, if the safari comes, tell them to wait. Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, this is Mr. Witherspoon from Happy Dale. Uh, Teddy is going with him. No, he is not. Not while we're alive. The police want him to go. He, he blew his bugle again. That's right, ma'am. Well, if he goes, we're going with him. Yes, we won't be separated from Teddy. But we can't take sane people at Happy Dale. Look, will you settle this? There are still murders to be solved in Brooklyn. Yes. Oh, are there? Teddy's got to go. With the story he's telling, we'd have to dig up the cellar. He says there are 13 bodies buried down there. But there are 13 bodies buried in our cellar. I'll take your word for it, lady. I'm a busy man. How about it with a spoon? Well, they'd have to be committed. Well, Teddy committed himself. Can't they commit themselves? Can't they sign the papers? Certainly. Oh, well, then, if we can go with Teddy, we'll sign the papers. Where are they? Yes, where are they? Sign them up with a spoon. I want to get this cleaned up. Oh, my, we've overlooked one thing. Uh, we're going to need the signature of a doctor. A doctor? Oh, 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 yes, a doctor. Dr. Einstein. Hey, meet me. Hey, come over here. We'd like you to sign some papers. Hey, yes, please, I must go. No, just come right over here, doctor. <laughs> At one time last night, I thought doctor was going to operate on please, me. Please, <laughs> Yes, doctor, please. just come right over here. Sign right here, doctor. Uh, yes, very well. Uh, here. <laughs> there. Are you leaving us, doctor? Yes, I think I, I must go. Oh, aren't you going to wait for Jonathan? I don't think we're going to the same place. There, now. Everything's quite in order. Well, I'm almost relieved. I'm really looking forward to going. The neighborhood here has really run down, so... Well, Mortimer, we're all ready to go now. The house will be yours, and we want you to live in it. Oh, no, no, Aunt Abby. The, the house is too full of, of, of memories. Oh, dear, but you'll need a house when you're married. I'm afraid I can't ever marry Elaine or anybody. Oh, there's something else, Mortimer. You signed our papers as next of kin. Oh, of course, why not? But you see, dear, you're not really a Brewster. Not a Brewster? No, dear. Your mother was a widow when she came to us as a cook, and you were born about three months afterward. But she was such a good cook that we didn't want to lose her, so brother married her. Uh, I'm not really a Brewster? Now, don't feel badly about it, dear. Oh, no. No. Oh, it's a tragedy, isn't it? Nobody knows who your father is. He might be anybody. You're right. You're right. Well, isn't it wonderful? He he might be anybody. I've got to tell Elaine. He might be anybody. All right, Jonathan, come on. I'm coming, Lieutenant. <laughs> Goodbye, aunties. So this house is seeing the last of the Brewsters. Well, I can't better my record now, but neither can you. At least I have that satisfaction. The score stands even. Twelve to twelve. Jonathan always was a mean boy. 
Never could stand to see anybody get ahead of him. I wish we could show him he isn't so smart. Well, ladies, perhaps we'd better be going. Um, Ma? Ma? Uh, yes, Daddy? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Witherspoon, uh, does your family live with you at Happy Dale? I have no family. Oh, that must make it very lonely for you. Uh, I suppose it does. Uh, well, uh... Martha, Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Witherspoon, I think at least we should offer you a glass of elderberry wine. Elderberry wine? Uh, You grow your own elderberries? Uh, No, but the cemetery is full of them. Uh, Well, uh, uh, you uh, don't see much elderberry wine nowadays. I thought I'd had my last glass of it. Oh, no. Here it is. Well, ladies, to a long life. You have just heard the best plays production of Arsenic and Old Lace, starring Boris Karloff and Donald Cook. Now, here again is your host, drama critic John Chapman. Joseph Kesselring never wrote a sequel to Arsenic and Old Lace, so we don't know what happened to Mr. Witherspoon. Perhaps someday the author will get around to it. In the meantime, we will have another best play for you next Sunday. It will be a rather strange and quite lovely piece, Dark of the Moon, which Howard Richardson and William Burney made from the old hillbilly folk song about Barbara Allen. Our star will be Alfred Drake. Let's all meet again next Sunday in the mountains called the Great Smokies. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. Arsenic and Old Lace was transcribed and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Boris Karloff was Jonathan, Donald Cook was Mortimer. Evelyn Varden and Gina Dare appeared as Abby and Martha, Edgar Staley as Dr. Einstein, Wendell Holmes as Teddy Brewster, Joan Tompkins as Elaine, Arthur Maitland as Mr. Witherspoon, Ted Osborne as Reverend Harper, and Ed Latimer as Brophy. Best Plays is an NBC production, supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. This is Fred Collins speaking. Tonight, America's Press Conference. It's Meet the Press on NBC. At 6.30... KFI Los Angeles. Listen, a new Packard four door sedan costs just twenty nine twenty plus tax and license delivered right here in Southern California. Packard costs less for what you get than any other car. Up to thirty months to pay at Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, one thousand South Hope or ninety one thirty Wilshire Boulevard. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. All right, men. I guess that's all. Put him on the stretcher and take him to the morgue. Oh, must I stay, Inspector? For a while, Mrs. Bunting. Oh, dear. I... I need all the details for my report. Oh, that such a thing could have happened here. Here in my own house. Each week at this hour... Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Lodger, by Mrs. Bellock Lowndes. Peter Lorre is The Lodger, and Alan Bunting is played by Miss Agnes Moorhead. Mystery in the Air, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. X 
Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, let your T-Zone decide which cigarette you like best. Your T-Zone, that's tea for taste and tea for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. So try a camel on your T-Zone. Introduce camel's rich, full flavor to your taste. Acquaint your throat with camel's cool mildness. See if you don't decide, like so many other smokers, that camels suit your T-Zone to a T. <laughs> On, Mrs. Bunting. You said you were looking for a lodger? Uh, yes, yes, Inspector, we had to. But I never dreamed such a thing could happen here to us. Why, it was only last Tuesday night my husband and I were sitting before our fire reading the newspaper about the latest murder. It was the fifth. By, by the Avenger. Yes. Yes, I remember saying distinctly. Robert... But he could be the fellow standing next to you, or maybe the man you bump into. It's a terrible thought. Yes, but it appears to me that the Avenger's too quick for the police. And look here. Look here, it says this girl he got last night was like all the others. Pretty blonde, and she just come from a music hall. Exactly like all the rest of his victims. Oh, what a pity. Ellen, have you stopped to think who fits that description perfectly? Our own Daisy. Oh, sure. What a pretty thought, Bunting. The good thing she's with her aunt instead of here. London isn't a safe place for any girl now. Just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it would be to have her here with well, us. Well, there's no sense even talking about it. We just can't afford it. Oh, I know that, Ellen, but I hope we could manage it some way. How? Haven't I script myself half crazy trying to keep us going? I know, Ellen. Well, don't you go worrying about it. I think we can... Suppose that could be. Could it be someone looking for a room? Oh, I wish it were. Then you could have your daisy back. Well, I went to the front door. And when I opened it, there stood a man wearing a black cape and hat. He carried with a single piece of luggage. Good evening, sir. I saw your sign. Says you have a room to rent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I take your cape, sir? No, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. But it should be very quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Just that. Mm -hmm. Above all, our house is quiet. Good. Your bag, sir. May I take it? No, just show me the room, please. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. This way. You see, sir, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking. Well, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think I like this room. Yes, it is pleasant, isn't it? Ah, there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures, now is there? I don't know. Pretty pictures interest me very little. What I like about this room is... Uh, the simplicity. I like the bareness. Yes, I, I think I'll take it. What is your name? Mrs. Bunting, sir. All right, Mrs. Bunting, uh, I'll take the room. Oh, yes, sir. And please uh, let me help you with your luggage. No, don't huh? you touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to, to... I know, I know. You only wish to help, Mrs. Bunting. It's, uh, it's just, uh, forgive me, it's, it's just that I... I'm weary. I'm, I'm very tired. Uh, see, I do a lot of studying. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, sir. Of course. Well, anyway, you can see how few things I need. It's, it's just what, what's in this bag. But this, this here is my favorite book. Hmm? It's the Bible. Good book, Mrs. Bunting, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed it is, sir. Yes, it says, uh, he brings them to their desired haven. Hmm? Beautiful words, huh? And now at last I found my haven of rest. Now, Mrs. Bunting, uh, if I pay you 30 shillings a week for this room, that's satisfactory? 30? 
Oh, oh, why, yes, sir, yes, sir, that, that'll be quite all right. My name is Sleuth. Mr. Sleuth? Yes, Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. <laughs> Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. Here. Here are your 30 shillings. Oh, oh thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, would you be wishing anything now? Supper, or tea, or... Hmm? No, nothing. Uh, good night, Miss Bunting. Uh, yes, yes. Good night, sir. Please stop that. You hear? Oh, oh, sir, I... What did I do? You were humming. That's music. Oh, but I... I music don't... is an instrument of sin. Oh, yes, yes, sir. And you did tell me, Mrs. Bunting, that your house would be absolutely quiet. Oh, but it is, sir. I, I, I didn't mean any harm. Believe I me, sir. I... I believe you. I, I'm sorry I spoke sharply. I, I know you. You're trying to be considerate and kind. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank oh, you. Uh, by the way, Mrs. Bunting, I, I think I would like some bread and some tea. Oh, certainly, certainly, sir. I'll have it in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> so he took the room, eh, Ellen? Yes. He took the room at, at 30 shillings a week. Yes, in advance. Oh, hurry now, Bunting. Is the water for the tea hot yet? Yes, what a stroke. Put the bread and the butter on the tray. I'll pour the water. You know, Ellen, it's wonderful. Yes, it is. Do you realise what this means? We can have Daisy back with yes, us I now. Yes, I know, I know. Hurry with it now, hurry. Why, why, we can have her back with now, us tomorrow. Now, the water and the tea, and I guess... Yes, it's all ready. Open the door, Bunting. I'll take it up to him right away. There you go, old girl. First thing in the morning, I'm going to fetch Daisy and bring her home. Oh, it's a wonderful night, Ellen. Wonderful. <gasps> oh, oh, I mustn't do that. Yes, 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 there are many wounded from her. Yes, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in. And to know how the wickedness of folly... Oh, oh why, why, Mr. Sleuth, you, you... Yes? What is it? Those pictures, hmm? those pretty girls, you've turned all their faces yes, to the wall. Yes, I've turned them to the wall because they are wicked and sinful. Oh, but, sir, Don't I... Don't you agree, Mrs. Bunting, that everything wicked and sinful should be purged from the earth? Huh? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I'm happy to hear that, Mrs. Bunting. Now, if you'll excuse me, I... I have to leave. Oh, but, sir, here's your tray. I had... Good night, Mrs. Bunting. You know, for a moment, I was stiff with fear. I set the tray down. He hadn't so much as noticed the light supper I'd prepared for him and rushed to the winter to watch. He came out of our cottage and moved off down the street, his black cape swirling about him. Finally, he was lost in the fog. And I don't know why, but I stared after him for a long, long while. Well, I did the dishes and got ready for bed. I lay there thinking, and it was almost dawn before I had convinced myself that at most he was a trifle odd. And after all, paying 30 shillings, maybe... Maybe he had a right to his strange way. It was daylight when I was suddenly awakened by the newsboys shouting in the street. Horrible murder! Read all about murder it! Murder at King's Cross last night! Avenger strikes again! Slowly Expect I realized what the newsboys were shouting. Horrible murder! Avenger drops <gasps> six victims! Oh no! In a few moments, Mr. Peter Laurie will bring us the climax of tonight's Mystery in the Air, when camels present Act Two of The Lodger. Any sports champion can tell you how true it is that experience is the best 
teacher. Don Whitfield, for one. He's the world's outboard speed champion, you know. It's taking the turns around the marking buoys just right that makes that extra speed. And boy, how Don Whitfield worked out on that problem. Don Whitfield recently said, Experience is the best teacher in outboard racing and in smoking, too. Smoking whatever brands I could get during the wartime cigarette shortage taught me there's no other cigarette like a camel. And many other smokers had the same experience. Yes, during the wartime cigarette shortage, when people smoked whatever brands they could get, then's when we all compared cigarettes, whether we wanted to or not. And then's when so many people decided that their taste liked camel's rich, full flavor, and their throats liked camel's cool mildness. The result? More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. As the inspector takes notes of the terrifying event, Alan Bunting continues the story. And now, Mrs. Bunting... What did you do the morning you learned the Avenger had murdered his sixth victim? Well, I was a little frightened to meet our lodger, yet I kept my thoughts to myself. After all, you know, there still wasn't much to go on. Robert had gone to make Daisy, so Mr. Sleuth ate breakfast alone. I watched him through the crack in the door. Finally, I went in with more tea. Hmm? Uh, uh, Tea? Uh, No. No, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bunting. I... I don't care for any more tea, thanks. Uh, You're very kind. But I have to go on with my work now, if you'll excuse me. My fear really changed to pity then. Oh, he seemed so helpless and tired. And he was so considerate. This man couldn't be a murderer. It was all a coincidence. Besides, we just couldn't afford to lose that 30 shillings a week. Well, around 10 in the morning, he left the cottage, and I decided to go upstairs and have a look about his room. I had to find out what he carried in his one piece of luggage. It wasn't a bag. It was more like a case. Yes. Yes, a case. A case for a knife. Rushed upstairs, my heart beating wildly at the thought I'd had of the case. No, no, there wasn't anything in his closet. I went over to the chest of drawers against the wall. Nothing in the top one. In the next one, there was just some socks and some underclothes. The next one was empty. There was only one other place for the small, narrow case. The bottom drawer. And it was locked. I pulled and pulled at it. And then suddenly I heard the front door open downstairs. In a panic, I rushed out of the room and down the hall. Oh, you're upstairs, Ellen. Oh, Look, Ellen. Daisy's here. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, Mother, it's oh. so good to see you. It's so good to be home. Oh. Why, whatever's the matter? Yes, you're quite white, right, Ellen. Oh, I... It's... it's it, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. It's just that I wasn't expecting you so soon. Well, it's good to be back. The country's all right, but there's nothing like London now, is there? Oh, no. No, no, that isn't. Well, as long as that Avenger's about, you're going to have something to do to keep this young lady indoors, London or no London. <laughs> oh, don't you worry. <laughs> Mother will see to that. Oh, well, Daisy, I, I might as well get you settled. You see, Father? What did I tell you? She'll have a dust cloth in my hand oh. before I have my coat on. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sloop. Why is my door open? We were just leaving, sir. Have you been in my room? Oh, oh, oh uh, not at all. Not at all, sir. From now on, Mrs. Bunting, I shall keep my room locked. Oh, uh, if, uh, but you see, sir, I, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he brought our daughter home. Uh, 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 she just arrived. Uh, this, is, this is Daisy. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, she, she's been away for quite a while. That's why we're a bit excited, you might say. You were probably surprised to hear us laughing and carrying on. Yes, yes, I I must say I was, I was. But but then uh, there are different kinds of joy, are there not, Daisy? 
Yes. Yes, I'm sure there are. Yes. There is the despicable evil joy of the abandoned, and and then there is the divine happiness of the blessed. It's a great difference. You understand that, Daisy, don't you? Why, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sweet. Good, dear. There are so few young women nowadays who do. I'm Mr. Sleuth. You mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have any fun? Enjoyment and fun, my child, are a devil's breeding ground. All his implements are there. Pleasure and impropriety. The temptation of music, dancing. Oh, that's crazy. Why, there's nothing I like better than dancing. And I'm not... You like to she dance? She didn't know what she was saying, Mr. Sooth. She's just a child. Daisy, you know you've never been one for dancing. You mm. never learned how But to... I did learn, Mother. While I was away. What's so wrong about it? What's the harm in dancing? It says she lies in wait as for a prey... And increases the transgressors among men. I don't know what you mean. I've never heard such nonsense. Nonsense? You call a scripture nonsense? Daisy! Daisy, go into the front room. It's all right, Mrs. Bunting. It's all right. Uh, I'm used to that kind of talk. Good day. Daisy. Yes. Daisy, listen to me. What, Mother? I've, I've got to tell you about... About, about what? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. For a moment, I was about to tell her my awful suspicions, but I stopped. They were only suspicions. At the same time, I had a thought... I'd go to the coroner's inquest they were having for the Avengers' latest victim. I was hoping to hear something said that would clear my suspicions of the lodger. At least I'd give him this last chance. A lady was testifying as I took my seat. She'd seen the Avenger from her window, she said. And her description of him didn't tally with Mr. Sleuth at all. Oh, I can't tell you how relieved I was. Till it was pointed out she couldn't possibly have seen anyone that night from her window because of the fog. <laughs> then the next witness was a Mr. Cannot. I leaned forward anxiously as they swore him in and began asking questions. You say, Mr. Kennedy, you're positive that you saw this man? Positive, sir. It was only a few moments before the murder that I saw the Avenger. Uh, uh, describe him. Well, he wore a black cape, I believe, and was very gaunt-looking. And was carrying a small handbag. A handbag? Yes, a small, narrow handbag. Such a one as it might contain a knife. <gasps> Oh, and it's in the court. Uh, proceed, Mr. Uh, well, uh, he had a low, hesitating voice. I'd say with something of a covenant accent. An educated man, I'd judge, but quite mad. And what do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Oh, believe me, sir, he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. No. Oh, oh, no, it can't be. It can't be. <gasps> Could there be any doubt about it now? Mr. Sleuth, our lodger, he was the murderer. I got out of the courtroom as quickly as I could. I didn't even notice it had started to rain. I hardly remember going home, running and walking somehow, while the nightmare of fear and terror grew bigger and bigger inside me. It was three streets from our cottage that I saw my husband, Robert. One thought hit me clearly. I realized Daisy must be home alone with the Avenger. Bunting! Bunting! Why, Ellen? Ellen, what is it? Bunting, where's Daisy? Where is she? Where's Daisy? Why, she's at home. Oh, listen, listen, Bunting, listen. Sleuth! Sleuth is the Avenger. What? What are you saying? Ah, oh, larger. He's the Avenger. Daisy's alone with him right now. Hurry! Hurry! Now, listen to me carefully, my child, and, 
and rejoice with me in your heart, for, for the moment is at hand, and you're not afraid, Daisy, are you? No, I'm not afraid. You're very beautiful, and, and you should live in the ways of righteousness. You hear me, Daisy? You want to live in the ways of righteousness, don't you? Yes, yes, I do. I know you do, I, I know, and... And that is why I've been sent to purge your soul so that you will be elevated beyond all sin and evil. You like to dance, Daisy, don't you? Already six have gone on before you and they are beyond all sin and evil. You are the seventh to be elevated, my child, and my work is almost done for the seventh I have promised at this appointed hour. <laughs> Be still, Daisy. And, and don't listen to the temptations of the crowd when they call out your name, because I am here to save you from all evil and wickedness that consumes you like a wildfire of scarlet and crimson. You like to dance, don't you? Yes, I do. Look at me, my child. Look at me and don't fear me. And, and do not tremble. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. And therefore I must bring you down like the lamb to slaughter. And now I lift my hand with a flaming sword. For now comes the vengeance and the time... To Daddy. rejoice! Daddy! Daddy, you killer, Daisy, come here! Come Drop here. that knife, you fiend! Oh, Drop that knife! Oh, you're safe! You're safe! Oh, oh, Drop that knife, you! Take away your hands! Let go of me! Get away! Oh. Don't you know that such that are for death to death, and such that are for a sword to the sword, and no one... No one dare to have pity on him. He... He... Wait, that lady! It's his knife! knife. His knife! Uh. Oh, mercy. Oh, he fell on the knife. Yes. And he's burning. He's burning in me like a fire. Oh, it... It purges me and... And consumes me. All sin and evil are falling away. Praise, praise and glory, for it is I who is the seventh. Yes, the vengeance is fulfilled. <sighs> the makers of Camel cigarettes and free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, U.S. Army Letterman General Hospital, San Francisco, California, U.S. Naval Hospital, Charleston, South Carolina, U.S. Marine Hospital, Ellis Island, New York, Veterans Hospital, Fort Meade, South Dakota. Yes, everywhere, more folks are smoking camels. Many of those camel smokers are doctors. You know, three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you one of the world's great stories of the strange and unusual, The Horla by de Maupassant, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Hey there, 
there, Mr. Pipe Smoker. Do you know that more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco? Well, it's true. So why don't you give PA a try? Prince Albert is specially made for smoking pleasure. It's choice tobacco, specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. See if the extra-rich, full flavor of Prince Albert doesn't give you added interest in your pipe. Be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk music and laughter with Red Foley, Minnie Pearl, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guest this week, you'll hear Salty Holmes. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night, over NBC. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. Next week's play will be The Horla by de Maupassant. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Agnes Moorhead as Ellen, Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Barbara Eiler as Daisy, Eric Snowden as Bunting, Raymond Lawrence as the inspector, Rolf Sedan as the witness, and Conrad Binion as the newsboy. And on behalf of Mr. Laurie and the entire cast, our sincere thanks to Agnes Moorhead for her great portrayal of Ellen Bunting. <laughs> this is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. star of stage and screen, the master of mystery, Boris Karloff, in Creeps by Night. How do you do? This is Boris Karloff, inviting you to join with us for another dramatic exploration into the unknown darkness of the human mind. Our theme tonight is revenge. We have chosen for you a story that plumbs the very depths of one of man's primary emotions. The eternal seeking of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is the story of a man who waited 20 long and heartbreaking years before the opportunity came to seek vengeance. But when it did... He stalked his prey with the cold and horrible stealth of a black panther. Creep by Night presents Boris Karloff as George Miller in The Final Reckoning. Our scene is the warden's office at the state penitentiary. A middle-aged man... His shoulders hunched and his hair prematurely gray. Stands before the warden's desk, clothed in an ill-fitting prison-made suit. His face is yellowed with the pallor of long confinement. But his eyes, set deeply in dark, shadowed hollows, are bright and clear. Looking at him, the warden speaks. Well, I wish you'd reconsider, George. I don't like to see you walk out of here in your condition. 
I'll be all right, Gordon. I'll be a fool. You've just gotten over a bad case of pneumonia. Why not spend an extra week or so in the hospital? Let Doc Reed put you back on your feet. My time is up at noon today, isn't it? Yes, but we're glad to. That's when I'm leaving. The moment that noon whistle blows. You're in no shape to travel. Look at you. You're still sick, man. Deathly sick. I've been sick for almost 20 years, Warden. Ever since those iron gates out there closed behind me. I've waited a lifetime for the cure. Planned for it. Now I'm going to get it. Oh, you're just being stubborn, George. I don't understand it. You've been a model prisoner in every way. In the entire history of the penitentiary, only three men have had life sentences commuted. And you're one of them. And yet, in a matter that concerns your well-being, you act like an obstinate fool. Why? Because I've got something to do. Something very important. Hmm. What's more important than your health? The thing I've got to do. Wait a minute. Are you going to do something that uh, might land you back in here? Is that it? Don't worry, Warden. You know, come to think of it, George, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. Something personal. Go ahead. In all the years you've been here, why have you refused to see visitors or mail? Why did you completely cut yourself off from the outside world? Well, it, it all boils down to this. A man ages a lot in 20 years. His voice changes and his way of talking. His features change. He becomes an entirely different person. Especially in a place like this. Just knowing that you're hemmed in by four walls does something to you. Something... Well, that's the answer. It's no answer at all. Yes, it is. I didn't want anyone to see me age, to see the changes that were coming over me. The way it is now, the George Miller who is walking out of here at 44 is nothing like the George Miller who was brought in at 25. They're two different people. No one outside this prison will ever recognize me. Hmm. And is that what you want? That's exactly what I want. Why? You've got nothing to be ashamed of. You've paid your debt to society. There's another debt I have to pay to myself. It's been owing for a long time. Uh, I don't like the way you're talking, George. What's behind all this? Twenty years, Warden. The best part of my life. A minute ago, you asked me to look at myself. I don't have to look. I can feel it down inside. I'm an old man. An old man at 44. Self-pity is a bad thing, George. I'm not pitying myself. I'm thinking about what brought me here. You've got the record right there in front of you. I said I was innocent then, and it still holds. I'm innocent now. That's a closed book. Why not let it stay closed? Because there's an unfinished chapter still to be written. Remember, you haven't served your full term. You'll be on probation for five years. I'll remember. I've had a long time to think it over. Hmm. Incidentally, while we're at it, there's one more thing that's been puzzling me. You'd better hurry. It's almost noon. Six months ago, when it seemed pretty certain that your commutation was coming through, you made a strange request. You asked to be relieved of the job of running the prison library, a job you'd held as far back as I can remember. And you asked me to assign you uh, as an apprentice to the prison barber. I granted that request, but I, I wondered about it at the time. Would you care to tell me why you suddenly decided to become a barber? I thought it might be a good idea to learn a trade. That's not true, George. There's the noon whistle. That means I'm a free man, doesn't it? Yes. Goodbye, Wharton. Take care of yourself. You haven't answered my question, George. You mean, why did I suddenly decide to become a barber? Yes. I told you. 
I wanted to learn a trade. And I told you that's not the truth. You're right, Warden. It isn't. George Miller's out. No kidding. Yeah, got his sentence commuted. Did they know? If he does, he better start moving. Charlie, this is Duke. I just got tipped off. George Miller's out. Wonder what Ace will do. You want to hear something, honey? George Miller's out. Boy, would I like to see Ace when he gets on those. Well, what'd you learn? It's true, Ace. They commuted his sentence. He got out yesterday. Uh, what did I tell you? I spend a hundred grand a year on smart lawyers. And where do I get my information? From a hophead. A bar fly. But Ace. Oh, sure, sure. I'm out of my mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. George Miller's dead. He died in prison ten years ago. Ah. Eh? Well, that's what they told us. Who told you? Our sources of information. Your sources of information. <laughs> don't make me laugh. Now, look at it. And I'll get out before I lose my temper. If you don't even... Get out, I said. His sources of information. Vera, get me a drink. Oh, hey, Sonny, don't get yourself all upset. Shut up. Hey, Shut Sonny. up and stay out of this. None of your business. Is that a nice way to talk? Who is this George Miller? I said it's none of your business. What's that? Just a doorbell. I'll answer it. Wait a minute. Now what? Don't open that door till you find out who it is. A ball You heard me. Find out who it is first. Okay. Who is it? Who is it? No answer, Ace. Damn. Miller, trying to trick me. Ace, why is the sheet? Take it easy. Keep your voice down. Now listen to me. In case anything happens, he threatened me. I had to protect myself. Do you understand? Yeah, but... Hey, what are you doing with that gun? Never mind. You just follow orders. All right. Open the door. Slowly. Hey, he's hung. Open it, I said. <laughs> Nobody here. What's that on the floor? No! What is it? A rat. A damn rat. <laughs> dead rat outside his door. No, that was yesterday. I mean today. What about today? You got another one? Yeah. It came in a box. In the mail. Holy smoke. Ace is ducking out of town. He's scared stiff. Where's he going? Up to his hideout in the mountains. Take the car out of the back, Chuck. Okay, boss. What about the bag, Dave? Chuck, I'll bring them. Come on. How long have you had this place in the mountains, Dave? Oh, a couple of years. Mm. Sure is gloomy looking. Hell, what did you expect? A summer resort? All I want is a place to hold up. Lay low, the boys get Miller. Well, there should be a bell around here. Somebody in the house? Don't you ever get tired of asking questions, Vera? I told you on the way up there's a caretaker. Ah, the bell doesn't work. Well, if you ask me, this is all a lot of crazy... Nobody's asking you. Hey, Sinelli's running away from a stir bomb. Pipe down. Nobody's coming. Uh, good evening, Mr. Dinelli. Oh, good evening. Is everything all set? Yes, sir. The master bedroom is ready. Now ah, we'll go right up. This is Miss Carroll. How do you do? Hello. You're not the same man was here last year, are you? No, sir. That was Edward, my cousin. He's been ill, and I've been substituting for him. My name is... is Walter. Okay. Bring up a couple of brandies. We'll be upstairs. Yes, sir. I sure hate to be holed up in a place like this for the rest of my life. I'll just say the word, and Chuck will drive you back into town. I just kid me, honey. Well, stop it. Right now, I'm not in a kid mood. Okay. Now, there. What's wrong with this room? Well, it's... Very nice. Plenty of space, four closets, double exposures... 
What more do you want? Nothing, darling. Just a kiss. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Close the door. Since when were you bashful? Now, look, Bela. Get one thing straight. I came up here to play safe. There's a guy gunning for me. Until he's out of the way, I'm not taking any chances. Oh, sure, so I understand, honey. What I don't get is why you're so afraid of this is George Miller, whoever he is. What did you do to him? Yeah. I think I sent him up, put him behind bars. Did you? You know, one of these days, Billy, you're going to ask the wrong question. I know. It's none of my business. That's the ticket. Did you tell me one thing, Ace? What? Those, um, dead rats. When we found outside the apartment door, and the one that came by parcel post in that little wooden coffin. What do they mean? What do you think they mean? I don't know. It's got something to do with George Miller, I guess. Yeah, well, you guessed right. Miller's trying to get me jittery. He knows I've got a bad heart. Planning these things to tell me he thinks I'm a rat. A dead one if he has anything to do with it. Hey, Tom. Now, don't worry. I'm safe up here. The boys will get Miller. Yeah? It's Walter, sir, with your brandy. Okay, okay, come in. Uh, just just put the tray down on the table. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? I guess so. What about our luggage, Ace? Oh, yes. Did my man bring the bags up? Yes, sir. They're in the hallway, sir. Well, bring them in, will you? Yes, sir. Soda or water, Ace? Yeah, I'll take it straight. Where shall I put the bags, sir? Oh, just set them down any place. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? Yeah. And uh, don't forget to lock up. I won't, sir. Good night. 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 Oh, that yes and no sir, routine is going to drive me nuts. He talks like one of those fancy movie butlers. Looks like a zombie. <laughs> Here's your drink, honey. Yeah. How about you? No, I better get the bags unpacked first. Oh, the stuff would be wrinkled. Well, here's how. I needed that drink. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, maybe I can relax. Sit down and take it easy, honey. You know, it's not going to be so bad staying up here for a week or two. Hey, how do you open this bag, Ace? Which one? Yours. Black leather. Oh, there's a little gadget on the lock. Just press it and it snaps open. You got it? Uh-huh. And we'll get a good rest. Woo! What's the matter? Look! The bag. What? Another dead rat. <laughs> Chuck, talk, you double-dealing skunk, or I'll set your skull. Please believe me, I, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. Talk, I said, spell it. I, I ain't got nothing to spell. Now listen, Chuck, no. I know your kind. No. I know them from way back. You'd sell your mother for cash on the line. George Miller got to you. No. He paid you to slip that dead rat into my suitcase. No. 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 I don't trust you either. I don't trust anybody. You're all a bunch of blood-sucking double-crossers. Boy. You heard me. You'd like to see me dead, wouldn't you? Get out of your mind. Now, get out, both of you. No. Get out, I said. Get out of the house. I stay out. Yeah, who is it? It's Walter, sir, with your brandy. Now, oh, bring it in. This is the last bottle, sir. Yeah, I'll put it down. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's all. <laughs> It's Walter, sir. Come in. I thought perhaps you'd like something to eat, sir. It's been three days since you've taken any solid food. Yeah. Three days. I brought an omelette and some toast. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Walter. Quite all right, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? You were pretty nice to me, Walter. Thank you, sir. Yeah, pretty nice. And I'm the kind of a guy who don't forget. I don't forget if a guy's nice to me. And I don't forget if he stabs me in the back. Neither do I, sir. Come in. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Ah, it's all right, it's all right. Come on in and close the door. Yes, sir. What do you got there, Walla? Well, I thought now that you're feeling a little better, sir, that perhaps you'd like to be shaved. It's been almost a week, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me you're a barber, too. I have been a barber, sir. Well, I could use a shave, I guess, all right. If I may say so, sir, 
I think you'll find it very refreshing. Okay, go ahead. Where do you want me? The chair you're sitting in will be all right, sir. I'll get some warm water in the bathroom. You know what? I've been thinking. When I go back into town, I'm going to take you with me. Yeah, I could use a man like you. That's very kind of you, sir. I like people like you around me. People who don't ask questions of getting your hair. Take care of what you're supposed to, and that's the end of it. I try to keep my place, sir. <laughs> You've got the right idea. And what I do, lean back? In just a moment, sir. I'll have to fasten the strop to the back of the chair. I want the razor good and sharp. <laughs> You'll need it sharp for this beard. Yes, sir. You must have been wondering about me these last few days, Warren. No, sir. Not particularly. You mean you wouldn't like to know why I've been hiding out here in the mountains? I'm sure you must have a good reason, sir. Yeah, you can say that again. Someone's gunning for me. Gunning for you? Uh-huh. Somebody trying to get me. Guy named Miller. George Miller. The name sounds familiar. He got a life sentence for murder about 20 years ago. Yeah, there was quite a story on other papers. He killed a girl. Did he? That's what the jury thought. He gave him first degree with a recommendation for mercy. That saved him from the chair. What did you think? What did I think about what? Lean back, sir. I'm almost ready for you. Hey, isn't that razor sharp enough yet? Not quite. I haven't used it in some time. What did you think about George Miller's conviction, sir? Ah, uh, what's the difference what I thought? The jury cooked his goose. Did they? Yep. Oh, come on, come on. What are you going to shave me get to it? I'm ready now. Lean back, sir. I'll soap you up. Okay. I assume this... This George Miller is out of prison now. Yeah. Got a commutation. Hey, you sure you don't need a lawnmower to get this beard off? I can do very well with a razor, sir. You know, I'm going to feel like a new man when you get through. Yes? A completely new man. <laughs> ah, you're a funny guy, Waller. You talk like a college professor. I've had a lot of time to read and study in the past 20 years. A lot of time. Yeah? That's enough soap. Now just relax, sir. Does the razor pull... Nope. Feels all right. That's fine. Nothing like a good, sharp razor. Yeah. Now, don't move. It's rather difficult shaving you in this chair. If you move, I may cut your throat. That's not funny. It wasn't meant to be funny, Ace. What did you say? Sit back, Ace. One slip and you're finished. You're a dead rat. George Miller. That's right. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Ace? George. George, you wouldn't kill me in cold blood, would you? This isn't cold blood, Ace. This is hot blood, heated for 20 years. That's how long I've waited. Feel how sharp the razor is. No. No, George. Be careful. It doesn't take much to split a throat from ear to ear. You know that. Yeah, George. George, I'll give you anything you want. Name your price. You couldn't meet it. Only one thing can pay for those George. 20 years. Hey, George, I've got a bad heart, you know. Yes, so I've heard. All I'm asking for is a break. Did you give me a break when you framed me and set me up for life? I figured you'd beat the rap. I never thought they'd convict you. Then you admit framing me. Yeah, yeah, but I never figured you admit that you killed the McGuire girl because she knew too much, because you wanted her out of the way. Yeah, yeah, but that's I... nothing. It's more than enough. Now feel the razor on your throat. 
Cutting. No, George. No. Cutting deeper. Down deeper. You said you'd be a new man when this was over. But you're wrong, Ace. You're only a dead rat. Who is it? It's there, Ace. I've come back. Come in, Miss Carroll. Oh, hello, Walter. Is Mr. Dinelli... Oh, there he is. You're shaking. Ace, darling. I couldn't stand being away from you. I had to come back. I, cu- I couldn't... Walter... What's the matter with him? Is he asleep or something? I'm afraid not, Miss Gallon. Why is he slumped in the chair? Why is his eyes staring that way? Why doesn't he move? He can't move. He's dead. Dead? Oh, no. Walter. Yes, he's dead. And my name isn't Walter, Miss Carroll. My name is George Miller. George Miller? George Miller? Yes. Then you... You... You killed him? No, Miss Carroll, I did not kill him. You don't see any blood, do you? But he's dead. You said he was dead. I'm afraid I played rather a gruesome joke on him. You see... I was shaving him with a very sharp razor. After I told him who I was, I held the back of the blade, the dull side, against his throat. <laughs> As you know, he he had a bad heart. Unfortunately, it, it couldn't stand the strain. You murdered him? You got the chair for this? You're wrong, Miss Carroll, quite wrong. Ace Janelli died of a heart attack. That's what a medical autopsy will show. But you caused it. You brought it on. That would be very difficult to prove. I figured this out so carefully, Miss Carroll. I paid with 20 years of my life for a murder I did not commit. And now there's nothing the law can do to me. For one that I did commit. <laughs> Just brought to you Boris Karloff in The Final Reckoning. Be with us again next Tuesday night at the same time over most of these stations when Mr. Karloff will present another weird mystery of the mind, The Hunt. is directed by Dave Drummond. Original music is composed and conducted by Al Sachs. The entire production is under the supervision of Robert Maxwell. Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Peter Lorre, playing the part of the Hungarian Count Stefan Kahari, a gentleman of sinister aspect. The story is by John Dixon Carr, who calls it The Devil's Saint. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded in mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, 
and then withhold the solution till the last possible moment. And so, it is with The Devil's Saint and Mr. Peter Lorre's performance we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The Devil's Saint. Paris, 15 years ago. Paris as it used to be, when lights twinkle from the old Trocadero to the hill of Sacre Coeur, when taxicabs honked and the beat of tango swayed, and Chinese lanterns gleamed above the lake in the Bois, when, in short, you and I were young. Come then to the President's Ball at the Opera, St. Catherine's Day, 1927. A fancy dress ball at the opera, filling these marble halls with a multitude of masks and a multitude of dreams. The mosaic decorations are no less bright than the colors that weave here. Harlequins and Columbine, Cleopatra and Musketeers. In the great marble foyer, remember it? They have set out little tables and lines of palms behind which you may sit screened. Look at one such table. A young man wearing the scarlet and gold uniform of an English guards officer in Wellington's day. A dark-haired young girl in the costume of a Bacante. (laughs) And as we approach... Ned, don't please. You mustn't. Why not? You really don't mind, do you? No, of course I don't mind. Only you mustn't. Oh, Ned. Look here, Alona. We've got to settle this thing. You have enjoyed being here tonight, haven't you? Ned, I've loved it. After being cooped up at my uncle's place in the country, it's like heaven. All right. When I take you back to the hotel, I'm going to face this uncle of yours tonight. No. No, please don't. I'm going to say that you and I intend to get married, and that's that. I can't marry you, Ned. I've told you that. But why not? Just give me one good reason. Because I can't. My uncle... He would never allow it. Never. And that seems to you a good reason enough? Yes, Ned. This uncle of yours, uh, what's his name? Count Stefan Kohari. He's a Hungarian, I think you said. Yes, so am I. My mother was an American. What's he like, actually? Oh, he's a little eccentric. Mm -hmm. Oh, please don't misunderstand. He's a great scholar and a historian, only... He's a little strange. He... Ned. What is it? There he is now. Your uncle? Yes, that elegant man in plain evening clothes with the order of the golden fleece across his chest. Oh, I see him. Oh, he looks as black as a thundercloud. He's throwing those two dressed as devils aside as though they didn't exist. Give me my mask quick before he sees us. No, Alona. Why not? We'd better face this out now. Sit still. Good evening, Ilona. Good evening, Uncle Stefan. Uncle... May I present Edward Whiteford? How do you do, sir? How do you do? Ilona, do you think that costume is quite the thing to wear in public? Why not? Well, an older generation might call it immodest. It looks like... Like uh, what? Nothing. Will you go and get your cloak or your domino or whatever you wore here? Uncle, please don't make me go home so soon. It's hardly 11 o'clock. I was not asking you to go home, my dear. I was merely asking you to put on a wrap. All right, I'll get it. You stay and talk to Ned. I shall be delighted. Will you sit down, sir? Thank you. (laughs) You seem to have quite a gathering at this table. Yes. Some friends of mine from the embassy, they're upstairs dancing now. (laughs) Well, (laughs) look, glasses, glasses, and still more glasses. (laughs) You know, I was quite an addict once at uh, musical glasses. Have you ever tried it, young man? (laughs) Well, it's very easy. You take a spoon like this, you see, and... <laughs> like it? Well, forgive me, sir, but there's something I'd like to ask you. Yes? Well, I don't know exactly how to say this, so I'd better say it in the shortest way. I want to marry your niece. Well, look out, sir. You smashed one of the glasses. A few francs will pay for that. But there are other things of higher value. At least to me. Well, maybe I ought to mention first that my full name is Lord Edward Whiteford. My father's the Earl of Grey. Indeed. <laughs> well, I only mention that to show we're, well, respectable enough. Or well, the British ambassador will vouch for me, sir, if you'd like to ring him up. And perhaps I ought to mention that uh, I've always kept Ilona carefully guarded from the world. Almost too carefully guarded, don't you think? That, Lord Edward, depends on my reasons. Sorry, sir. You have known Ilona about how long? 
four days. Four days. You wouldn't even choose a business partner in four days. Yet to want to marry my Ilona after four days. But we know our own minds, sir. You do, huh? <laughs> then you know more than the wisest man in this world. However, as one whose dearest wish is Ilona's happiness, I... I hope it is, Count Kahari. Do you doubt what I say? Oh, no, sir. <laughs> well, I will make you a proposition. I own an estate in Turin, not far from Paris, sir. A little chateau, a few hundred acres, fishing. Very good stable of horses. Yes, I know, Lona told me. Well, she did. Well, then here is my suggestion. Why not come down and visit us for a week or two? Oh, that's very decent of you, sir. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> and uh, if at the end of that time you're not cured of this infatuation... Oh, it's not an infatuation, I swear it's not. No? Well, if at the end of that time you're not cured uh, permanently of this feeling, you may take Ilona. And with my blessing, that's fair, isn't it? Oh, it's more than fair, Uncle Harry. I don't know how to thank you. Oh, well, please, don't even try. <laughs> and at least I can promise you a very interesting experience. You see, at the Chateau d'Azé, there is one certain bedroom. We call it the tapestry room. Yes? Well, uh, I assure you, it'll be very interesting for you to sleep in that room. Why? Is it haunted or something? Oh, no. No, 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 not haunted. <laughs> well, now, if you don't mind, I shall say good night, and I hope I can trust you to bring Ilona safely to the hotel. Au revoir. Look over there. What is it, sir? Just look. Streams of our fellow guests pouring down the main staircase. Shapes of nightmare, shapes of delirium, insane dead masks. Only the eyes move. Wouldn't we be terrified, perhaps, if we would look behind those gargoyle faces? Oh, no, I don't think so. They're only ordinary people like ourselves. That, sir, is uh, where you make your mistake. Well, I shall expect you for the weekend and uh, encore une fois. Au revoir. Ned, Ned. It's all right, Alona. You can come out from behind those palms. What was he saying? I couldn't hear. Alona, it couldn't be better. Well, he's a very decent old boy, actually. And he's invited me to the Chateau d'Azé. Did he say anything about the tapestry room? Yes. He invited me to sleep there. And you said? I said I would, naturally. You mustn't do it, Ned. I won't let you do it. But why the devil not? Because everybody who sleeps in that room dies. Dies? Are you serious? Oh, Ned, please don't do it. Oh, nonsense. There are a lot of superstitions about every old house. This isn't a superstition, Ned. It happened once when I was a little girl. A man insisted on sleeping there. They found him dead in the morning. So? How did he die? They don't know. There wasn't a mark on his body. He wasn't shot or stabbed or strangled or poisoned or hurt in any way. He was just dead. Two nights later, in the province of France, now known as Andre et Laware, but once called Touraine, the ancient land beloved of Rabelais and Balzac. But now, as the wind moans down the valleys, and rain flickers across the apple trees and thunder stirs in those haunted hills. It can bring little comfort to a young man driven in an ancient carriage from the railway station along snake-like roads. To what destination? Ahead, a lift of lightning shows the gray walls and conical slate roof towers of a chateau set some distance back from the road. Light shine from its narrow windows, dimly seen through the rain as... Driver! Coachman! Oui, monsieur. Is that the Chateau d'Azé up ahead? Oui, monsieur. I will take you to the very door if... Uh... If what? Why do you cross yourself? If I am permitted. What should stop you? Only fear, monsieur. And I am not much afraid. Just... What's that? Only the dogs, monsieur. They keep many dogs, large dogs, at the Chateau d'Azé. 
Well, here we are. Bonsoir, monsieur. And if I may be permitted a word of advice, well, beware of the tapestry room. There isn't a bell on this door. There might at least be a knocker. Ah, oh, got it. Et alors, monsieur? Vous cherchez? Je cherche le château d'Azé. Et je. je, uh, je uh... Uh, perhaps it would be better if monsieur spoke English, yes? You are Lord Edward Whitefall. Yes. Monsieur is expected. Please to enter. Monsieur's at and co. Thank you. Ned. Hello, Elona. Oh, I brought the farm up a teat for the uncle. Oh, you'd better not kiss me, Ned. Madame Flay says to look out for my uncle. Madame Flay is our housekeeper. Oh. Well, where's your uncle now? In the drawing room. He's playing the piano. Come along. Elona, is anything wrong? Oh, everything's wrong. Two of my dogs were in horrible pain this afternoon. Dr. Solomon had to put them out with chloroform. You don't think that... I hope nobody's practicing, that's all. Well, here we are. Oh, nice tiger skins on the floor. I say, who's the little old man with the gray beard sitting over there by the fire? That's Dr. Solomon. Oh, doesn't he have funny-looking eyes? He watches and watches and watches. He's an old friend of the family. Shh, come along. Let's get this over with. Ah, Lord Edward. <laughs> well, I see my niece has anticipated me. Welcome to the Chateau d'Azé. Thank you, Count Harry. Oh, you must be very wet after your long drive. Go up to the fire and warm yourself. Uh, uh, Madame Flay. Yes, monsieur. Uh, please tell Antoine to take our guest's luggage up to the tapestry room. The tapestry room, monsieur? That is what I said, Madame Flay. Yes, monsieur. By an odd coincidence, Lord Edward, uh, Dr. Solomon and I were just discussing the fate of the last person who slept in a tapestry room. This is not good, my friend. This is against my advice. <laughs> it's against his advice. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon croaked. This is not good, I tell you. It is the wrong season of the moon. Uh, the wrong moon. <laughs> but there is no moon tonight. It's raining cats and dogs. Don't talk about dogs. Nevertheless, it is the wrong season of the moon. I say no more. Cheerful blunder, that doctor. Don't do it, Ned. I won't be responsible if they make you do it. But uh, look here, Count Kohari. What did happen to the last bloke who slept in the tapestry You mustn't call him a bloke, sir. He was a very saintly gentleman. The Bishop of Tours. That was some time ago when Delona was only 15 years old, but uh, surely she must remember it. I remember it. The church, said our bishop, has no use for superstitions. Well, <laughs> he insisted on sleeping there. I, I made it as comfortable for him as possible, but he was found dead next morning with a crucifix still in his hand. Was it poison? There was no poison, monsieur. No. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. It's true, Ned. Well, there were just two very curious things. You see, in uh, connection with that death, on a mantelpiece there was found burning a stick of incense. Just ordinary incense, nothing wrong with it. Yes, sir. And uh, under the dressing table, the police found it was an empty jar of ointment. Now, here's your wits. A dead man... Some burning incense in an empty jar of ointment. What do you make of that? Oh, I don't make anything of it. It's crazy. Please do not speak like that. I'm sorry? It is still the wrong season of the moon. <laughs> well, what I really meant, sir, was this. Is, is there any reason for this story of death? A reason? Uh, any legend attached to the room or anything like that? Yes, there is. Well, sir? Well, we are a very old family, Lord Edward. Old and perhaps accursed. When my ancestors moved from Hungary to France in the 17th century, they brought certain beliefs with them. The old religion. The old religion? Yes, the cult of Diana. The cult of Janus. 
the cult of freedom and fertility. The witch cult, if you prefer. Oh, now look here, sir. Must we talk about this? Well, you smile, but uh, when I see the word witch, you think of some humorous picture on a Halloween's card. It was very different in the Middle Ages, believe me. Then, my friend, there existed an organized religion which rivaled the church. There were many to worship unashamed at the Grand Sabbath. Many to receive all favors from Saturn, their master, and to dance forever, joyously in the red, flaming quadrilles of hell. Some 200 years ago, an ancestress of mine, Katerina Kohari, was tortured to death in a tapestry room for professing the old religion. Many persons have not thought it safe to sleep there since. Are you answered? Oh, come, sir. This is some kind of elaborate joke. Hmm? Joke? The Bishop of Tours did not find it a joke. Not the mark on his body. I assure you as a physician, not the mark on his body. <laughs> no, not a mark on his body. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. Yes, I hear him. Well, understand me, Lord Edward, there's no compulsion in this. If you do wish to sleep in that room, all right? Oh, if you ridiculous. don't, ridiculous. I'm not afraid to sleep there, sir. Well, I thought perhaps you want to change your mind. Oh, never. Would you like me to make a wager on that? What sort of wager? Well, if I spend the night in this famous room and come out of it alive... Yes? Will you give your consent to the marriage immediately? Tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning? Why? Because I don't think the atmosphere of this house is good for a loner. What do you say? Will you do it? Very well, Lord Edward. I accept the terms of your wager. Don't do it, Ned. For the love of heaven, don't do it. High up in the north tower of the Chateau de Zay, under the conical slate roof is the circular room hung with faded tapestries. These tapestries move slightly with uneasy mimic life to the clamor of the storm outside. Candles burn along the mantelpiece and beside the great four-poster bed. The flames of these candles waver too as the door opens. This is the tapestry room, monsieur. Thank you, Madame Flay. That is the mantelpiece where the incense burn. That is the bed where Monsignor le Bishop died. Very inviting, isn't it? Will there be anything else Monsieur requires? Some sandwiches, a decanter of whiskey? Oh, no, thanks. I had a drink with the Count Cahari before I came upstairs. Pierre, Monsieur? Uh, Monsieur's shaving water will be brought up in the morning. If he requires it. Good night. Hoppy. Trying to scare a fellow out of his wits just because... Oh, I hope they built a good fire anyway. Didn't realize how cold it was. Temperature must have dropped. What's that? It's me, Elona. May I come in? No, Elona. Get out of here. That's not very gallant of you. No, I mean, I, I don't want you exposed to whatever it is. Ned, listen. Are you going to bed? Or are you going to sit up all night? I'm going to sit up all night, naturally. Then... Let me sit up with you. No. Why not? Well, it may be dangerous. Besides, I promised your uncle I'd go through with this alone. I wish you hadn't had that drink with him. Why? He couldn't have done anything to it. It was you who poured it. Yes, that's true, what? only... Listen. What is that? It sounds like footsteps. Yes, but where's it coming from? Seems to be right here in the room. It seems to come from all directions. Doesn't it sound like somebody walking between the walls? By George, it is someone walking inside the wall. Get behind that tapestry, Lona. Quick. Hide there. Yes. Count Kohari. Where did you come from? Oh, forgive me, Lord Edward, for uh, seeming to appear out of the wall and between the tapestries. <laughs> Like Mephisto appearing too fast, huh? 
And this red dressing gown perhaps adds to the effect, too. <laughs> How'd you get here? A passage between the walls? Yes, exactly. A little device my ancestors for visiting this room. You know, they invented that when its occupant was so unmannerly as to bolt the door. <laughs> Door's not bolted. You could have walked straight in. But I couldn't have done it unobserved. No. Maybe not. Have you had any other visitors, Lord Edward? No. Are you quite sure of that? Quite sure. Well, then, uh, since nobody saw me come here, I'll just sit down by the fire. <laughs> Please sit opposite me. Is this the showdown, sir? Hmm? I don't understand. Well, there's got to be a showdown between us. Is that why you're here? Oh, I'm here, young man, to explain certain things to you. Uh, will you have a cigarette? Thank you. I... Oh, <laughs> they're perfectly all right. That is what you're afraid of? I'll have one, yes. A light? Thank you. Well, when I was discussing the witch cult a while ago, you didn't appear to think I meant what I said. Do you want a perfectly frank answer to that? Yes. I think you're mad enough to mean anything. <laughs> mm. What you say, in a sense, is quite true. Seeing an old and uh, inbred family like ours, the mind can crack in the fantasies of witchcraft become as real, well, more real than the living world. Let me give you an example. Go on. The saucer on the table beside you is Ming porcelain. It was once owned by Katerina Kohari, a martyr of the old religion. Yet you are using it as an ash tree. Oh, I beg the witch lady's pardon. I'll blow off the ash. Well, that's a very dangerous remark, sir. Don't you understand that the worship of evil can be as strong and compelling as the worship of good, that the devil can have his saints too, that to a sick brain which knows but can't help itself, you have profaned this room, merely bantering it, and therefore you deserve to die. Like the Bishop of Tours? Exactly. You're not going to tell me the devil killed him. The devil's agent may be flesh and blood. Then it was murder. Oh, of course it was murder. Murder? so cunningly contrived that no one ever saw through it. Go on. I asked you before to use your wits on this problem. Well, look, incense was burned in this room. You know why? Suppose you tell me. Well, obviously, I think, to conceal something else, which would be too easily noticed. To conceal what? For instance, the smell of chloroform. Chloroform? Yes. A drug not really well understood by layman. Dr. Solomon, by the way, was using chloroform this afternoon to dispose of some dogs. So I've heard. Well, Dr. Solomon is old and uh, very forgetful. You mean chloroform could be stolen? Oh, yes, it could be easily. Now, suppose, I mean, just suppose I take a pad saturated with chloroform. I place it over the mouth and nostrils of a man already sleeping or drugged so that he gets no air. Wait a minute. That... that won't do. Why not? Chloroform burns and blisters when it touches the skin. You'd leave marks. Oh, not at all, my friend. Not at all. If I first covered the mouth and nostrils with some substance like... Uh, Ointment. Yes. Now you're waking up. Hi. Now observe what follows. In a few seconds, unconsciousness. In two minutes or three minutes, death. Certain death, yes. Oh, but chloroform, you see. <laughs> it evaporates very quickly. There is no trace in the stomach since nothing has been swallowed. Well, delay your post-mortem for 24 hours. Very easy matter in these country districts, and no trace remains in the blood. Murder without a mark, Lord Edward. Murder without a mark. You can't do it, Count Kohani. There's one thing you're forgetting. What is that? I'm not sleeping and I'm not drugged. Oh, yes, you are. How? When? In the cigarette? Hmm? No. In a drink you had with me. What was it? Morphine. And you've had enough to put three men to sleep. Ah. <gasps> See, that's it. Well, try to get up. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you see? You've knocked over the fire irons. You'd have been in a fire yourself if I hadn't caught Take you. Take your hands off me. Just as you please. Oh, if I could reach that bell pull. Well, but you can't. Well, better sit down again. You murdering lunatic. 
So that's how you killed the Bishop of Tours. And that's how you're going to kill me. Who, I? Well, you don't think I killed the Bishop of Tours? Didn't you? You fool. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to save you. Dr. Solomon. Yes, Monsieur. Well, come out, come out, come in the room. Come out and be my witness. Yes, Monsieur. I shall always guard the family honor. Even when I guess how men die. This young man evidently thinks I've been talking about myself. Am I in a popular parlance insane? Oh, monsieur. Heaven forbid. I have never known a saner man. Have you any notion, Lord Edward, why I brought you to this house? You would never have believed me if I had merely told you. So I had to bring you here to show you. Show me what? What? <laughs> Uh, look, look at the tapestries. Come out of there. Behind them. Come out of there. Hey, come out. Ilona. Yes. Yes, Ilona. Why do you think I've kept Ilona so well guarded from the world? Why, at a fancy dress ball, for instance, did I object to the costume of a medieval witch whose dogs were poisoned so that chloroform should be brought? Who poured the drink? Drugged with morphine. In the devil's name, what are you trying to tell me? It was Ilona. <laughs> She's been helplessly, hopelessly insane for more than ten years. <laughs> Closes The Devil's Saint, starring Peter Lorre. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity the man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking that I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days. But I did not speak, because I knew what Philip Gentry would do, what he had to do, criminal and murderer, though he was. <laughs> Thank you.
Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, Beyond Good and Evil, starring Peter Lorre, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, try a camel. Let your T-zone decide. That's T for taste and T for throat. Your proving ground for any cigarette. Let your T-zone decide if camels' rich, full flavor and cool mildness aren't just made to order for enjoyment. Yes, try a camel. And be sure to have a carton of camels on hand for the long weekend coming up. Why, Reverend Pierce. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Is Reverend McKillop still awake? Oh, yes. We don't put him to bed until eight or later. Evening service over already? Is it over? (laughs) Shame on you, Lucy, a parson's daughter, and you forget there is no service on Wednesdays. Of course. You've come to read to Father. Well, there's so little I can do. Uh, If he were able to let us know in some way... I can tell by his eyes. Whenever you're here, they fairly glow. Oh, I, I suppose that helpless as he is, not able to speak or even to write, my... My visits are at least a diversion. You're much more than a diversion. You're his hope. No, Lucy. The Lord is his hope. Oh, yes. The Lord struck him down with paralysis, and and in time the Lord will surely free him from it. Well, I'll go in and try to cheer him up. Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Yes, McKillop, you hang on my every word, and and you never talk back. You never have, except once, and and after tonight, you won't get the chance. Huh? Speak up, Reverend, why don't you? No, of course, the cat's got your tongue, huh? Yes, tonight is your last chance, Reverend. Tonight is the consummation, finish, the end, act three curtain on a great play about death and redemption, about good and evil. And I won't shrink from your eyes, McKillop, see? Your eyes can't kill, but I can kill. I have the mind and the will and the hands. I've killed one man, that you know. And tonight, tonight I am going to kill again. Yes, Reverend McKillop, you know who I was before I became the Reverend Howard Pierce, pastor of this good and godly community. And you know my real name, it's Philip Gentry, but, but you never knew the soul of Philip Gentry, the, the contempt, the sum of evil that was in me that night. It all began, yes, it's, it's now three months ago. What a stormy night. I, I was crouching in a swamp with a man named Mac. Because we had just escaped from prison, hiding like animals in the deep mud and ooze, alien from the whole entire human race. Gentry, where are you going? To the highway, you idiot. Got to make time before daylight. Yeah. Before the rain stops. They'll bring out the bloodhounds in the morning. Yeah, okay, okay, you're the boss. There's the highway now. They have to be on the fence. Well, so what do we do now? Where do we go? Straight up. I'll meet you in Chicago later. Uh, at Gus's place? Yes, at Gus's place in two or three weeks when a manhunt cools off. You, you won't let me down, will you, Gentry? I said I'll meet you. Now get moving. Go on, fast. I walked a mile and, and then I saw a car. It, it was parked close to the edge of the road. It's... Its headlights almost blacked out by the rain. And, and then, at the a glow of what I knew was a flashlight, I, I saw a man bending into the rain, struggling to change a tire. He, he was alone, so I walked up to him. 
Hello. Uh, uh, Need help? Oh, oh, you startled me. I'm sorry. I didn't expect to see anyone this late. Picked a bad night for a flat. Yes, and it's the second today. I'm going to be awfully late. Here, uh, come on, let me help. Oh, no, 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 thank you. But if you would hold the light. Oh, sure. Come a long way? Uh, Yes, from Detroit. I'm on my way to Carlton. I was supposed to get there this afternoon. I'm the new minister there. Uh, My name's Pierce. Didn't notice you were a preacher. Yes, I'm taking over for old Reverend McKillop at Grace Church. He's been in bad health, so I'm taking his place. Yes. Oh, my, this this boat is stubborn. I I, I can't seem to get it. Come on, let me have the range. Uh, No, no, really, just just hold the line. I said give me the range. Well, all right, it's awfully good of you. Come on, give it to me. No, 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 wait. I need wait, what your are you doing? car, Everett. No, Pierce. no, You please. are going to be please. even later no. than no. you thought. No. Oh. Be quiet, no. you. I hit him twice, and I can't tell you now, Reverend McKillop, what I thought when it wrench big into flesh and bone, or I swear to you that it was not my intention to kill, and, and yet I... I did. I I killed, yes. When I put my hand on his chest, the heart had stopped, and and the Reverend Howard Pierce was dead. Yes. Reverend Pierce was dead. <laughs> Very dead, so so I buried him. I buried him in my prison clothes, and soon I I was dressed in his clothes. Oh, I had on his decent black and turned around collar, and, and I was rolling this way. And at the city limits of Carlton, my own destiny stepped in. I was stopped by a traffic cop. Let me see your license, buddy. A license? Oh, yeah, I... I'm a, here. Here it is. Uh, Howard Pierce. Occupation... Hmm? Oh, minister. I didn't notice. Well, what is it, officer? Is that speeding? No, no, we're checking all cars on this road. There was a break at the state pen. Two prisoners escaped. They might come this way. I see. But I won't hold you up any longer, Reverend. You uh, going far? Oh, no. uh, Carlton. Say, this is Carlton. It is? (laughs) Oh, yes, there's the sign. Say, I get it. (laughs) Imagine me not catching on right away. Catching on? Sure, you must be the new preacher for Grace Church. Oh, yes, I am. (laughs) Well, I'm Charlie Owen. I I sing in the Grace Church choir, baritone. Uh, You going to the parsonage now? Yes, I was. Well, it's a little tricky finding it. I'm going into headquarters now, and I have to go right by Reverend McKillop's house. Oh, that's nice. You follow me. Thank you, son. It's very nice of you. Hello there, Lucy. Why, hello, Charlie. Guess who I'm delivering to you? It's Reverend Pierce. He's just getting out of the car. Who are you expecting, Lucy? The boyfriend? You mean my fiancé, Mr. Tom Hubbard? (laughs) When are you two going to get married, anyway? You know, everybody in... Oh, here's Reverend Pierce. Uh, Reverend Pierce, here's Lucy, Reverend McKillop's daughter. How do you do? Oh, come in, come in, Reverend Pierce. Father and I have been so worried. We expected you all afternoon. Oh, I had two flat tires. Oh, what a shame. Well, Father's waiting up for you in his study. Father, Charlie Owen brought Reverend Pierce. Reverend Pierce? Well, come in, come in. Uh, you and Mr. Owen wait outside for a few minutes, Lucy. All right, Sure, Father. sir. <laughs> Sit over here, Reverend Pierce. Thank you, sir. I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you. I really couldn't bring myself to sleep tonight without first talking to you. You see... The situation's serious. Serious? serious. Why, Reverend? My health. I'm a sick man. I've had one stroke as I wrote you. Oh, yeah. I know. Well, I could have another one at any time. The doctor says a worse one. And I feel it essential that the work of the parish should be in firm hands. This parish needs a young man. Well, I I hope to be of service, sir. I've heard only good of you, Reverend Pierce. Thank you. And you know you're even younger than you look. Oh, really? In the picture you sent. Uh, Darker, too. Your, your hair. I'm afraid it, uh, it wasn't a very good liking. I have the picture here somewhere on my desk with your letters. What did you want uh, to talk to me about, Reverend McKillop? Oh, all the work of the parish. Oh, yes, here's the photograph. It's, uh... It... Something Reverend wrong, Pierce. Reverend McKillop? It's not... Who it's are you? Not what? This isn't your picture. Who are you? I don't think that should interest you. It's Something's, something's happened to Reverend Pierce. McKillop. What did you do to him? You're... What? You're... What do you think I did, Reverend McKillop, huh? Come on, go on, guess. 
guess, don't you hear me? Come on, don't you play with me, you you sanctimonious fool. You come on, speak up. Speak up. What's the matter with you? Oh, don't tell me you had another stroke, huh? That's right. You, you can't speak, huh? Is that it? Well, I'll find out. And in any case, I'll take that picture of him, McKillop. And, and now, if Reverend you don't. Pierce, we thought. Oh. Yes, Lucy, uh, something has happened to your father. We, we were talking, and. and... <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm afraid it's another stroke. He, he can't speak, and apparently he can't move. Father. Father. What can we do? Lucy, we, we'll have to wait for the doctor and, and maybe even Danny. I know. The doctor said he could be paralyzed for months and years. But he mustn't die. No, no. If we have faith, the Lord will spare him. And, and until the good Lord returns his health, uh, I'll try to shepherd his flock. Yes, and and since that first time, Reverend McKillop, you've never opened your mouth again. Oh, you can stare, yes. Stare as hard as you want. That doesn't bother me. Because your stare cannot kill. But but I, as you know, I can. And I will, Reverend McKillop. Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present act two of Beyond Good and... Ask a sports champ in any field what helped him most toward success and he'll probably say experience. Yes, experience is the best teacher. Take bronc riding champ Jerry Ambler. His most recently won sports crown is the saddle bronc championship of the world. Experience? Why, say, Jerry's been riding Bronx for 18 years. Yes, as he recently said, experience is the best teacher. In Bronx riding and in smoking, too. A cigarette for me is camel. And there, Jerry's like thousands and thousands of other cigarette smokers who smoke just about all the different brands during the wartime cigarette shortage. Well, experience like that was bound to make people experts in judging the differences in cigarette quality. And on the basis of that experience... Thousands and thousands of people decided they liked camels best. Yes, they learned that for rich, full flavor and cool mildness, the cigarette for them is camel. As a result, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. <laughs> Reverend McKillop, aging, paralyzed, unable to speak, listens helplessly as Philip Gentry, criminal and murderer, explains why he killed Reverend Pierce and assumed Pierce's clothes and identity and describes his first sermon. And so, in conclusion, dear friends, remember the agony of our Lord was shared by two thieves, and they were crucified beside him that he might be numbered among the transgressors. And remember his words to one. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. (coughs) Now we will sing hymn 426, Just as I am without one plea. That was my first sermon, Reverend McKillop. Oh, I saw your eyes when Lucy told you how, how deeply moved the congregation was. Oh, you couldn't understand, you just couldn't, how such a thing could be done without faith. Oh, but, but I have been a lawyer, and, and I have done a lot without faith, yes. I have been the ideal parson you were looking for. I, oh, I wish you could ask young Hubbard. Uh, you don't know he called on me, huh? Reverend Pierce? Yes. I missed your first service, Reverend. 
I thought I ought to pay you a call. My name's Hubbard. Oh, yes, I know, I know. You're in the choir. Come on. Come in, Mr. Hubbard. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. What's your business, Mr. Hubbard? Uh, I work at the bank. I'm chief teller. Chief teller, huh? A very responsible job for a young man like you. I suppose it is, but I don't have much more responsibility than the other tellers, except at the end of the month. Oh. Then it's a strain. End of the month? What? Well, sure, that's when I have to... Yes? <sighs> You know, I, I've never told anyone about oh, this. Please. And so even with you, well, I... Well, if it's confidential. Well, no, no, naturally not so far as you're concerned, Reverend mm-hmm. Pierce. Uh-huh. Um, you see, the 30th of the month, we move all our deposits to the Federal Reserve Bank. Yes. Um, $200,000 or more. So you can see how I wouldn't want some people to know that. You mean you, you have to take the deposits alone? To... Oh, no, no. Gosh, no, that'd be even worse than it is. No, there's an armored truck that oh, comes to well. take the money. Surely the bank takes adequate precautions. I'm well, I have a that. gun and there's an alarm system, but... Oh, see. Well, the thing is, I'm all alone. Hmm? Sometimes when I'm sitting there at my desk, I think how easy it would be. Why? Well, all somebody would have to do is shoot me through the glass door. <laughs> Even if the alarm rang, it would be ten minutes before the police got there. Oh, well, Mr. Hubbard, after all, it's a very quiet community, no one. Well, I guess that's what the directors of the bank figure. Only possible danger I can see would be from... From too many people knowing what you've told me. I mean, wrong people. Mm. You say you don't talk. Oh, no. No, Reverend Pierce. I've never told a soul except you. See, that's faith, McKillop. I I see I did a lot without faith, but, but not without faith in my own shining destiny. Imagine, out of all these communities, 35,000 people, Hubbard, picked me, me, to share his secret. <laughs> he even told me the truck didn't come for the money until 9.30 at night. As soon as Hubbard had gone, I wrote a letter to Mac. You remember, I'd, I told Mac to wait for me in Chicago, and, and in that letter, I explained the setup, and I asked him to be at the bank at 9 p.m. on the 30th. Well, and... In the meantime, I, I continue to play my saintly part. <laughs> it was easy. Warmed by adulation, warmed by love, yes, love. Because even you could see what was happening to your daughter. Your own very beautiful daughter. Lucy, yes, yeah, she, she fell in love with me. <laughs> and believe me, Lucy was a great help to me. Blinded by what she called love. If I made a slip, she was there to help me cover up. And what did I feel? Love? With Lucy, as long as the word love served me, I used it. But last week, on Wednesday, when I came in the evening to read to you, I, I suddenly realized that it could also be a source of great danger. Oh, Howard. Howard, darling. <laughs> You're all I've waited for all day. Let me look at you, Lucy. Say you look so happy. How would I have the most wonderful news? Guess. How can I guess? Well, I, I, I've never breathed a word to Father about us. Mm. You and me, no, because you asked me not to. Well, not until he can talk to us. I'm sure give you us didn't. His blessing. No, not yet, I haven't. But the doctor was here today. Yes? And he told me Father will speak again soon, any day now. Mm. Doctor doesn't know why he hasn't already. Mm. Well, isn't that wonderful? Yes, and yes, it is. Howard, what's the matter? Nothing is the matter. Well, there is, I can see. Well, look, Lucy, I, I was going to tell you before, you see, I can't marry you, not ever. You can't? Please, don't ask me why. Because you don't love me. Believe me, Lucy, you, you just have to go on and live your life as, as if you'd never met me. If I'd never met you? You know what that means? Whatever it means. It means I'll marry Tom Hubbard and you'll well, form the service. Yes. Yeah. You'll be the one to make me Mrs. Tom Hubbard. Mrs. who? Who did you say? Tom Hubbard. I'll be a banker's wife. What? <laughs> Never knew his name before. Any. Well, no matter what you think, Lucy, I, I'm sure you'll be happy. <laughs> I have to go in and see your father now, Lucy, and try to be brave, will you? <laughs> Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Oh, you poor... Voiceless, brainless, harmless old Reverend McKillop. I, I hear you may be able to talk again. Yes, I, I hear someday you're going to speak. Well, I have only one week to wait, that's all. One week, and you are a danger. Therefore, I ought to kill you, Reverend. I, 
I want to kill you now. Oh, don't ask me why I didn't kill you, Reverend McKillop. I, I suppose it will always be distasteful to me. It's a, it's a job for cruder minds, and, and if it happens that my neat habits turn in a good deed now and then, that doesn't make me a Boy Scout, does it? I might not like to think of Lucy, only, only two days married so soon to be a widow, so, so soon in half an hour, yes, because in half an hour, Mac is going to shoot Tom Hubbard as he sits at his desk. And in half an hour, I'll have $200,000 and I'll be free, you hear? Well, Reverend, now that you know the real Philip Gentry, do you understand? Do you? No, I doubt it. I, I doubt if you, with your good book and... And your years of tending the good sheep in the rich green pastures here could ever understand one-tenth of what a man like me feels. Doesn't matter. I don't need your understanding. I don't. Good night, Reverend, and, and sleep well. Who is it? It's me, Reverend Pierce, Tom. Oh, let me in. Reverend Pierce, just a minute. I wanted to make sure. You see, this is the night when the truck yes, comes. Yes, yes, I remember. That's how I knew where to find you. Oh. Well, did you want something? Yes. Lucy's feeling sick. I, I came to send you home. L Lucy? But I, I can't. I have to stay. I can stay for you. Gee, I don't know. I'm supposed to stay until the truck Lucy's gets here. Lucy's calling for you, Tom. She's really sick? Yes. Well, all right. I, I guess with you here, it'll be all right. Just tell me what to do. Well, uh, that's the money right there already in those sacks. Yes. I sit here? Yeah, right at this desk. And... Mm. Gee, I, I don't know what the directors will Come think. Come on, run along, Tom. They'll never know. Even if someone walks by from the outside, they'll never know if it's, if it's you or me sitting here. Screwy, you said in your letter that... No, no, I... <laughs> I didn't have a chance to tell you the plans were changed. Oh, Gentry, honest Gentry, I didn't mean to I shoot... I know, you... Look, you better go, I... I'm dying, man. I, I ain't gonna leave you here, Gentry. What do you think? Yes, you... You are going to leave me. He won't get me, Mac. I'm dying. You go on now. Only... You won't be able to take the money. The yeah. plan is all changed. Yeah, okay, that doesn't matter, the, the money. Remember me when, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Hey, hey, what are you talking about, Gentry? It's from the Bible, Mac. He will not. Uh, uh, it's from the Bible. Yes. Said by, by a thief. <laughs> This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity, the man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days, but I did not speak. Because I knew what Philip Gentry would do. What he had to do. I knew what he denied. That to accomplish work as he had in God's vineyard. A man must have faith. Even though he deny that faith. That is why in spite of all. He protected my daughter's happiness. 
That is why he could not kill me. For the work he did here had molded him in spite of himself into a man who is truly a servant of God. To such a man our Lord would say, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. week, the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Wood, Wisconsin, USAAF Station Hospital, Langley Field, Hampton, Virginia, U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee, U.S. Marine Hospital, Cleveland, Ohio, and Veterans Hospital, Aspenwall, Pennsylvania. More people are smoking camels than ever before, and many of those people are doctors. When three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors what cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you The Mask of Medusa by Nelson Bond, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Why do you smoke a pipe? For pleasure, of course. Then get the tobacco especially made for smoking pleasure, Prince Albert. Ask for mellow, mild Prince Albert the next time you buy tobacco for your pipe. And the extra pleasure you'll enjoy will tell you why more pipes smoke PA than any other tobacco. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. Ask for Prince Albert. See if Prince Albert doesn't give you more pipe enjoyment. Listen in on Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk music and laughs with Red Foley and his Cumberland Valley Boys, Minnie Pearl, the gossip from Grinder Switch, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guests, you'll hear Cowboy Copus and Barefoot Brownie. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Lucy, John Brown as Reverend McKillop, Howard Culver as Mac, Jack Edwards Jr. as Hubbard, and Russell Thorson as Reverend Pierce. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night for Camels. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Peter Lorre, who appears as a mysterious gentleman called George Ravel. Miss Wendy Berry plays our worried heroine, Marjorie. Mr. George Zuko is the lawyer, Alex Stevens. The story called The Moment of Darkness is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold a solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the moment of darkness and with the performances of Peter Lorre, Wendy Berry, George Zuko and our other players, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. 
the Train Bleu crack express train from Paris to the French Riviera, which in these carefree days before the war used to make the journey from Paris to Nice overnight. At the Gare du Sud on this particular mild spring evening, the train with its glistening wagon lits or sleeping cars waits in a station filled with smoke and the iron coughing of engines. You can hear the excited crowd at the slamming of compartment doors. You can see the guard standing by with his watch in hand, with his horn ready to blow as a signal. En voiture, messieurs les voyageurs! En voiture! Bien, bientôt! You better get in, Emily. The train's just about ready to start. Commotion there. The last moment just before the signal, a girl in a light summer dress carrying a small suitcase hurries along the platform towards car number 10. The girl is blonde and evidently English. And as she hurries towards the guard... En voiture! Dépêchez-vous, mademoiselle. Hurry up, please. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Is this carriage number 10? Oui, mademoiselle, numéro 10. Hurry up, please. Thank you. I'll get in. Et maintenant... Must be at least a mile long. Car 10. Compartment number 6. Compartment number 6. Compartment. Uh, oh, here it is. Yes, come in. Mr. Stevens, I. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. Won't you come in? I, uh, I thought this was Mr. Stevens' compartment. It is his compartment. I'm sharing it with him. He, uh,. He is on the train, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He's going to look for some luggage that failed to turn up. In the meantime, won't you come in and sit down? Thank you. As an old friend of Toby Stevens, why do you smile? <laughs> Nothing. It's just odd to hear a dignified man like Mr. Stevens called Toby. That's all. Well, it suits him. As an old friend of his anyway, may I introduce myself? I'm Ken Blake, on vacation from the American consulate in London. How do you do? My name is Gray, Marjorie Gray. I, uh, I most particularly wanted to have a word with Mr. Stevens. Miss Gray, will you pardon my impertinence if I ask... Ask what? Whether it's about your Aunt Hester at Monte Carlo and the man who seems so determined to scare her to death. You know about that? Yes, a little. After all, that's why Toby's left his law practice and come all the way from London. He said... Mr. Stevens. Marjorie. Great Scott, what are you doing here? I came up from Monte Carlo especially to see you. I thought I'd find you in Paris, but when I got to your hotel, they told me you'd gone. Cook said they'd reserved a compartment on this train for you. So, well, here I am. But why? Before you see Aunt Hester, Mr. Stevens, I want to know what you meant by that letter you wrote me. I meant exactly what I said, Marjorie. I'm going to expose this faker, George Revel. <coughs> Excuse me, if you two want to talk, I'll just clear out of here. Oh, no, Ken, stay where you are. Really, Mr. Stevens? You made an impression on her, Ken. When a girl suddenly becomes thoroughly British after spending half her life on the Riviera, well, you made an impression. Don't talk like that, Toby. She won't get annoyed with you for saying it. She'll just get annoyed with me. Marjorie, this is Ken Blake. We've met, thanks. I asked him to come along with me, and for a very good reason. Indeed? Ken was for years at the American consulate in Paris. He knows all the heads of the Surete General. That's the Scotland Yard of France. And in particular, he knows the great detective Flamand, who's the chef de Surete. I thought Kent might be very useful when we nab Ravel. But I tell you, Ravel is dangerous. Dangerous, my eye. Something's going to happen. I know something dreadful's going to happen. Now, let's face the situation, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester is middle-aged, wealthy, and... Uh... Oh, if only Uncle Paul hadn't died. He was the decentest person I ever knew. But he did die, my dear. And Hester can't be consoled. She can't eat, she can't sleep, she can't think of anything except getting in touch with his spirit. Along comes this faker Ravel to give seances. I wonder if he is a faker. You're not falling for this Tommy Rot, surely. Really, Mr. Blake? If I'd asked for your advice in this matter... I beg your pardon, Miss Gray. When we get to Nice, I'll take the first train back to Paris. Oh, no. No, wait, please. I, I didn't mean to be rude. It's nice of you to help us, but it's the whole atmosphere of Monte Carlo. Well, that's quite all right, my dear. We understand, of course. There's Aunt Hester in that villa over the Mediterranean. There's Ravel, all thin and quiet and swarthy, with those somber-looking eyes of his. He, he seems to dominate her, just as Mr. Stevens used to. Dominate her, my dear? That's rather a strong word for an easy-going old buffer like me. Oh, the things Ravel does at those seances are terrifying. 
I don't know whether he's an imposter or not. But I am sure nobody else can do what he does. Now, there, Marjorie, is where you're wrong. I can. You can? Yes. I promise to duplicate in front of your aunt every single trick Ravel ever performed. Oh, but that's impossible. Is it? Wait and see. I'll put it up to Mr. Blake. It isn't merely that Ravel is tied up, tied hand and foot in a chair while these horrible things are going on. I know there are people who can get out of ropes and back into them again. But Ravel lets you take one precaution that shows there can't be any trickery. Oh, and what is that precaution? Just before the lights go out, he takes a piece of white paper. Well? He puts one under each foot. You take a pencil and draw an outline around the shoe on the paper. If he moved the millionth fraction of an inch, it would show in the outline later. But it never does. <laughs> well, look here, Toby, that's a bad one. Why does it strike you as being so funny? Because I can do it, too. Just give me a moment of darkness, that's all. You mean he gets out of his shoes or something like that? No, he could hardly get out of his shoes and back into them without disturbing the outline. Then he doesn't leave his chair after all. On the contrary, he can be all over the room. Well, how in Satan's name does he do it? My dear fellow, there's nothing simple. The Villa Bijou Monte Carlo the next evening. On the lighted terrace, that white villa overlooking the olive groves and the sea, three people are seated at their ease enjoying the night air. Below glitters the town, a white palm garden. But even its lamps are dimmed by the firework illuminations from the Promenade des Anglais. When the Principality of Monaco celebrates its ruler's birthday, Great rockets go hissing upwards to burst and bloom in colored fires against a black sky. Yes, I don't like those fireworks. The noise upsets me. I wish they'd stop. Never mind the fireworks, Hester. You've heard my proposition. Give me an answer. Oh, what's more? You spill broth on your jacket at dinner. You're the clumsiest eater I ever saw. Here, here. Let me take a handkerchief to it. Please, Aunt Hester. Won't you answer, Mr. Stevens? Why don't you two let me alone, both of you? We're only trying to help you. Don't you believe that? Oh, yes, I, 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 I believe it. But I'm happy. I talked with my husband twice last week. Now, look here, Hester. This has got to stop. Why? Ravel's a fraud, and I can prove it. If Monsieur Ravel is a fraud, what is he gained by this? Has he not asked for money? I don't know. Has he? No. Not a penny. You haven't changed your will by any chance. People do queer things sometimes that even their solicitors don't know about. Oh, no, dear, I haven't changed my will. When I die, uh, Marjorie inherits everything. I am a lonely woman. I'm getting old. I haven't got much to look forward to. Uh, why don't you go your way and let me go mine? Suppose Ravel is a fraud. Just suppose it. Well, all right. Have your way. You wouldn't like to think you'd been deliberately tricked and imposed on now, would you? Oh, well, no, no. Of now, listen, Hester. If I prove to you these so-called miracles were really tricks that I can do myself. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Alex, Alex Stevens. I offer to prove that here and now. Would that shake your faith a little? Mm, yes, I, I suppose it would. I. But how did you become so clever all of a sudden? How did you become so gullible all of a sudden? You used to scoff at this sort of thing. You used to be gay and lively and go to the casino. Well, that was before Paul died. You're shivering, Marjorie. If you feel cold, put on a wrap. I'm, I'm not cold. It's... It's only... Only what? Oh, I've got a kind of presentiment that there's something dreadful hanging over us. I can't tell what direction it's taking or who's in danger. But I'm sure it's going to burst. Just as sure as I... My George, look at that rocket. Yes. Red and gold stars. And a deathly white blaze like the life we're living. You can see every leaf in the garden. Every blade of grass. And we can also see... Look there. Ravel and Ken Blake coming up the path. This, this Ken Blake, Mr. Stevens... Are you sure he's quite honest? My dear Marjorie, Ken's all right. I've known him for years. I thought he came here to help expose Ravel. But he and Ravel are as thick as thieves. What sort of game is going on here? Game, mademoiselle? You spoke of a game? Yes, Monsieur Ravel, I did. So did I, friend Ravel. Are you ready for my demonstration tonight? Demonstration? In the seance room upstairs. Do you claim you can bring back the dead? Pardon me, monsieur. I claim nothing. When I'm in trance, I cannot tell what happens. But I can. I'm going to make ghosts walk by perfectly natural means. 
You know, Monsieur Stevens, I, I don't understand your logic. Logic? Yes, you wish to, uh, how do you put it, expose me? But how will you expose me by these childish tricks? If I show you a counterfeit ten-pound note, does that prove there's no Bank of England? I'm not going to argue subtleties with you. You can always beat me there. <laughs> I'm a plain, ordinary man with a little common sense to back me up. No, no, no. Come on, my friend. Not an ordinary man, surely. Just exactly what are you hinting at? Yes, I, I, I'd like to know that, too. Oh, Madame Hester, believe me, I didn't mean to upset you. I, it would, I, I wouldn't upset you for anything. No, I'll bet you wouldn't. Well, I kiss your hand, Madame. I'm, I'm all apologies. Well... Let this gentleman do what he likes. But I warn him, it is dangerous. Dangerous? How is it dangerous? That's the first time you've spoken, Mr. Blake. Why have you been so quiet? Uh, please, Marjorie, please now, be a good girl and stop interrupting. Oh, I'm sorry, Aunt Hester, but he's been muttering to himself and moving from one foot to the other and, and looking guilty. Confound it, I'm not looking guilty. Aren't you? No, it's a hot night. I don't like this business at all. Why will a seance be dangerous? Why? Because we shall be tampering with evil forces. Evil forces, my foot. Oh, you doubt it? Yes. <laughs> this brave Monsieur Stevens is challenging the unseen world. He's mocking at forces he does not understand. Believe me, Monsieur, they are not mocked without danger. I'll risk that, thanks. Well, up in a seance room, with a door bolted on the inside, we shall be at their mercy. The evil forces, the elementals will wax and grow strong. They can take us in their grip as I take this walking stick and... You've got strong hands, Monsieur Ravel. The hands of evil spirits are stronger. Much stronger. I'm afraid. I wonder if we ought to do this. I've been wondering the same thing. What does your aunt say? Oh, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I'm so confused. And I want to break down and cry. I... Well, I suppose we'd better do it, or Alex Stevens will never let me hear the end of it. For the last time, monsieur, will you be warned of danger? No. Very well. Oh, Madame Hester. Uh, yes, monsieur, for then. Do you believe that I'm an imposter? No. No, dear, of course not, but... Uh, but in uh, your heart, you're not yet convinced. Uh, well, I... I, I, don't, I don't know. I, well, you know, I'm not such a fool as some people seem to think. But if something did happen, something to show there are living forces beyond this world, it would convince you utterly? Oh, yes, I... I, I suppose it would. <laughs> then uh, shall we allow Monsieur Stevens to go on with his demonstration? I have a feeling we shouldn't do this. Oh, I'm afraid! Upstairs... At the Villa Bijou, there is a small, bare, deeply carpeted room. Its only furniture consists of a round table, five chairs, and a large cabinet phonograph. There is only one door, and there are no windows. In one chair, a little way back from the table, sits Mr. Alexander Stevens. He is tied hand and foot, the outline of his shoes drawn with pencil on pieces of paper, so that he cannot move. Now then, friend Raphael, have you quite finished tying me up? Yes, and I bet you you won't get out of these knots, sir. Well, we'll see about that. Are well, the rest of you ready? Yes, yes, all right. Oh, dear, I, I wish I'd put some smelling salts in my handbag. Well, what do you want us to do now? We'll have conditions exactly as they are for Mr. Ravel. I'll sit in this chair back from the table. You four sit around the table, clasping hands to form a circle. All right, let's get on with it. Ken, will you start the gramophone? <laughs> I believe it's customary, Mr. Ravel, to have hymns played at the beginning of a seance to establish the proper frame of mind. Yes, monsieur, that's true. You fool. What did you say? Oh, uh, nothing, monsieur. Please continue. Start the gramophone, Ken. When you've done that, turn out the lights on that switch by the door. Then join the circle. Clasp each other's hands tightly and don't let go unless... Unless what? Well, unless something gets me. Be careful, monsieur. Go on, please. Start the gramophone. All right, here goes. Now the lights, Ken. Switch off the lights. Lights? Yes, yes, yes. There you are. It's pitch dark. I can't see my way back to the table. Here, Ken. Here's my hand. Thank and you. I know Thanks. 
On the other side, Mr. Blake. Thank you. I've got my bearings now. Are all of you clasping the hands of the next person? Then quiet and wait for what's going to happen. Ken, look. Look where? Over there, where Mr. Stevens is sitting. What about it? There's a luminous spot in the dark, about the size of a shilling. It's... Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, quiet, please. Did anything touch the back of your neck? No. Ah! <laughs> what was that? It's Alex Stevens. I know it. This was not on a program, madame. Break the circle and get those lights on. The luminous spot is still there. Oh, hurry, Ken. I can't see my way in the dark. I don't know which direction the lights are. Wait a minute. Here's the wall. If I grope along here, I ought to find the switch. Yes, yes, here it is. Lights. Ah! Quiet. Quiet silence, mademoiselle, if you please. What's wrong with Mr. Stevens? What's that sticking out of his chest? the handle of a dagger. And a good deal of blood has soaked through his coat, too. <laughs> well, Monsieur Blake, will you turn off this gramophone? Yes, certainly. But you're not saying that Toby Stevens is dead. I'm afraid he is, my friend. That's a direct heart wound. Perhaps ten seconds of intense agony, and then the end. Oh, is the door still bolted from the inside? Yes. And we are all alone, here, the four of us. This rash gentleman, one imagines, did not kill himself. He's too well tied up. I know who killed him. Mr. George Ravel. You did, with luminous paint. I killed him, mademoiselle? With luminous paint? I mean, that was part of the trick. You tied him up. You were the only one who touched him. And? What is that, mademoiselle? Luminous paint doesn't show up in the light. You smeared a little of it on his coat. <laughs> that showed you exactly where to strike in the dark. I commend your good sense, madame. But there are two excellent reasons why I had nothing to do with this. The first reason I, I must keep to myself, but the second reason can easily be proved. Well, what is it? Well, up to the time that man screamed, you yourself were holding my right hand, and madame Hester was holding my left hand. Did either of you let go at any time? No. No, that, that is, I didn't. What about you, Aunt Hester? No, no, Marjorie did. I didn't let go either. He never moved. Hold on. Wait a minute. Well, monsieur, speak up. I was holding Marjorie's hand on one side and her aunt's on the other. And they didn't move either. Nobody let go or left the circle. That's true. Consequently, none of us could have killed Toby Stevens. Yes, it is true. Somebody must have sneaked in here. Oh, no. As you said yourself, the door is bolted on the inside. Then who the devil did kill him? Well, that's the question. Has anybody ever seen that dagger before? No. It, it looks like one of those curio things you buy in the shops. Yes, and uh, with the design of wooden scroll work on the handle. No fingerprints will show. Nothing else. Except some musical instruments. <laughs> a tambourine, an accordion, and a speaking trumpet. You know, I... I blame myself for this. You ought to. Why? Because you killed him. Don't ask me how, but I know why. Indeed, mademoiselle. You found my motive. Yes, yes, I have. You've got Aunt Hester fully believing in you now, haven't you? Easy, Marjorie. In another minute, you'll be talking about forces and elementals and heaven knows what. <laughs> you'll be saying it was a spirit hand that killed Mr. Stevens because nobody else could have. Please, Marjorie, brace up. Someone's got to send for the police. Why don't you send for the police, Ken? Couldn't you help us there? Help you? How? Mr. Stevens said you knew the heads of the Sûreté. He said you knew this man, Flamand, who was supposed to be the greatest detective in France. Oh, but this isn't French territory. Monte Carlo is the independent state of Monaco. I'm sorry, Marjorie. Ordinarily, I might have helped. You mean you won't help us? I'm sorry, Marjorie. I can't. Then I've got to help myself. George Ravel, you killed Mr. Stevens! But how? Yes, how? <laughs> Twenty-four hours later, twenty-four hours of blind puzzling. In the railway station at Nice, nine miles from Monte Carlo, the night express for Paris is already underway. The guard has blown his signal, and the great wheels grind. A young man, hatless and worried, pushes through the crowd past the already moving train. No, monsieur. 
C'est défendu. Vous êtes trop tard. Too late, nothing. I'm getting aboard this train. Prenez garde, monsieur. Prenez garde. I'm sorry to have caused you any trouble, guard. But do you happen to know whether... Marjorie. Ken Blake. What are you doing on this train? Exactly the question I wanted to ask you. Walk along the corridor with me, will you? All right. Marjorie, you little idiot. What's the idea of running away? If it's any of your business, Mr. Blake, I'm not running away. I'm merely going to Paris. You were told to stay in Monte Carlo. Don't you know you can land in jail for this? They'll put you in jail too, won't they? Yes, I suppose so. But what's the idea of going to Paris? Well, first of all, I had to get Aunt Hester away from that man, Ravel. She really thinks he can call up ghosts now. Is your aunt on this train? Yes, in that compartment there. Second, I'm going to Paris for some real help. I'm going to the Sûreté. I'm going to see this man, Flamand. You won't find Flamand in Paris, Marjorie. And you'll certainly never get him to arrest Georges Ravel. Oh? And why not? Because, my dear idiot, Georges Ravel is Flamand. What are you saying? The man who calls himself Ravel is really Flamand, the head of the whole French detective bureau. He made me promise not to tell anybody. Then that's why you've been looking so guilty for two days. Yes, I tried to tip you off today, but the police were with us all the time. So he is a fake spiritual medium. Mr. Stevens was right about that. And I still say I'm right about the other thing. Whoever he is, Ravel killed Mr. Stevens. But how and why? Oh, I don't know. This alleged detective. Did he tell you why he was masquerading as a medium in Monte Carlo? No. All I know is that we're in one sweet mess. We've left town without permission... They'll probably stop the train and send us back in a patrol wagon. Oh, no, 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 my friend. That won't be at all necessary. Ravel! Yes, mademoiselle. Ravel or uh, Flamand. <laughs> well, since you know me as Ravel, call me that. You, you knew that I was on this train? Oh, naturally. Look here, old man. I kept quiet about you because you swore it was a matter of life and death. But will you answer a couple of questions now? Oh, with pleasure. Why did you pose as a medium? Because the Monarchian government employed me to trap a murderer. So I had to work hard, you see, undercover. All right. Why was Toby Stevens killed? Stevens was killed because he was a blackmailer. A blackmailer? Yes, mademoiselle. Does that surprise you? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Very much. I tried to warn Stevens, but the fool wouldn't listen. And then, well, I wasn't quick enough. Stevens was murdered, of course, by one of us four in the seance room. Well, that's impossible. Hmm? Impossible? Oh, no. The trick was baffling because of its simplicity. I'm sure you killed him. <laughs> one moment, mademoiselle. Let me show you what I mean by trick baffling because it is so simple. Take, for example, the pencil outline drawn on a paper around the medium shoes. Did Stevens tell you... How I did that? No. On this train two nights ago, he, he started to tell us, but... Then he just stopped in the middle of it and laughed. <laughs> you see, the medium leaves his chair. Well, he makes tambourines rattle and ghost forms appear. Yet the pencil outline is not disturbed. Now, how does he manage it? Well, how does he manage it? Well, quite easily. He returns to his chair... He turns over the two pieces of paper. He takes another pencil and draws an outline of his shoes on the reverse side of the paper. <laughs> you look at it. And... and imagine it's the same outline we drew. Precisely. So easily are people misled. And it was the same way with a murder. But there couldn't have been any trick about the murder. None of us left the circle. We were all clasping hands when we heard that scream. Don't you agree? Hmm? Oh, yes, I agree. I can't stand this any longer. When we heard Mr. Stevens utter that horrible scream... What I... makes you think it was Stevens who uttered that scream? I... I beg your pardon. What makes you think it was Stevens who screamed? Well, wasn't it? Oh, you assumed it, yes. We, we all assumed it. But up to that time, Stevens wasn't even hurt. Wasn't hurt? You see, the source of sound cannot be located in the dark. It was the murderer who uttered that appalling cry. In a few seconds of darkness, before the lights went on, the killer simply leaned across and drove that dagger into Stephen's chest. And you prove that? Yes. 
If Stevens had been hit at the time of the scream, blood would have blotted out the spot of luminous pain. Yet, Marjorie Gray saw the pain shining after the scream. That's true, Marjorie. I heard you say so. You put the luminous paint there, Ravel. You were the only person who touched him. Oh, no. There was one other person who touched him. Who was it? Another person in full sight of you said Stevens had spilled broth on his coat and swabbed at his chest with a handkerchief. You mean... I mean, of course, the real murderer. Your Aunt Hester. Yes, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester. Aunt Hester. Keep back, all of you. Oh, so you managed to find the revolver. Marjorie, I poisoned your Uncle Paul. I poisoned my husband. And Alex Stevens knew it. You can't get away, madame. <laughs> Keep away from that door. I never believed in spiritualism. I let myself be influenced by a medium because Alex Stevens would try to stop it. He was getting money out of me. He wanted no other influence. Don't open that door, madame. But I am opening it. Oh, Aunt Hester, don't! I told you I wasn't a fool as I looked. I had the knife in my hand. Back. Stop her, kid! Stop her! Ah! Well, mademoiselle, <laughs> she has committed many crimes, but now she has paid for them all. <laughs> And so closes The Moment of Darkness, starring Peter Laurie, Wendy Berry, with George Zuko. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins will star in a study in terror titled The Diary of Sophronia Winter. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Wilbur Hatch, Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Yard in London, the London of the early 1900s. A man was found dead, strangled to death, in a village called St. Mark's Priory. And Scotland Yard is investigating the murder. Chief Inspector Tanner is in his office, and he's discussing the situation with his assistant, Sergeant Sutton. 
Well, Tubby. Well, this bloke what was killed was the chauffeur for Lord Lebanon. His name was William Studd. He was returning from a fancy dress ball and was strangled on the way. Nobody hated him, and there's no cue as to who killed him. Fancy dress ball, eh? What was he wearing? Aha! Uh -huh. He was dressed in Indian clothes, Tanner. And that's where my theory comes in. It was Dr. Amersham who found the chauffeur at two o'clock in the morning. Now, what was Dr. Amersham doing at two in the morning in the Priory Field? <laughs> it's your theory, Sergeant. Suppose you tell me. Well... Chief Constable Tanner, Lord Lebanon. Right. Lord Lebanon is outside. Go bring him in. Here's Lord Lebanon, Inspector. Hello. I hope I'm not an awful nuisance. No, not at all, Lord Lebanon. I'm Chief Inspector Tanner. What can I do for you? Well, Inspector Tanner, the whole thing is very vulgar, and when one's mother's involved... Well, everything was all right while my father was alive. A shocking invalid. Never left his room for 15 years. Your visit here concerns your father? Not exactly. I'm just starting at the beginning, you know. When father died, I should have come back from India. But then Amersham came out after me, wanted me to take my seat in the House of Lords. Silly. What? But you came back? Yes. To find my mother was expecting me to marry Isla Crane. It's deuced awkward. Awkward? She's terribly nice, but there's something odd about her. Odd? She's been frightened since that infernal murder. Why, my dear fellow, she walks in her sleep. Do you say she's frightened, Lord Lebanon? Of what? I shouldn't be surprised if it's that American footman my mother hired. A strapping big fellow. He lurks. He does what? Lurks. You know, you pop out of your room and there he is lurking in the hall. Well, why don't you fire him? You're the master of the house. Oh, yes, I'm the master in a way. Still, it's rather difficult when a fellow has a mother. But I don't want any fuss. I'll probably marry Isla in spite of her walking in her sleep. What about this Dr. Amersham? Oh, well, you might as well know. Dr. Amersham is a man I dislike intensely. Is he a friend of your mother's? I suppose so, in a way. But he doesn't like me. He doesn't like Isla, doesn't like anybody. And I'll tell you something else about him. When he was in India, a woman was killed in his bungalow. Indian woman, beautiful gal. Strangled. Strangled? Can you tell me any more about it? She was strangled with some sort of scarf. Oh, there was a terrible row about it. But he got out of it. I see. Lord Lebanon, why exactly have you come to see me? Well, I'll be perfectly frank with you. I, I'm frightened. I don't want to make a scene, but at the same time, I, I don't want to die. Aren't you possibly exaggerating? I don't know whether I am or whether I'm not, but there's something going on. And I don't understand it. Honestly, I do wish you'd come down and look into it. All right, Lord Lebanon. We'll be down the first thing tomorrow morning. thing you're taking me with you to Mark's Priory, Tanner. As I always say, you can't go wrong when you've got the coolest head in the yard along quiet, with you. Quiet, quiet, Tuddy. Uh, here we are. Mark's Priory Castle. Can you imagine a lightweight brain like Lord Lebanon having all this and 40,000 pounds a year? Now, if I had that You'd money, i spend I'd... it all on loose liquor and aged women. We're going in now, Tuddy. Mind your manners. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Chief Inspector Tanner and Sergeant Tully of Scotland Yard. We're here to see Lady Lebanon and the household. Lady Lebanon's in the drawing room. I'll announce you. Wait a minute. You're not the butler. No, sir. The butler's busy just now. I'm the doorman. Footman, eh? Then you must be the American, Gilda. Yes, sir. How long have you been here, Gilda? Eight years. I believe you have an account at the London and Provincial Bank, haven't you? Uh, yes, Inspector. Very unusual, isn't it? For a footman to have an account in a London bank. Some of us are very thrifty. So I noticed. But isn't it rather a large balance? Three or four thousand pounds. 
I bought some good stocks now and then. What is your salary here? Pretty good one. Her ladyship is generous. Well, I'll want to talk to you later, Gilda. Sure. Any time. Now I'll announce you to her ladyship. Never mind. I'll announce myself. Come on, Toddy. Uh, that seems to be the drawing room ahead. Lady Lebanon? Yes? I'm Chief Inspector Tanner, Scotland Yard. This is Sergeant Toddy, who was down here two days ago. Uh, how do you do? Uh, this is Dr. Emerson, my physician. Uh, how, do how, do you do? how do you do, Inspector? Why are you here, Inspector? I must remind your ladyship that your son's chauffeur was murdered only a few days ago. It will be necessary for me to question all of you. Toddy, you take care of the servants. Right, sir. Lady Lebanon, I would like to see your son and his fiancée, as well as you and the doctor. Very well. Dr. Emerson, will you step upstairs and ask Isla to come down? Glad to, if the inspector won't read something criminal into my actions. You never know about these police. Oh, before you go, Doctor, I believe you spent some time in India. Oh, yes, yes, I'm practically a colonial. And I believe there was some uh, incident of a native girl being strangled in your bungalow? A very unfortunate incident, Inspector. I'm sure you must be interested in the police work on the case. Sometime, perhaps, I'll tell you all about it. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll see if I can find Miss Cray. Very clever man. Is there anything you wish to tell me, Lady Lebanon? I knew very little about the poor chauffeur. The servants can probably tell you the things you have to know. I suppose you want to look over the castle? Yes, of course. Are you interested in blazonry, Inspector? The coat of arms you see in here represents an eternity. The Lebanon line stands unbroken for 1,200 years. It would be a pity were it to die out. I'm sure it would. How long have you known Dr. Amersham, Lady Lebanon? Many years, since before my husband died. I was aware of that. In fact, I noticed that your husband's death certificate was signed by Dr. Amersham. Yes, it was. I believe you said you wished to see my son, Inspector. I'll go and tell him. <sighs> when constabulary duties to be done, to be done, the policeman... I say, that's rather jolly. jolly. <laughs> I didn't know policemen could sing. Oh, good morning, Lord Lebanon. I see your mother found you. My mother, no, I haven't seen her. I suppose it's beastly of me, but I'm always rather glad when I don't see her. I say, I'm awfully glad you've come down. Have you met Amersham? I haven't met him. He's a nasty piece of work, isn't he? I loathe him. You know, it just occurred to me, this chauffeur chap of ours might have been strangled by a scarf like that Indian gal I told you about. Wouldn't surprise me if you were right. It wouldn't? You know, Inspector, I've always thought I had a talent for that sort of thing, snooping around for clues. You have? Yes, indeed. It would never do, though, I suppose. The trouble is I can't see Stand the sight of blood. It unnerves me for days. Ghastly, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I imagine there are many people who can't stand the sight of blood. You think so? I say, you will look into this Amersham, won't you? Things are pretty rum around here, and I'm sure that he's at the bottom of oh, it. Really? I... What were you saying to the inspector? Nothing, Mother. I'm just remarking that Dr. Amersham is a bounder. Oh, nonsense, but... Willie. I'll not have you talking that way about Dr. Amersham. Where were you? I was looking everywhere for you. You couldn't have looked very hard. I was in the den all morning. It seems to be taking Dr. Amersham quite a while to bring Miss Crane down. I wonder... Well, he has been a little long, but I'm sure they'll be here any minute. If you ask me... <coughs> what a fire, love. What can be the matter? Dashed odd, girl. We'll see. Come on. <laughs> Isla, what's the meaning of this nonsense? It's, it's up there on the stairs. Dead. It's so terrible. Black and contorted. As though he'd been choked to death. Who, Miss Crane? Who is dead? Dr. Ashes. You wanted to see me, Lady Lebanon? Yes, I did, Isla. What is the matter with you? All you do is fidget and look frightened. I don't know. I heard the police saying that Dr. Amersham and the chauffeur were both strangled with a the scarf. They found red threads on their throats. 
What's frightening about that? Well, I I opened the drawer of your desk this afternoon and I found a red scarf there. My dear child, you're dreaming. Which drawer? This one. You see, there's nothing there. You mustn't let these things get on your nerves the way you do. These things! How can you speak so lightly about it? Two men are killed here and you act so calmly. I can't go on staying in this awful place. I can't. But you will, Isla, dear. I sent your mother her quarterly check last week and just had a letter from her this morning. She's so happy to be secure after all the hard times she's been through. Oh, don't. Please don't. You know I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for her. If she knew what I'm doing, she'd rather starve than have me go on. Don't be stupid. And for heaven's sake, don't be hysterical. I can't stand hysterical women. They have unhealthy children, and you must have healthy children after you're married to Willie. Uh, yes, Gilda? It's a gentleman from Scotland Yard. I've finished showing him over the house, and they... We want to see you, Lady Lebanon. Oh, uh, have you been to the castle already? Inspector Tanner? Every room except one. The lumber room, my lady. On the first floor. One of the best positions in the house. That's a queer place for a lumber room. We call it the lumber room. It's uh, really a place where I keep a few valuables. Your man has the key? No, I never open that room. Inspector Tanner, I'll tell you the truth. That is the room where my husband died. It hasn't been opened since that day. But I'm sure I've seen it open, Lady Lebanon. You are quite mistaken, Isla. You must be overwrought. Go to your room. Yes, Lady Lebanon. I'm sorry, my lady. But I must insist on the room being open. But why, Inspector? Surely there's nothing there that will interest you. There might be. I'm looking for a collection of silk scarves. And I want to find them before somebody else gets strangled. Ridiculous. I don't think so. Incidentally, we discovered that a scarf, perhaps the one used on Dr. Amersham, was burned this afternoon in a stove in the kitchen. Would you know anything about it? If anything has been burned, I haven't the least idea who burned it or what it was. I'm afraid I'm at fault, Inspector. I found some odd bits of silk on the carpet and burned them. Why, of course, Gilda. I was cutting out a doll's dress for the village bazaar. Doll dresses? Look, Chief, just give me a few minutes. Not now, Toddy, not now. Lady Lebanon, it strikes me that you're not very anxious to have the murder of your friend cleared up. Dr. Amersham was not a friend of mine. So the fact that he was murdered within a few yards of this room really doesn't matter. Aren't you being rather insolent, Inspector Tanner? I suppose I am. But your own attitude is rather peculiar. If he wasn't a friend of yours, what was he doing here? He came to see me as a doctor. At your request? No, he just dropped in. So early in the morning, an odd hour for dropping in? I had a touch of neuritis in my arm. Oh, yes, neuritis. But you didn't send for him? No. He just guessed that you had neuritis and dropped in. Very convenient type of doctor to have. I'm not interested in your conclusions, Inspector Tanner. You will be in some of them. And Lady Lebanon, I intend to see that room, which you choose to call the lumber room. If not voluntarily, then with a court order. This is an outrage. No magistrate in this county would grant it. Then I'll go to the Home Secretary. You won't be able to reach him until tomorrow, Chief. So, my home will belong to me until tomorrow, at least? Maybe. You don't seem to realize or want to that there's a murder around. I know the identity of the murderer, Lady Lebanon, but I haven't got the proof. It may be in that room you refuse to open. Impossible. Not so impossible. Sergeant Totty and I are staying here this evening. I suggest that you reconsider and give us the key to the lumber room. It may save somebody's life. this has been, Chief. I'm glad the household's getting tucked into their beds. Uh, I could do with a bit of sleep myself. Yeah, we'll go to bed ourselves, Tarry, as soon as we're sure that everything's quiet. We can step into the library for a last smoke while we're waiting. Mm. Look, Chief, there on the floor. Why, he's got another one. I see her. Miss Crane. Thank heavens he wasn't successful this time, Tarry. She's still alive, although she'll have a sore throat for a while. Here's the scarf he did it with, too. I think she's coming around. Hello. I say, what's wrong? What's wrong? Our murderer tried to get Miss Crane. Oh, oh I say. Poor girl. Is she done for? You know, she'll be all right in a moment. No. No. There, there, there now, Miss Crane. It's Inspector Tanner. 
You've had a nasty shock, but you're not hurt. I... I throat. Uh, who did it, Miss Craig? I... I don't know. I was just standing here, and suddenly that... A scarf was whipped around my neck. I couldn't see who. I think it was... It's all right. That's all right, Miss Crane. You tell us the rest tomorrow. Now it's upstairs to bed for you. Best take a sedative. Toddy, you help Miss Crane up to her room and get her maid for her. Right, sir. Here, just lean on me, ma'am. Thank you, Inspector. Poor girl. Of course, she is a bit odd. But she doesn't deserve to die that way. Well, thank heaven she didn't die. I'm glad. Don't you think it's about time my line was wiped out, Inspector? Your line? I'm afraid I don't understand you. This sort of thing's been going on for years. Ask my mother. She's got all their dates, all their pedigrees. The Lebanons have always been somewhat off. My father was more than somewhat. He spent 15 years in the old Lord's room. As mad as a hatter. <laughs> I guess that. But he never strangles anybody. The first time I saw it done was in Pune. A little fellow slipped up behind a big hulking man and... Fascinating. Yes. I tried it on a girl, an Indian girl. She went out like that. I suppose one uses a scarf, like this one. You do understand. I brought back dozens of these scarves from India. I'm not a big fellow, but I'm awfully strong. Feel my arm. It's rather a lot. People never think I have the strength. Even Gilda doesn't guess. Gilda? He's not really a footman, you know. He's sort of... Well, he looks after me. You understand? Yes. That's what I thought. And that room my mother wouldn't show you. Well, it's all padded, you know. Rubber cushions all around the walls. I have to go there when I... when I realize things. You mean when you imagine things? When I realize things, I know what I'm saying. When I'm quite well, I don't realize things. It's only when I get excited that my brain becomes clear. <gasps> don't touch me. I just wanted a light for my cigarette. Huh? Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Here. Are you friend or foe? A friend, of course. Now, why did you... Why were you so unkind to the chauffeur? Oh, I'm awfully sorry about that. He was such a good fellow. But I'm afraid of Indians. One of them tried to kill me. They were very angry about that girl. I didn't know about this beastly masquerade ball in the village. I thought the chauffeur was an Indian. And Dr. Amersham? I didn't like him. He had my mother under his thumb. He knew about my realizing things, you see, and he blackmailed her. I'll show you something. Swear you won't tell anybody. I swear. Here. It's a gun. Loaded. I took it from Gilda's room this evening. It's the first one I've been able to get a hold of since I came back from but India. It's very nice. Uh, but would you mind not pointing it at me? It might go off. So it might. Sometimes I think I should turn it on myself. Wipe out the whole silly line. I... I wonder where Gilda... Put her. Put... Put who? Isla. She was looking awfully like that Indian girl this afternoon. I went behind her and put my arms around her. Didn't you hear her run down the stairs? She knows. That's why she's frightened of me. She came downstairs the night I smashed up this place. I don't remember doing it, but I suppose I must have. That was the night I nearly got Amersham. And last night when I did get him, she saw me coming back into the house. And... I'm... Terribly strong. You wouldn't think so, would you? Oh, yes, I would. You know, when you were at my office in Scotland Yard, I said to myself, this fellow is very strong. Did you really? You are smart, aren't you? 
I say, I worried some tonight. I didn't drink my bromide. There are lots of ways of getting out of that room of mine. They don't know it, but I do. I fool them lots of times. Yes, I expect you fool them pretty often. <laughs> well, I'm going to bed. Oh, no, you're not going to bed. You're pretending that you're not scared. But you are. You see, I frighten people. I'm not frightened. No? I'll be sensible and give me that gun. No, no, no. Why no. do you want to fool around with a thing like that? Well, there's lots of things I could do with this. I could end the line with this. Here comes my mother. We'll ask her. Billy, give me that gun. No, no, I won't. I've always wanted a pistol. I've asked you one dozens of times. Give me that You're going to give me that gun, old fellow. No, no, you don't touch me. Don't come near me. Billy, oh, Billy, look, he's going to stop him. Somebody stop him. Oh, my mother. <laughs> Well, Inspector? He's dead. Poor devil. Ten centuries of Lebanon's. A thousand years of greatness gone out. Like a candle in the wind. Tutty. Yes, sir. Get Scotland Yard. Tell them the Lebanon case is closed. Oh, if that Lord Lebanon isn't a disappointment. <laughs> After so neatly strangling all those other people, he had to go and spoil a perfect record by shooting himself. Well, don't go, please. Don't go. They're rehearsing our next performance in a green room. Follow me, please. <laughs> Come. Come. <laughs> that record you just played? Oh, it's terrible. Corny. Too commercial. Are those the records you want to hear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the matter with them? Oh, long hairs. Why don't you get out of your long underwear? So long. Hey, was that an insult? No, dear, no. Just uh, jive talk. Play one of our records, Nicky. Okay, darling. Hey, Nora, what, what's gut bucket? Oh, I don't know, darling. But it sounds to me like some new kind of girdle. Uh, sit down, dear. Hey. What kind of stuff is that? Beethoven's romance, dear. It's about time you developed a taste for good music. What's the matter with my taste? I like to see everything dinosaur sings. You should learn to appreciate the higher forms, dear. Oh, hey, oh, Mr. Bailey. Nikki, I want you to meet Mr. Benjamin Bailey, the proprietor of the Cadenza Record Shop. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Charles. Oh, you do. Just call me Beethoven Bunny like everybody else does. Mm -hmm. Well, Mrs. Charles, shall I start lecturing at him? Oh, please, Benny. You know, is this some kind of a plot? Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Charles, now he is listening to a hunk of music called Romance by Ludwig von Beethoven, which is written in Andante. Which means not too fast, but don't fall asleep. You get it? Hey, Benny, where'd you learn about music? Oh, in my youth, I was the first piccolo player in the Sing Sing Philharmonic Orchestra. Now, you take that album there. Chostakovich's Sixth Symphony. Chostakovich was influenced by Prokofiev, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, Rimsky, Korsakov, Glazunov, Mosikorsky, and Tchaikovsky. So what happens? So Chostakovich makes what are notes, and if you spend an ear... It sounds a little like Prokofiev, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, Rimsky, Korsakov, and Tchaikovsky. Now, they're not to be confused with Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, Mozart, and Papa Haydn, or of the German school, as against the Russian school. Two nations which are at war today. Which is something to think about, ain't that, Mrs. Charles? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, it certainly bears thinking about. So to get along with my suppression, now, Beethoven was carrying the torch for a hot little tomato called Countess Guicciardi. Mm. Now, hark ye. 
how the great violinist Freddie Fat can place this passage. It, it, it's sheer perspiration. Uh, well, what's the matter with Freddie? Did he run out of uh, perspiration? No, the record stopped. It's something messed up this phonograph. Well, won't it go? No, it's dead. Well, why don't we push it away from the wall, Benny? Well, what killed it, Nicky? Fradkin's plane? No, baby. It was murdered. Oh, phonographs don't get murdered. They die natural death. Well, here's the bullet, Nora. It smashed the motor. Well, now, who'd want to murder a phonograph? Must be some torpedo who hates music. The bullet came through that wall. There's a hole. Hey, what's on the other side of this wall, Benny? Another boat like this. There's just a ten partition of expensive soundproof junk between the boats. Someone in that other booth fired that bullet. Come on. I bet it's one of my competitors trying to ruin my business. Well, there's the door to the other booth. Oh! Steady, baby. Oh, but look, Nicky, look, that woman. Betty, turn off that record. All right. Uh, it, is she dead? Uh-huh. Three bullet wounds in the head. Betty, you'd better call the police. Yeah, I'll phone right now. Nicky, do you think the killer's still around? No, darling. If he was smart enough to turn on that record to cover the noise of the shots, he's smart enough to make a quick getaway. He must be a very queer killer, dear. He left his lipstick behind. Well, what do you mean? This lipstick I just found. It's called, um, Passion Smear. Oh, but that probably belongs to the corpse. Uh-uh, it's a different shade. You see? They don't match her lips. Yeah. Hey, listen, no, you wait here. Where are you going? I want to speak to headquarters. This looks like a case for Inspector Gallagher. I'll be back in a minute. Hmm. I wonder if... Oh... I didn't notice that before. This is interesting. Nikki, did you... Oh, who turned off the lights? Oh, let go of me. Let go of you. Tell me someone is the killer. Nikki! Nikki! Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Murder in a record shop. Why don't you try to be on hand for our next performance when we present Nick and Nora Charles in The Adventures of the Thin Man? This is Peter Loring closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Boris Karloff. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, to welcome you through the squeaking door into the land of ghosts, vampires, and other gay, hilarious people. Friends, are you looking for an apartment? Well, we have just the place for you. It's sturdily built, completely of marble, with cold running water every time it rains. You don't have to worry about the landlord putting you out. The lease is forever. All you have to do to get this little love nest is call your undertaker and get yourself a little bit dead. 
<laughs> Mr. Host, I assure you, no one is the least bit interested in your offer. But, Mary, just think. Once you're dead, you can appear on Inner Sanctum. You know, we always have a ghost in our story, someone whose voice comes back from the grave and gives advice to our characters. Yeah, sometimes I think our theme song should be, My Mummy Done Told Me. <laughs> Why, that's very funny. <laughs> but you know, Mr. Host, talking about voices coming back, that's what happened to me the other day. I heard my own voice coming back to me on the radio while I was eating breakfast. No. Yes. I just heard the new Lipton jingle, and then I heard myself. Yes, there I was, talking about Inner Sanctum and about Lipton Tea, too. Hmm. You see, it was a record, uh, an electrical transcription that I'd made, all about Lipton's brisk flavor, how Lipton's always tastes fresh and full-bodied, never wishy-washy. And you know what? There was a man on the record who talked almost like you, Mr. Host. An imposter. I'll kill him. Oh, it was just in fun. He made spooky remarks when I talked about Lipton tea. <laughs> but I did get a chance to say that Lipton's is the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. All right, Mary, you've had your chance. And I'll make room for the creepiest voice you ever heard. The curdling kid himself, the star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. <laughs> Tonight's story is called The Wailing Wall. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. And you'll hear Boris Karloff in the role of Gabriel Hornell. All set, friends. Then turn out the lights, curdle close to the fire, and listen. Night. And on the waterfront of downtown Manhattan, the fog creeps in like a crawling cloud. Tucked in between the towering skyscrapers, there's an old rundown mansion. An anachronism, a freak among the streamlined giants. It's the Hornell home. And tonight, leaping tongues of flame from behind the black shutters. There it is, Johnny. Is there anybody in that old dump? It's an old guy lives there, don't you? Gabriel Hornell. I hope he had sense enough to get out. That place is like a tinderbox. Yeah, and pretty well gone. Casey, get that horse. Hey! hey, there is someone in there. Get the action. Come on. I'm right behind you. What? Get out of the way. Ah! Hurry, will you? Ah! I knocked it off. All right, come on in. You see anyone in there? No. We can't stay. Ah! Hey, ah! there he is. Oh, the crazy cootie didn't even have sense enough to get out. Here, get off your shoulder. Yeah. No, don't hold me. We're just taking you out. I don't want to go out. We ain't asking you what you want. Come on, Johnny. Before this joint collapses, oh, take me out. I can't leave the house. Good evening, Mr. Hornell. I hope you're feeling... Mr. Hornell? Mr. Hornell? <gasps> The head nurse. And hurry. Hello? Hello, this is Nurse Hopkins on the 18th floor. Gabriel Hornell is not in his room. The window is open from the bottom. But there's a letter. I know, but I'm sure he's not alive. Oh, the, the letter? Yes, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, to whom it may concern. By the time, By the time you, you read, read this, this, I shall, I be, shall dead. be dead. There can be no mistake this time. Death holds no fear, no terror any greater than what I've endured in life. For the past 40 years, I've searched for freedom. I hope now I've found it. Even now, as I write, I can hear her voice calling to me as she did that night years ago. I'd prepared everything while she was in bed. Just the last few minute little details had to be completed. Gabriel! Gabriel, do you hear me? What do you want? What are you doing down there? I'm... I'm fixing something. Well, why don't you come up? I don't want to be alone here. I can't bear to be alone. Come up, Gabriel. What's the matter with you? Why don't you answer me? Oh, you're just doing it for spite. I know you are. Stop that hammering, Gabriel. You know I can't bear that noise. Now stop it, please. Gabriel, will you stop that noise? Oh. 
You came down. Well, of course I came down. Did you expect me to lie there while all this racket was going on? Now, you know I'm a sick woman, Gabriel. What are you doing there, anyhow? You can see. Well, yes, I can see, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, you've made a huge gaping hole in the wall. Now, what on earth did you want to do a thing like that for? You'll find out soon enough. And, and what are all those things? Stonemason's tools, cement, plaster. Well, I never dreamed you knew how to use them. Oh, I'm going back to bed. No, Agnes. No? No. Gabriel, that rope in your hands. Yes. I've thought carefully about this rope, Agnes. It's the most merciful way. It leaves a little trace since there's no blood. Gabriel! You won't make it difficult, will you, Agnes? Murder? It's the only way. No, Gabriel. We couldn't go on like this. Your imaginary illnesses, your constant nagging. I, I have to be free of them, Agnes. But murder? This is best for both of us. No, Gabriel. Send me away. Do anything you want. You can get a divorce. A divorce there, see? That would solve everything. You could have your freedom. Stand there, Agnes. Just as you are. I know. That other woman, Dorothy Carter, that actress. That's why you're doing this. Oh, you thought I didn't know about that, Gabriel. Well, I do. Yes, I do. No. No, let go of me again. That rope. Help me, somebody. It will be done in a minute. Done? Oh, you'll never be free of me. As long as you live. everything with its yellow eyes. The cat saw me take her body to the tomb I'd made in the wall. The cat saw me place her there and carefully seal it up. I worked quickly, skillfully, with infinite care. First the bricks, one on top of the other, then the plaster. Then the wallpaper to match the rest of the room. That wasn't very difficult. In a short time, it was done. I was free. All I had to do now was to go to the police and report her missing. It was even simpler than I'd thought. I put on the coat. I was about to open the front door when I heard it for the first time. I thought it must be my imagination. I listened carefully. I rushed to the wall, put my ear to it. What I heard made icy perspiration ooze out of every pore of my body. The wail was coming from the wall. It was like the insane shriek of some creature of another world. Was she alive in there? She couldn't be. She was dead. I knew she was dead. And yet I heard her voice wailing. I could swear it was her voice. I couldn't go out as I'd planned. What if someone else should hear it? Would they go to the wall? Investigate? The doorbell. Oh, it couldn't be at this hour. It, it couldn't be, but... Oh, oh I, I had to risk everything and answer it. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Hornell. It was Patrolman Cleary. He was the officer on the beat. He was blue with cold. I was passing by and I saw the lights on. I peeked in the window. You, you looked in? Yes. Since you were still up, I thought I'd ring. It's a bit of cold out tonight and I'd like to warm these old bones for a minute. What? Oh, yes. Yes, of course, Cleary. Don't stand there in the door, man. Come in. Come in. Thank you. I see you got your coat on, Mr. O'Neill. Just got in? Only only a few moments ago. As a matter of fact, I, I was going to see you. See me? Why, yes. It's it's about my wife. Hi, something wrong? I I hope not. I was out all evening. When I got home, she was gone. It's not like her, Mr. O'Neill. No, it, it isn't. Was she alone all evening? Yes, I, at least I think she was. You know, she hasn't been feeling very well lately, and I... Why, oh, I, I hate to think it possible, but but she may have destroyed herself. Mrs. O'Neill? No, she wasn't the sort... Oh, she was ill, terribly ill. I tried to keep it secret until she recovered, but the doctors knew... Insane? Yes. Don't you see? The river. I'd better get back to the precinct and report this. You'd better come with me. 
Missing Persons Bureau will... Hey, Mr. O'Neill. Yes? You must be mistaken. Isn't that her? That... That isn't a woman. But of course it is. It's coming from that room there. Why, sure, it's your wife. I know her voice, and she sounds like she's in pain. But it can't be. There's no one in that room. But she must have come in the back way. Come, I'll show you. No, don't go in. What? Huh? Nothing. No. There. You can see for yourself there's no one here. No one. I could have sworn your wife was in this room. How'd you like to live in a house with wailing walls? Well, one thing you have to admit, things aren't so very dead in the Hornell Mansion. Or are they? Well, (laughs) all I can say is I'm glad I don't have to live in that house with that awful wailing. Why, Mary, there's a wailing, whistling kind of noise in your house, too. The first time I heard it, I was so scared, I shivered in my shroud. Oh, you're talking about my whistling tea kettle. Oh, goodness, there's nothing scary about that. Now, if you'd only try Lipton tea with its wonderful, brisk flavor, that whistle would sound as cheery to you as birds whistling in the morning. Especially on these chilly mornings when a cup of Lipton's just makes you feel like the sun was shining inside of you. And, folks, if you want a sunny disposition, you should try relaxing with a cup of Lipton tea after a hard job like, well, maybe washing out your window curtains. Yes, and what's more, you can help your friends feel right with the world, too, by serving them Lipton tea when they come to visit you. Mm, Lipton's always taste so tangy and heartwarming, never flat or wishy-washy. Yes, that brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. All right, friends, we've given you a chance to warm your blood... And now we fondly hope to turn it to ice again, with the help of our star, Boris Karloff. Oh, let's hear the second act of Inner Sanctum. We continue with the strange letter left by Gabriel Hornell. Cleary watched in silent fascination as the cat screamed and leaped against the wall. Would he notice the new wallpaper in the dim light? Suddenly, the policeman turned to me. Yes, I... I guess that noise is only the wind. Strange, I like a wailing woman it can sound, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'll be leaving now. I guess it'll be all right for you to stay here. I'll make a report at headquarters about your wife. It's very good of you, Cleary. If she turns up, you let us know? Yes, I, I'll let you know. Good night, Mr. O'Neill. Good night. He left. I locked the door and came back to the room. The room where my wife was entombed. Was she still alive inside the hollow of that wall? I listened all that night. The wailing rose to a high, insane shriek. And then, towards morning, it began to grow weaker, as though she were losing strength. And it it seemed to die. The cat crept away. There was a merciful silence in the house. She was dead. She had to be by now. I sank down onto the sofa into a feverish sleep. Somewhere a bell was tolling, calling the mourners to the grave. Suddenly I sat bolt upright, shaking, trembling. Oh, I'd been dreaming. The front doorbell was ringing. It was night again. How long had I slept? The house was silent. Oh, there was nothing to fear now. I ran to the door, opened it. Hiya, kiddo. Dorothy. Well, are you going to keep me out here in the cold? No, no. Come in. Come in. I I haven't been... I haven't been feeling well, Dorothy. Is that why you forgot our date tonight? I I must have overslept. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. I must have slept clear through the day. Well, aren't you glad to see me? Glad? Why, yes, it's a a delightful surprise. That's more like you. Come here, kiddo. You've got the blues, but Dorothy will wipe them away. Give us a kiss. What's that? Just, 
Just the wind. Oh, no, it can't be the wind. This is a very old house, Dorothy. You sometimes hear strange noises. Oh, I've never heard anything like that before. It sounds human. Oh, she's still alive. Even after 24 hours, suddenly I realized that the doorbell was ringing again. There was a large pair of wooden sliding panel doors between the room that we were in and the vestibule that led to the street. I wasn't going to take any more chances. There's someone at the door, Gabe. Yes. You wait here, Dorothy. What are you doing? Closing these doors. Why? I'd advise you not to ask too many questions. Evening, Mr. O'Neill. Officer Cleary. Who are those men with you? Hey, I've got something to show you, Mr. O'Neill. You'd better brace yourself. It's not going to be pleasant. All right, bring it in, boys. You can put it over there. What? What is it? It's a body. A woman. Just fished out of the river, right near here. She can't be dead more than 24 hours. My wife? Hard to say. You see, the body got caught in the propeller of a boat. And it's not easy to recognize it. Unless it was examined by someone who knew her very well. Like yourself, of course. Uh, let me see it. Take away the burlap. Look, Miss Darnell. <gasps> I know. It's pretty bad. Is... Is it your wife? Agnes? Yes. Yes, of course. It's... It's her. You sure now? Yes, I, I'm sure. Positive. All right, boys. Take it away. You can stay here, Mr. Arnett. I'll take care of everything down at headquarters. Good night. Good night, Cleary. Luck, fate, whatever it is that seemed to control men's lives was playing directly into my hands. They'd never investigate now. The nightmare was over. This time I was really free. Suddenly, the panel door opened. Dorothy was standing there. A curious smile on her lips. I heard everything, kiddo. You did? So you were married. No longer, mm -hmm. Dorothy. My wife died. Suicide. So I heard. Now everything will be quite all right and we can get married in a few weeks. We'll have money, lots of money. She left you plenty, eh? She was very wealthy. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I see what happens to your face when you hear that wail. Did you kill her? What are you talking about? Did you murder her? You heard what he said. She was found in the river. You can fool a dumb copper, but you can't fool Dorothy. That wail. It's queer. Awfully queer. Look at what that cat's doing, will you? Jumping up on that wall like it's gone crazy. Yes, there's something about that wall. That's what the cat's trying to tell me. Something about the wall. You better stay away from there, Dorothy. I'm going to find out something yeah, put I Yeah, that am. book end down. Not till I'm done with it, kiddo. What are you doing there? I'm going to break through that wall. You crazy fool, stop it. No! Here, give me that thing. You're too late, Gabe. I've broken a hole through and I'm going to look. <gasps> now you've seen. Yes. Is it the hand? The hand of a woman? her. Your wife. Yes, Dorothy. You murdered her. Yes. Well, ain't you the kid? What are you going to do about it? What do you think? I want money. Lots of... That... That rope. Yes. This rope. <sighs> it leaves no telltale traces. Oh, no, no, kid. I, 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 didn't you get it? It was all a joke. No, don't come any closer. Don't scream, Dorothy. It won't do you any good. Gabe, listen to me. I, I don't want a cent. Not, not one penny. I love you. I love you, I tell you. I, I, I'll keep your secret. I'll do anything you want. Anything. There, that rope. Take it away from my neck. Don't give in the name of heaven. Don't, don't break. Don't. She was dead. I took her body. 
Betty. Put it in an old trunk in the storeroom of the cellar. I had to think of some plan, some way to get rid of those bodies. In my confusion, there was only one thing that I was certain of. I must never leave the house, not even for a minute. I never did. At nights, I would sit there, listening. Then it would come, the wail in the wall. I knew that after a week, she couldn't be alive. What made the wail? Plans? <laughs> I thought of a thousand plans, but all of them would mean that I had to leave the house, and if I left, someone would hear the wail and find out, just as Dorothy did. Fire? Yes, fire. That would do it. The idea danced like a flame in my mind. But no, no. They discovered charred bones of the skeletons among the wreckage. No, it... It wouldn't be worth it. The only way I could be safe was to stay there in the house. I stayed. I, who had risked everything for freedom. One day, the doorbell tinkled. I opened it. Mr. Harnell? Yes? I'm Mr. Crawford from the bank. May I come in? Just in here, in the vestibule. We've written to you a dozen times, but you've never replied. What do you want? Well, Mr. Harnell, you may not realize it, but you've overdrawn your account. The money your wife left is gone. Gone? So short a time? So short? Why, she died 40 years ago. 40? It seems only yesterday. We've been investigating. Even the grocer who used to supply your food no longer will extend you credit. Oh, what do you want with me? I'm not starving. If you'd see your face, you'd realize that you are, Mr. Hornell. Now, if you'll only be reasonable, we can see to it that you get $250,000. A, a quarter of a million? How? By selling this house. It's become very valuable. Uh, no. You get out of here. Get out. But, Mr. Hornell... Get out! Very well. He was right. I was starving. That night, when I heard the wailing begin again, I came to a decision. I, I had spent 40 years in the house. More punishment than criminals receive who've committed even worse crimes than mine. I'd take a chance. I opened the wall I'd sealed up 40 years ago. She, she was still there, but the wailing continued. Why, why? I looked into the tomb I made for her, and then I saw it. I saw this thing that had ruined my life. It was a tiny hole in the outside wall that I'd made when I first broke it open. The wind rushed through and made that horrible wail. What was the use? I took a match out of my pocket. I set its flame to the curtains. In a moment, the place would be an inferno. But I decided to stay. I wanted to perish with the house. In death, at least I'd be free. Freedom was denied me. They rescued me, brought me to this hospital. I had the nurse make inquiries from the police. She told me. No, there was nothing unusual found among the ashes. Everything was burned to a fine powder. If, if I had only set fire to the house 40 years ago. But no matter. The window is open. And it's 18 stories to the ground. I will soon be free. Meow! <laughs> Everybody's dead but the cat. And we overlooked him because we couldn't find him. Of course, I'm sorry, 
But that wall made such an unpleasant noise, such a tuneless wailing. We tried to teach it to whistle the new Lipton tea jingle, but we didn't have time, eh, Mary? (laughs) (laughs) Now, you just stop teasing me, because I'm not going to talk about the Lipton jingle now. No, and I'm not going to talk about Lipton tea either. Instead, the Lipton people want me to remind you folks about something important. I mean the victory loan drive. You know, friends, we've been buying bonds for many years now. But this drive is in some ways the most important. Because if a job is worth doing, then it's worth finishing. The bonds you buy now won't buy weapons. No, this time the money will help bring our boys home. It will also help take care of our wounded soldiers, provide them with the finest medical care in the world. And, friends, we can certainly do no less. And the victory bonds you buy now will help launch our veterans into a safe and secure post-war world, the kind of world they've been fighting for. Yes, you're helping others and yourself, too, every time you buy a victory bond. So buy all you can, won't you? All right, friends. Until we meet at some haunted house, here's a parting thought. Don't seal your wife in a wall. That won't keep her quiet. (laughs) Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man who gets hunches. His hunches are about death. He's sure he's going to be killed. Not by poison or fire or strangling. Nothing simple like that. No, our character has a nice, interesting death waiting for him. Oh, if you'd like to be in at the death, drop in next Tuesday. (laughs) And now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? Folks, the colder it gets, the more we all enjoy a good hot plate of soup. And for soup with a fresh, home-cooked taste, you can't beat Lipton's noodle soup. Yes, Lipton's is blessed with a real chickeny flavor, and it's just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. But listen, Lipton noodle soup takes almost no time at all to prepare. And Lipton's is economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So don't forget to try Lipton's noodle soup... And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health and your... Roma Toast the World. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you as star Mr. Peter Lorre, the suspense play which stars Mr. Lorre and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called Back for Christmas. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Back for Christmas and with the performance of Peter Lorre, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Jingle bell, jingle all the way. 
Yes, Marie. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Oh, uh, just doing a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Oh, I thought because the weather has been so damp, this would be a good time to plant that little <laughs> devil's garden I told you about. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? <laughs> Don't you remember that was my little joke about it? You see, uh, I've managed to get hold of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. In a wild state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The South American Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the South American Indians will be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. <laughs> Whom else it will interest, I can't imagine. Oh, what? Terrible smell. Oh, that's the leaf mold, uh, chemically identical with the earth blanket they grow under in their wild state. And I want to get these started before we close the house. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no mm. arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden, indeed. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Hubert. Oh, I, I suppose it is inconsiderate of me, you see. And I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time, but uh, with all those lectures and seminars at the university, there, there never seemed to, uh, to be enough time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, oh must I shave my beard off, Hermione? I thought we'd been through all that. Of course oh. you must. They don't wear beards in America. Bad enough you're speaking with that accent. They'll probably think we're Germans as it is. Oh, I should think it would be quite easy just to explain that I'm Swiss. Now, Hubert, don't be argumentative. Oh. Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. And don't look so put upon, Hubert. Someone has to plan things in this house. Never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but what about my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when we get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I forgot. We'll that. try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And yeah. if there's any digging to be done... I'll manage that as well. You understand, Hubert? Yes, Hermione. Good. Now, you have just uh, 20 minutes to clean up this mess down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you finish there, I want you to come straight home. All right. Oh, oh I, I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well, all right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon moiling over those old books the way you usually do. Now hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. No more digging. I'll show her. I'll have my devil's garden, and if I... No more digging, eh? No more digging. Oh, 15 men on a dead man's chest. Yoo-hoo! Why, it is Professor Schumacher, isn't it? <laughs> Do you like me better this way? You look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years? Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Twenty... Oh, yes, the books. Let me see. The, phy the Phytotomy of Phalloid Gametophytes mm -hmm. and uh, Coniferous Shrubs of North America. Those are the very ones you ordered, good. aren't they? <laughs> yes, thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Schumacher? Well, not, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Why, you're not old, Professor Schumacher. Really, you look... What do I look like? And besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? You've never told me that before, Miss Markham. Well, I was afraid to. You <laughs> look so imposing with the beard and all. Oh, <laughs> Oh, uh, Miss Markham, uh, forgive me if, if this sounds foolish, but since talking with you today, I, I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, it yes. is. I, I, I'm sure it is. For 20 I'm, years. I'm so sorry that I've been so distant with you all this time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Oh, really? 
times when you came in here, tired after a day with your students at the university, you seemed so alone, the way I'm alone in the world. Alone? I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me, but some way or other, I, I always wound up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. Say, you, you're alone in the world? Since my father died. Oh, Miss, uh, Miss Markham, did, did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who seemed to measure up to what he led me to expect of men. Uh, Miss Markham... Oh, <laughs> it's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. Yeah. I'd like you to, if you want to. It, oh. It's Marion. Marion. Oh, how nice. And, and yours? Well, uh, Hubertus. <laughs> but, but in English, Hubert sounds better, huh? How long have you been alone, Hubert? Alone? I knew you were a widower, of course. I, widow. The first time I saw you. A widow. I can always tell there's, there's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. Hmm. A sweet sadness, I think, when, when he's been married and then a lost... A widow. I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have been talking like this, I suppose. But I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? <laughs> Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. Always managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends. Even when we dined at a restaurant, she even then ordered my food. She was always managing things. Her whole life managed herself to death. Poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. No. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. But the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. Operator. Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Well, put them on quickly. Hello. Is this Paul Holton, sons? It's Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. Did you receive my letter? Good. Now, remember, we'll be back for Christmas and I want the job done without fail. What's that? No. No, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send it to me in New York as I instructed you, addressed in my name, of course. Yes. I've already put them in the mail. You'll get them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, here you are, Hubert. Where have you been? Oh, backstairs. I dismissed the servants. Dismiss the servants? Mm-hmm. But I've asked some friends of mine into a farewell lunch and go and tell them it's a mistake. Well, uh, I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. You have messed things up properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You have to do better than this when I plan the trip home or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Well, supposing I, I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Well, Luther Burbank was an American, wasn't That's he? That's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? Well, they asked me to lecture, didn't uh, they? All right. All right. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Hubert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back... Back for, for Christmas. Christmas, I Precisely. know. Precisely. No good to make a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, Hermione. And as you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. <clears throat> I'm going in to have my bath. Call me when they get here. Marion? It's Hubert. No, no, darling, no, nothing is wrong. Oh, my plans are the same, uh, unless, unless you have changed. No? Oh, we'll meet in New York, then, and be married there. Oh, I'll explain to you why later. Y you just have to trust me. Yes. <laughs> yes, my darling. You what? Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't talk any longer. Yes, I'll meet you in New York, without fail. I'll be the same, man, Liebchen. On the phone just uh, now? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Oh, <laughs> Freddie, Freddie Sinclair. 
But didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Uh, why, yes. Uh, uh, Freddy said he might possibly get over there before we even leave. And, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decided to go. Well, that seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. <laughs> yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished before we sail for America. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes. Uh, Hubert. Yes? Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Goodenow, but who's that with them? Well, who... Uh, what? <laughs> Precisely. Freddy Sinclair. Peculiar, you should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago, and now here he is. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, but then, as you see, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar the very day we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes? Oh, never mind. Uh, go and let them in. Oh, you were going to ask me something, Hermione, about... Uh... The hole I'm digging in a cellar. Good heavens, stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Father, open the door and please stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I have said it for the last time. <laughs> professor of botany, his loving wife, and an oblong pit in the cellar, just the right size for his botanical specimens, his devil's garden. With these ingredients for a story of a perfect crime, Back for Christmas by John Collier and starring Peter Lorre, the Roma Wine Company closes the curtain for a moment on another breathless study in suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, it's pleasant to think about the holidays. Not everyone celebrates the holidays against a background of snow and pine trees. Somewhere south of the Gulf and the Caribbean, in a gracious home surrounded by palm trees and the warm sun, you might find holiday dinners ending this way. One moment, please. Our North American guest wishes to propose a toast. Yes, mis amigos. I drink a toast in gratitude to you for your gracious hospitality and the enjoyment you've given me, an American so far from home. It is only a fair exchange, my friend. This wine in which you drink your toast, it brings enjoyment to us from your country, from America. It is Roma wine made in your own California. Yes, and when you choose the wine for your holiday table, remember this. Only a few wines are so fine that many countries of the world import them. And among these greatly enjoyable wines are the wines of Roma. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Yet here in America we are truly fortunate. For we may buy Roma wines at a very low cost. Since we don't have to pay import duty or costly shipping charges. So serve Roma wine with pride on any and all holiday occasions. Serve Roma, too, for everyday dinners. You can afford to. Ask your dealer tomorrow for your favorite Roma wine, America's largest selling wine. But before you buy wine, buy war bonds. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Peter Lorre in Act Two of Back for Christmas, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. For Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea out for a few friends who had come in to say a last-minute farewells, she kept reiterating it. Now, mind you, Hermione, 
Don't let those Americans lure your husband with one of their fat university jobs. <laughs> we absolutely <laughs> must have you with us for Christmas. He shall be back, I promise you. Well, it's not absolutely certain, of course. <laughs> Hubert, now, what do you mean, it's not certain? Of course it's certain. After all, Hubert, old boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Oh, that's quite right, but then, uh, of course, anything may happen. Hubert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would decide the day, the very day, mind you, before leaving for America to dig a great hole in the floor of the cellar. In the cellar? Yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. It sounds so mysterious. That's Hubert, though. It's really quite simple, however, once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few minutes ago, Freddy. Uh, to <coughs> me? Of course. <coughs> now, Hubert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. Wasn't that why he called? To ask you not to mention it? My dear Hermione, Hubert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? This for my going to America. No, 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 no. no. Come, Freddy, come. You may as well confess. <laughs> Hermione has just found me out again. But Hubert's old chap, I really do You see what a poor liar Hubert makes. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But, but look here, old girl. I've been trying to tell everyone here oh, that I'm... Oh, stuff and nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Besides, we must start getting ready. Now, it was marvellous of all of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Hubert's little jokes. I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. <laughs> They all believed her. For years, she had been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees, and the promises had always been kept. This time, they would not be. I had seen to that. The servants were gone for good. The farewells all said. I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in a hole in a cellar. My devil's garden. Upstairs in a bedroom, I undressed and put on my old bathrobe, and then I, I opened the door into Hermione's room. Oh, uh, uh, Hermione, uh, have you a moment to spare? Of course, dear. I'm just finished. Oh, then, uh, will you come in here for a moment, please? There's uh, something rather extraordinary here. Oh, good heavens, you! What are you lounging about in that filthy old bathroom oh. for? I told you to put it into the furnace. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it today. Yes, really, I will. I promise. Well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? Oh, here, here, in the bathroom. Uh, just look, who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing. Then what is it doing in here? I don't see anything. Well, look. I'll hold this flashlight here for you. If you if you lean right over, you can see it shining. It's deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just as well. Well, I don't see it, Hubert. Well, go on looking, Hermione, in just a moment. Hubert, I absolutely refuse... Hubert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione. Just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you? Didn't you, Hermione, huh? Oh. Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week. In exactly two minutes and 16 seconds, you'll be dead. What? You see... You see, I have planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Oh, I thought you would say that, Hermione, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in a cellar when I take you down there today? <laughs> yes! That is where you are going, Hermione. Oh. Right into my devil's garden. That annoyed you so much. My friends all expect me back for Christmas. They do. If they don't hear from me, they'll start asking questions. No, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione. On the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, correcting way. You always sign your notes to your friends. Yeah. Let me up now. No! It won't work, Hubert. You were never any good at planning things. Oh, but I have changed. I have learned from watching you all these years. The lecture people in America. They'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife 
But not my present wife, Hermione. Hubert, it won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar? Oh, it will work. It'll serve its purpose well. Hubert! No, no, I'm sorry, dear. This thing has to be done exactly as planned. <gasps> you have just five seconds to say your prayers. Hubert, you must listen. The cellar, it... Don't do it, Hubert! Yes, Hermione! Oh, uh, uh, Stuart? Yes, sir? Oh, uh, my wife, she's in this post. She, she'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. For the whole voyage, sir? Yes, for the whole voyage. <laughs> I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Schumacher. A, a little. Uh, not yet well enough to leave a cabin. Oh, what a shame. Oh, Professor Schumacher. Yes? Here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over. Oh, but, but look. Look here. Why? What's the matter? Did the typist make a mistake? No. No. <laughs> it's nothing important. She, she can correct it later. <laughs> a feeling that Hermione had been leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I had written as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Goodenough and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip, Hubert well. Now, doubt, we'll be back for Christmas. But the operator had left out the W and, and it read, no doubt we'll be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. Well, the rest of the trip was uneventful. Marion and I met in New York just as we had planned. Just as we had planned. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, Professor and Mrs. Schumacher, uh, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Schumacher's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Schumacher, you're quite a surprise. Oh? Your letter reserving the rooms was so thorough, I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, oh. frankly, ma'am. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, we're just married, but I... My letter reserving the rooms. Oh, oh, I wrote the letter, my dear, and, and I signed it Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. <laughs> Just a joke. What a cunning old fox you are, Hubert. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think of it, I... Uh... Oh, uh, I almost okay, forgot. Yeah. There's a letter for you, Mrs. Schumacher. That's peculiar. I wonder who on oh, earth... Oh, well, we'll yeah. shall find out in good time. Come along, darling. Oh, we are keeping the boy waiting. Come oh. on. Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. <laughs> Hubert, this letter. Oh, yes, the letter. Oh, uh, dry my hair, will you, darling? Please. It seems to be a bill of some sort from a building contractor in, in Salisbury. Oh, really? Oh, bother. Dry your own hair. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Uh, 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 let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Hubert, you were a widower, weren't you? I mean, mm. Hermione isn't still alive. Am I? Good heavens, no. <laughs> well, let me read that. Mm-hmm. Dear madame, this is to acknowledge your order to g together with the keys to your house in Lonston Place. How a man had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in the cellar, but apparently he changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. What is it, Hubert? How a man will begin digging tomorrow and, and their job will be completed in ample time for your surprise. Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Schumacher will be pleased at the results of our work on his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Old Sons Contractors. Means 
means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. I will be back for Christmas. I will be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Yes, Hermione. And so closes Back for Christmas. Starring Mr. Peter Lorre, tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we shall hear again from Mr. Lorre. But first, just a word that seems appropriate. One of the world's oldest customs is the Christmas toast. And traditionally, down through centuries of war and peace, the Christmas toast has been drunk in wine. This year, when the glasses are filled and raised once again, we know that in every home the toast will be to a speedy victory and a speedy return of those we love. And before we set the wine glasses down, let us all resolve to do everything within our power to help make that toast come true. Let us resolve to help supply the weapons of war by buying even more and more war bonds. Let us resolve to face our own inconveniences without complaining. And above all, Let us resolve that when this war is at last over, each of us will exert all our effort to see that future Christmases truly express peace on earth, goodwill to men. This thought, together with our very best wishes of the season, is the Roma Wine Company's Christmas message for you, its friends, here in America and throughout the world. This is Peter Laurie. Thank you for listening to our suspense play this evening, and I know you're looking forward to next week's show as I am. It is called uh, Finishing School, and its subtitle might be the famous quotation, the female of the species is more deadly than the male. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time, for Margot, Elsa Lanchester, Janet Beecher, and a distinguished all-feminine cast in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. But, Countess, are you sure you want to put all your winnings on a single card? Absolutely sure, my dear Duke. Well, I don't know how it is in Russia, but here in Paris, it is very seldom that anyone wins on three cards in succession. The game of faro is the same in Russia as anywhere else. But I wish to put the whole amount, 400,000 francs, on my next card. As you wish, madame. I will deal. I have won. No. Look, I have won. See, Duke, you were wrong. Yes, I was wrong. What happened? What's the matter? Each week at this time, Camel Cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. Brought to you by Camel Cigarettes.
experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, just leave it to your T-Zone to judge. Your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich, full flavor doesn't get highest rating with your taste. And if Camel's cool mildness isn't more than welcome to your throat. See if you don't find, like millions of other smokers, that Camel's suit your T-Zone to a T. The story I'm about to tell you, you may not believe, but I assure you it actually happened. Now, the whole thing started one night when a group of young officers were having a game of cards at the rooms of Narumov of the Horse Guard. There were five of us there, including a lieutenant in the engineers named Hermann. He was the son of a German who had become a naturalized Russian. He was an ambitious young man of strong passions and imagination, which he held in check by an even stronger will. Thus, though a born gambler at heart, Hermann never touched a card, for he considered his financial position did not allow it. Oh, I remember that night. At about four in the morning, we all sat down to supper. Oh, I'm not hungry. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> How did you make out, Surin? Ah, uh, I lost. You always lose, Surin. You must be very strong-minded to be so consistent. <laughs> well, if you think he is strong-minded, how about yourself, Hermann? Yes. Me? Why me? Uh, you've never held a card in your hand or made a bet. And yet you sit here until four o'clock in the morning watching us play. <laughs> well, Tomsky, you see, gambling interests me. It interests me very much. In fact, I, I'm a gambler at heart, but I'm not in a financial position to sacrifice the necessary in a hope for winning the superfluous. In other words, I cannot afford it. <laughs> well, that doesn't explain anything. We none of us can afford it. <laughs> oh, Hermann's easy enough to understand. He's of German de descent. Therefore, he's thrifty. Right. Now, it's my grandmother... The Countess Fedotovna, who baffles me. You know, she won't gamble either. Oh, lots of grandmothers don't gamble. St. Petersburg is full of them. Ah, <laughs> yes, but they don't know the secret my grandmother knows. Huh? Secret? What kind of secret does she know? Something we'd all of us give a lot to possess. Hmm? Yeah, a combination of three cards that can't fail to win at the faro table. Hmm? Oh, there's no such thing. What are you trying to tell us? Oh, let's go home. It's wait, late. wait, Tomsky, I'd like to know more about this secret. <laughs> what do you care, Herman? I mean, you don't gamble. Still, I'd like to hear about it. Huh? Many years ago, when my grandmother was a lot younger, she went to Paris. Oh, she must have been quite a sensation. The Muscovite Venus, they called her. <laughs> anyway, she gambled at Faro with the Duke of Orléans. Lost a great deal of money, much more than she could pay. Yeah, who does? Come on, <laughs> keep quiet, will you? <laughs> well, there was at that time a Count Saint-Germain in Paris, yes. a mysterious figure that no one knew much about. Well, be that as it may, he revealed to my grandmother... The secret of the three winning cards. Yeah. And did she win? That night she played again with the Duke d'Orléans. Yeah. Played the three cards, one after the other, doubling her bet each time. Yeah. And all three won, and she recovered everything she had lost ten times over. Oh, oh a little hard on the Duke, don't you think? Oh, yes, as a matter of fact, he dropped dead, I believe. It was a long time ago. Oh, come on, come on, Tomsky, go on with the story. Well, that's all there is. My grandmother never touched a card again. You mean she knows how to pick three winning cards in succession, and you haven't succeeded in getting the secret out of her? <laughs> That's the devil of it. She had four sons, one of whom was my father, and yet she would never reveal the secret to any of them. Though it wouldn't have been a bad thing for them. Or no, for you either. Huh? <laughs> uh, I've had enough. I'm going home. Well, I'll go along with you. All right, All right. come along. Tomsky, uh, tell me, this grandmother of yours, uh, Countess Fedotovna, does she live in St. Petersburg? Yes, with a ward of hers named uh, Lizavieta. <laughs> Poor girl, she is supposed to be my grandmother's companion, but slave would be a better word for it. <laughs> your grandmother's a widow? Yes. Oh, now, don't get your hopes up, Herman. She's a bit too old for you. She's 86 if she's a day. Still, I, I should like to meet her. No, there's not much chance of it, I'm afraid. She doesn't go about much anymore. But I still should like to meet her. Yes, I... I should like to meet her very much. Well, 
Elizaveta. Hello, Paul. Don't tell me my grandmother is here. No, but she is going to the embassy ball tomorrow. Tonight, I, I came alone. Oh, oh, oh. while the cat's at home, the mouse will play, hmm? What's this I've been hearing about you? About me? Mm, all very romantic, I understand. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come, 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 Lizavieta. You can't tell me that you don't know about the mysterious officer who's been standing outside the house for the last two weeks. About the notes he hands you when you get into the carriage with my grandmother. About the letters he sends by the milliner's girl. Who told you? <laughs> Great friend of your officer. A lieutenant in the engineers named Hermann. Hermann. Oh, yes, I, I think I've heard of him. Is he nice? Oh, I like him very much. But he's a very determined young man and means to get what he wants. Personally, I wouldn't trust him. He has the profile of Napoleon and the soul of Mephistopheles. <laughs> oh, good evening, Kamsky. Good evening. Speak of the devil. Hello there, Hermann. Uh, Lizavieta, may I present Lieutenant Hermann? Mademoiselle. The man we were just talking about. Uh, Hermann, this is Lizavieta Ivanovna. It's my grandmother's ward. How do you do, Mademoiselle Lizavieta? How do you do, Lieutenant? Would you like to dance? Yes, I would like to. Good. See you later, Tomsky. Oh, this is paradise, Lizavieta. Holding you in my arms, feeling your heart beat against no, mine. No, you mustn't say things like that. <laughs> People will hear you, they'll talk. I don't care. They're talking already. Why did you make up that story about your imaginary friend to tell Tom? <laughs> because I didn't want him to know it was I. And, and I had to talk about you to somebody. I hope the Comtesse doesn't hear about it. Devil with her. It's not the Countess I'm in love with. It's you. Oh, Lizavieta, this... This is so wonderful. It, it makes up for all those nights I stood outside your house and... Look. They're in the door. Contessa's coachman, come to fetch me. Oh. I must go home. When am I going to see you again? I don't know. Oh, but this is horrible. My heart is burning with things I want to tell you, but I can never, never see you alone. There must be some way. To... There is a way. Yes, how? Take this. Oh. oh. This is the key to the Contessa's house. Oh, Lizavieta. Tomorrow night, we're going to the embassy ball. We'll be home at two. If you let yourself into the house at about 11.30, all the servants will be asleep. Yes, I will. Go directly to the library. It's at the right end of the corridor at the top of the stairs. Wait for me there. Right end of the corridor. Oh, you sweet Lizavieta. I adore you. Where's the Countess' room? At the other end of the corridor. Why do you ask me that? I don't want to get into the wrong room by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> But now I must go. Till tomorrow night at two o'clock. Au revoir, chérie. Mademoiselle, good night. Good night, my child. Conte? Are you sure there's nothing you want me to do for you? No, nothing, thank you, Lizavieta. I think I will just put my jewels away and sit quietly a while by myself. Good night. Good night. Uh, I am so tired. So very tired. I am too old to go. <laughs> Don't be alarmed, madame. Who are you? Please don't be alarmed, Countess. I, I have no intention of harming you, but please... How did you get in my bedroom? I have been waiting behind that curtain, waiting just for a chance to ask you a favor. A favor? Yes. Of me? Know. Yes, a favor of you, madame. You can ensure the happiness of my life. It'll, it'll cost you nothing. I don't know who you are, but you're mad. No, I'm not. I, I happen to know that you can name three winning cards in order and... Oh, that, uh... That was a joke. No, it was not a joke. Oh, oh I can see it by your expression, madame. Madame, I want you to tell me those three winning cards I do. No, no. But whom are you keeping that secret for? Huh? Your grandsons, they are rich enough without it. Besides, they, 
They don't know the value of money, but I... I do. I, your cards will not be thrown away. I'm... No, no. It is a test. It brings death. How chance that? Of, of what use is it to you? Or is it connected with some terrible sin or, or some bargain with the devil, huh? I'm ready to take your sins upon my soul, only please, please reveal the secret to me. No. Please. What I... You... You won't catch. I'll make you answer. No, I want no. You. you have my happiness in your hands. No. I'll take you. Yeah, go, you, you won't speak. I'll no. make you. you I'll... She won't tell me. She won't tell me. I'll... Are you all right? I heard voices. Contes, it is every... You. Yes, it is I. But I don't understand. Where's the Contess? There she is. Contess, what's the... It's no use. She... She's dead. Dead? Yes, dead. She's taking with her the one thing I wanted in the world. Without which I, I don't want to face life. You killed her! Yes, but... But you're not going to say anything to her. <gasps> no one knows I was in the house except you. You can't tell because you gave me the key. But you killed her? Yes, yes, I killed her. I killed her. She she deserved to die. But now, now I'll never know her secret. Never. No one, no one will ever know her secret. Of, <laughs> unless she, unless she comes back to, to tell it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air, when camels present Act Two of The Queen of Spades. Experience is the best teacher. Remember the wartime cigarette shortage? Who doesn't? One thing about it, though, smokers who went through it really learned a lot about cigarettes. They had first-hand experience with many different brands. How true. Goodness, we certainly smoked whatever brands we could get in those days. I smoke so many different brands, I'm practically a walking encyclopedia about cigarettes. Well, I'm a camel smoker now. And believe me, I know camel's the cigarette for me, because I've compared so many brands. Yes, smoking whatever brands they could get during the wartime cigarette shortage made people everywhere experts on judging the differences in cigarette quality. That experience convinced a host of smokers that they preferred the rich, full flavor and cool mildness of camels. Result? More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. <laughs> So the Countess is dead, and now the funeral is in progress. What a stupendous funeral. The huge church is banked with flowers, all the way from the doors to the catafalque where the coffin rests. And such a distinguished group of mourners. It almost seems as if all Imperial Russia is there. Sad occasion, eh? Yes. Well, I suppose the old girl had to go sooner or later. Oh, there were times when I doubted she ever would. Uh, what'd she die of? A heart attack, they said. Why? Oh, I've heard rumors. Uh, you know how those things are. Something about bruises on her throat. Oh, no, no. No, nothing to it, no. The doctor said she could have inflicted those herself oh? when she had trouble breathing. Hello, Tomsky. My condolences. Oh, thank you for coming, Herman. That's very nice of you. You never met my grandmother, did you? No, I didn't, but uh, that's no reason I shouldn't show my respect. After all, you're my friend. I beg your pardon, but would you gentlemen care to view the remains before the services commence? I suppose I should, anyway. Oh, yes, by all means. I'll come, too, if, uh, if you don't mind. Not at all. Thank you. Come along. Doesn't she look peaceful? Poor old girl, I was fond of her. Wait. 
Wait, did you see that? What? See what? Look. One of her eyelids moved. What? I tell you. Come on, be quiet. But I saw it. Her her eyelids moved as as if she winked at me. As if she... She winked? Splendid. A fine example of an army officer fainting at a funeral. No, maybe he's sick. Come on, help me carry him out of here. Oh, I know, I know. I shall never get to sleep. My, my conscience won't let me. Oh, why did I do it? Why why did I go to that cursed funeral just just because my conscience said you are the murderer of that old woman? I I wanted to implore her pardon, but but she winked at me. I, I could swear it she did. <laughs> Who's there? Oh you do not recognize me. You have a short memory. Come to see. I have I... come back from the beyond. In order to grant your request. Grant my request? I... Yes. Three, seven, and ace will win for you if played in succession. Three, seven, and an ace. But only on these conditions. Con anything, anything that at all. You do not play more than one card in 24 hours. And that you never play cards again. I promise, I promise. Three, seven, and an ace. <laughs> Three, seven, and an ace. Oh, I must remember it. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. <laughs> Yes, sir. All right. Yes, I'm all right. That's good. We were worried about you. We hadn't seen you since you collapsed at my grandmother's funeral. Oh, oh, oh. that was terrible, Lieutenant. And an officer shouldn't faint. I, I hope you'll forgive me for what happened yesterday. Oh, that's all right. Could have happened to anyone. Hmm. But it wasn't yesterday, you know. Hmm? It was the day before. The day before? No, I don't remember that. <laughs> you must have been pretty sick to lose a whole day like that. What got into you? Chomsky, uh... Will you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. If I can, what is it? I've heard a lot about a certain Chekolinsky and, and a gambling that goes on at his house every oh, night. Oh, yes. And... Chekolinsky has practically spent his whole life at the card table. That's what I heard. Oh, he's amassed millions at it, but what... I should like to go there. Oh, you want to watch them play Faro at Chekolinsky? No, I want to play. You want to play? Yes. <laughs> What's happened to you, Herman? I thought you couldn't afford to gamble. Yes, but now I can. I... You see, I... I have a little legacy left uh, from my father. And Congratulations. I feel I'm in luck. Uh, when can you take me? Anytime. Tonight? Yes, yes, if you feel up to it. Good, that's very good. <laughs> we'll go to Chekolinsky's tonight, huh? Chomsky, honestly, I... Oh, I've never seen such a magnificent establishment. Never, never in my life have I seen such a place. It's... Well, it's all paid for by fellows like you who felt they were in luck. <laughs> Look, there's Chukalinsky at the faro table. Where? Oh. Come on over, I'll introduce you. But don't say I didn't warn you. Good evening. Good evening, Tomsky. Um, Chukalinsky, mm -hmm. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Lieutenant Herman. Uh, Herman, this is the famous Chukalinsky. Good evening. Oh, shall you? Uh, Herman seems to feel particularly fortunate tonight. Do you suppose he could sit in and take a card? A friend of yours? <laughs> but of course. Good luck, Herman. Thanks. Will you be kind enough to select your card, please? Thank you. This is my card. And how much would you like to bet, Lieutenant? I would like to bet 47,000 rubles. <laughs> Forgive me, Lieutenant, but we only play for cash. It's quite all right. I, I have it. One is right here. Are you crazy, Herman? You're playing pretty high, Lieutenant. Nobody here has ever staked anything like that on one card before. Well, do you accept it or don't you? I accept it. Then if you'll be kind enough to deal. As you wish. 
Nine. Three. Hellman has one. One. Look, his card is a three. Well, congratulations, Lieutenant. Uh, do you want me to settle with you now? Yes, you please. Uh, here you are. 47,000 rubles. No. Would you like to try again? No. Not tonight, but tomorrow night I'll be back to try another card. Well, Lieutenant, what do you want to wager tonight? Same stake as last night, plus my winnings, 94,000 rubles. Just as you say. You have picked your card. I will deal. Knave, seven. Look, look, Herman's won again. The card is a seven. There you are. 94,000 rubles. Thank you, sir. I shall see you again tomorrow night. I don't believe he'll show up. He'd be a fool to know. Here he comes now with Tomsky. Now he can't win three times in a row. He doesn't pass. Gentlemen, gentlemen, quiet, please. Well, Lieutenant Hermann, how much do you wish to bet tonight? Same stake plus my winnings. Here it is. 180,000 rubles. What? On one card? Yes. Hermann, don't you think that... Please be quiet, Tom. I know what I'm doing. Gentlemen, please. Will you choose your card, Lieutenant? I have it. Will you please deal? Queen. Ace. <laughs> I win again. Ace wins. Here it is. Huh? If you'd been holding an ace, you would have won. But you haven't an ace. You have a queen, and it loses. What do you mean? What are you... <laughs> you weren't holding an ace, my dear fellow. You have the queen of spades. Queen? Look. Look queen at of, yourself. Queen of spades? What? It, it is impossible. I have... Uh, I have... Yes, it is. Yes, it is the queen of spades. Huh? <laughs> now I see it, but... Look at... Oh, it isn't the queen of spades. It's... It's the Countess. Look, see the resemblance? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, she's tricked me. She's deliberate. She tricked me. What are you talking about? Your grandmother. Your grandmother, the Countess. She told me three, seven, and eight. She told you? Yes, she But did. you never met her. I did meet her. I waited for her one night in her bedroom, and I pleaded with her. But she refused to tell me. She refused to tell me her secret. Then I took her by the throat. And you uh, killed her. Huh? You took her by the throat and yes, strangled her. I killed her, yes, but she didn't tell me that. But then one night she came back. She came back from the grave and she told me three cards. It was seven. I don't know anything about it, but she lied. She lied to me. Oh, that dirty woman. She's got no revenge. I've, I've lost all the money I had in the world, but I... I don't care anymore, but I'll, Quiet, I'll, I'll show her. Quiet. I'll, 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 stop! You murder the countess. You'll hang for that. Let them hang me. Let them hang me. I'll get even with her. Beyond the grave, I'll get even with her. I'm mad. I'll be glad when they hang me. I'll be glad when they hang me. But they didn't hang him. He is spending the rest of his life in room 17 of the Obukhov Hospital. He never answers any question, but constantly Three, mutters the seven, same thing. Eight. Three, seven, eight. Hospital from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, American Lake, Washington, U.S. Army and Navy General Hospital, Hot Springs, Arkansas, U.S. Naval Hospital, Brooklyn, New York, U.S. Marine Hospital, Detroit, Michigan, and Veterans Hospital, Perry Point, Maryland. There are many doctors among America's millions of camel smokers. 
In fact... According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. This survey was made by three leading independent research organizations who questioned 113,597 doctors living in every state of the Union. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you one of the greatest American classics of all time, The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Mr. Pipe Smoker, do you get the greatest possible enjoyment from your pipe? Do you pack it full of mellow, mild Prince Albert? Prince Albert, you know, is a rich, full-flavored tobacco, specially made for smoking pleasure. Specially treated to ensure against tongue bite, crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. No wonder more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco. See if Prince Albert doesn't give you a better smoke. Be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a rollicking half hour of folk tunes and humor with your favorite stars, Red Foley, Minnie Pearl, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guest, Judy Martin. Yes, folks, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan, Lorene Tuttle, Peggy Weber, Ben Wright, Louis Van Ruten, Stanley Waxman, Jack Edwards Jr., and Rolf Sedan. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camel. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.